See, I I'm, I love you know the the tune, man. The tunage it just gets me going. I'm ready you to see go. Vince is horrible dancing before the show starts. I know it's, it's not I, pretty. It, it's not. It's, it's not really pretty. not. I I'm I'm a, a second class chair dancer. But uh, welcome everyone to another edition of the Irish Breakdown podcast. I am Vince D'Addario. I am the football analyst here at IrishBreakdown.com. Brian Driscoll is the publisher at IrishBreakdown.com. We're here to answer all your questions because it's Friday mm-hmm. and it's the free for all mailbag. And for me. Day three of Snowmageddon here uh, in northern Indiana. So day three of not having to go to school. So uh, we'll chalk that up to a W. And uh, more time to hang with all y'all lovely people. So really fired up. Brian, any anything to add before we jump into the questions? Dude, I'm ready to roll. We got That's so many right. good questions in there already. It's Boom. All right. Yeah. Well, let's just go with the most obvious question out there. Corey D., my guy. Connecting the dots. Is it? Hold on, hold on. I got to interrupt you because we got to start with something else, Vince. You got to take that down. Done. Gone. I wholeheartedly agree with (laughs) Alan English on this. Vince is dancing greater than Brian Kelly's dancing. I mean, it's not a high bar to get over. Some people still trip over it, but I safely say that I can get over that bar as well. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that, Alan. Thank you very much. And I believe if I read the the. Comments earlier, he's got his son watching with him today. So right. what's up, Alan's son? So say hi. Your dad had a great question today, or a great comment. <laughs> great comment, absolutely. All right, let's rock and roll. So Corey D, connecting the dots, is it safe to assume Al Golden will likely be Notre Dame's next D coordinator? It seems evident since Notre Dame hasn't named one, and Al Golden is still coaching with the Bengals. We should just start every show with that I, since we get asked that every Friday. Listen. I know. <laughs> why I put it up. Al Golden is a legitimate candidate to be the defensive coordinator. Clearly. I would definitely say he's in the top of the four to five man list. Sure. Okay. But the reason Al Golden has not been announced as the hire yet is because Marcus Freeman has not decided who the next defensive coordinator will be. This in, in my, in this Intel that I'm giving you is not really new Intel, but it's been repeated to me yesterday. Okay. He has not decided. This mindset that that they have to make it done and that there's still so much, so much coaching movement that's happening right now. It's not even funny. There's going to be more coming up now because some coaches wait until after signing day to move. The reality is, is Notre Dame didn't need to make an early decision because or rush a decision because there's no signing day concerns. Exactly. This is different than 10 years ago. Different. Two years ago. I mean, really, I mean, just the way that it, I mean, it's just, it's changed so much, but do I think that Marcus Freeman is very interested in Al Golden? Absolutely. Do I think that Al Golden is the, is just, they're just waiting on it? No. Now they don't have to wait on that, right? If Al Golden wanted the job, he would have taken the, been offered it and taken it. He hasn't been offered the job. And he could still take, Care of his duties yeah, as the Bengals just linebacker, just like the coach. LSU D coordinator has done, who was the Kansas City Chiefs linebackers coach, right. who took the job a month before their season was over with. So right. that is that is not the reason Al Golden has not been named the defensive coordinator. It is because Marcus Freeman has not named the hire. Look, this is a big hire for him because it's the person replacing him, and clearly it's an important position. And he wants to make sure that this isn't just some position coach. This is your defensive coordinator. He wants to make sure he makes the right hire. Right. And that requires some time. And people don't seem to get you know, that. And, and and he's and the other thing is there's been other priorities greater than that for him. Mainly, he really needed to get on the road and recruit. Yes. And he was and, everywhere during the open recruiting period. I mean, literally everywhere. So if people think that he's just sitting around twiddling his thumbs, not doing anything, you know, do I take Al Golden? Do I? You know, I mean, he, that's not what's happening. He's actually doing his job and recruiting at a very high level right now. And that takes up time. Correct. So that's the reason that he's not named a defensive coordinator. Right. Because he hasn't made a decision on a defensive coordinator. And I promise you, if you're a member of the message board, and then it'll matriculate here a day or two later. Right. If I get word, I've been pretty on this, right? I mean, we've right. been pretty on this, right. you know, I mean, well, all the people are putting out lists of seven or eight. We were the ones that said, this is the four, right? I mean, that's right. That's kind of the deal. So we've been on top of this. I promise you, if I get, if I, if, if Marcus Freeman makes a decision, we'll find out pretty quickly. Yeah. And we'll let you know. And until then it's like, look, I, I, 
It's not a given that Al Golden would take the job if he was offered it. Good point. And there's still, a, again, there's still there's still a lot of head coaching jobs that are open in the NFL right now, right? I think the Saints are still open. The Vikings are still open. The Jaguars hired their coach last night. I think there's a couple others. The Giants have their new coach. Like, there's still a couple other jobs that are open, which means – and there's going to be D coordinator movement, which means – I mean, that's – There's going to be a ton of movement. There, there's, there might be some people looking at Al Golden. He's the sure. linebacker's coach on a Super Bowl team that had pretty good defense this yes, year. Yes, they did. So, there's a lot of reasons why the hire hasn't been made. Absolutely. And it's not because he's waiting on Al Golden's season to be over with. And can – Somebody uh, said to me, what was it yesterday? I don't even remember, but that Al Golden is not even interviewing for anything until the season is over. That's why it's dragging out as long as it has. I'm sure there's been contact though made, right? There's there's expressed interest on both sides. Okay, and and you know, props to I, I do believe that to be true. I do okay. believe he's not. But what that is, is that's not a form. He's not going to do a formal interview. Right. Meaning he's not going to leave the Cincinnati Bengals facility to go to South Bend or somewhere else, NFL or what uh, other related until the season is over with. And I, I respect that. Okay. I respect because they give these coaches windows. Sure. When you're in the postseason. Absolutely. They give you windows where if you're going to interview, go interview. It's just part of the deal. He is from what I understand, chosen not to do that. But that's different than saying I'm picking up the phone and talking ball with somebody that absolutely. you know that, that might be interested in. It's me. just that's, not a formal a sit down three hour interview where, you know, absolutely. Or in okay. Jim Harbaugh's case, nine hour. And still not get the job. I mean, okay. Uh next question from Tony. And he says, any update on Watts going back to wide receiver? Looking at the two deep, there is really good chance he gets significant playing time there can we just say that he'll get significant playing time no matter which position that he's going to be at I think that that is probably fair okay and I think that's I think that's kind of part of what's going to make his decision tougher sure absolutely yeah no no question so yeah but as far as I as far as I know he still plans on playing defense as far as I know and until you know until we show up on for spring right. practice, the open right. the first open spring practice and see him yeah. on the other side. I mean now his again, there's time for him to change his mind. And I think that's what you know I hope the offensive coaches are doing. But keep in mind too that ever since Chancey Stuckey got hired up until the last five days, he's been on the road right. recruiting. So he hasn't had a chance to sit down, go over right. his room, go over his board, and that's do important. all that other kind of stuff. So it's it's gonna take it's gonna take a little bit of time for them to get that done. Because you gotta understand there's a there's a level of distrust there that doesn't just go rightfully away so. because yeah, rightfully certain so. coaches are gone. Yeah. Right. And, and that's so. that's that's the reality of it. And and that's gonna build that's that gonna trust take back time. up. I mean, that's yeah, that's, that's gonna we take talk, some time. Remember yesterday, Brian, we talked about the trust level, you know, and, and trusting the position coach and the relationships and all that. Chancey Stuckey hasn't had an opportunity to establish any sort of a relationship with Xavier mm-hmm. Watts, right? Let alone mm-hmm. the guys that are already in his room, right? So yeah, it's going to take a minute before I think we get an idea of what's going to happen. And you might see in the sp- – because, look, the spring is literally experimentation time a lot of times for some guys. You might see him doing both. And, mm-hmm. I mean, you don't think that's – I mean, I think that's a legitimate possibility. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I think he- it would be – if, like, they get into a pinch where they've got a – you know, they, they need a receiver to play some snaps and yeah. he's not making a full-time move, it, it's possible. I, right. I, I don't – I don't – I think that would be worse for him than just – yeah, moving back and forth. I agree. I totally agree with that. Yeah, that's just my kind of my two. My no, two I'm with you. I'm with you. It's, I'm just I'm trying to speak it into existence. I want him yeah. on offense, but you know it is what it is. All right, Corey D. He's back, and with the the ever onward debate about the pants, Brian. I know Marcus Freeman has more important things to think about, but I'm curious if you're hearing anything regarding Notre Dame changing their stupid mustard pants and going with the 2019 BC or 80s 90s look i mean i don't i mean this isn't even something that's on my radar to even ask about so i highly doubt it's on marcus freeman's radar i don't know how much influence the head coach has on that i don't i don't have any idea if he has any say on that i right you know i'm I, sure it's pretty low I, on his priority list too to be i would hope so you. i mean that's i would hope so that's not something that's all yeah. that important i yeah. no offense Corey, because i agree with you i think no i think it'll be an important conversation but it's just one for more right. of after post spring ball, you know, exactly. It's not going to be orders in for the jerseys, and it's not going to be the way it works. Ball. Is you, yeah. you you start putting those orders in normally, like in the 
late spring, early summer is usually when you start putting up because you're right. You have a better idea what your roster is going to be. How many XLs do you need? How many double XLs do you need? You know, All to a degree, you're going to order a certain number, but you still have to have some idea of what your roster is going to look like. Right. Before you put those orders in to Under Armour. So I, I doubt that's something that right now is necessarily a big concern. Now, sure. Absolutely. I mean, if I ever had a chance to sit down with Coach Freeman and talk to him, I would tell him, dude, you got to do something about the pants. You're a stylish right. guy. You dress nice. You dress fly. He does. You do all the, he does. You know, the reality is, man, you got to make sure your players are dressing as fly as you do on Saturdays because those mustard pants are just horse crap. You know, it's funny. You know, right. I was talking with Sean about this yesterday. Okay. You know what would be the ideal uniform combination for me? Ooh, okay. And what I want to get here? everybody's opinion on this. Okay. If this was up to me, right? Okay. You may have always said if I was like the football god for a day. Yeah, right. If I was that, here's one of the things I would do. I would go with sort of like I'm fine with the jerseys the way they are. I, I like the jerseys, the upper the, the home jerseys. I would go with the the gold pants they wore for the BC game. Like that would be my normal color, right? I, so you have a blue jersey, those gold pants, uh, the gold helmet they have now. You remember the green shoes and gloves they wore for the Cotton Bowl in 2018? I do. I would wear those with the blue and the gold. I don't like that there's no green in there. And then my road uniforms, would, I would make them green. The number's green. That would oh, be my normal road uniform. <laughs> would be the green with the green okay. gloves and the green shoes. I like a little green accent. I, I, I do. I, I do. I, I dig that. I think Notre Dame has a pretty – their road uniform looks pretty sweet. And it'll look even better if they change the pants. So, oh yeah, more true because because I don't have any problem with Corey's comment. I mean, I, I I'm with him. I'm 100 percent with him Me on too. that. Like, oh, I absolutely. Hate the pants. It's just it's just low it's on just my not list. on my radar right yeah, now. Exactly. Right. I'm trying to find out which position Xavier Watts going to play. Who you hiring as your defensive coordinator? You know what? I mean, <laughs> oh yeah. I, by the way, pants. <laughs> yeah, I know. I got a very limited time here, and I only have a certain number of questions I can ask you. Like, I had a chance to interview Coach Freeman yesterday about recruiting the defense. I want to talk okay. about the defensive class, and I'll have that up later today. So we talked a lot about the defensive class. I only had a certain number of minutes that I could spend right. with him. I was not going to spend those minutes. <laughs> By the way, I'd like to talk to you about Tyson Ford, Naden oh. Govira, and their pass rush ability. Come on, why not? Why not? I was curious about the pants. I'm here speaking for Notre Dame <laughs> Nation. community, yes. IB Nation, and <laughs> the pants got to go. They got to so, go. Yeah, um, yeah uh, not this time, Corey. But that would be my ideal color combination. I, I – I thought those gloves and those hats were friggin' sweet. And I, I don't necessarily think like the whole, you know, green thing and all. I just would make the green, the 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 road, jer just the road jersey, just always green. I think that was all the sweet. numbers being green, like yeah, white the, uniform. The numbers, yeah. Yeah, right. Exactly. Absolutely. I just make that my normal. It's kind of like the Sugar Bowl with Bettis, right? It was yeah. kind of like it was a white with a green, with the green yeah. number. Like I thought that popped. I, yeah. I really dug that. And they yeah. haven't gone back to that. Really, at all, they kind of did that weird, even in the cotton bowl, white jersey. Yeah, with even green, in the cotton yeah. bowl, they went with the green gloves and the green shoes, but they kept the number blue, right? I would have made that green. I just, yeah. I like a little bit of green in the uniform. I think having it be on the gloves and the shoes would be a really like, I think that would pop big time on TV and in photos. Yeah, I think that'd look sweet. Now, every kid doesn't have to wear green, you can wear white, you can wear black. Gloves, oh, sure, but they, they get options. Yeah, you have I mean, that option, but I would yeah. definitely go with the green shoes. I would definitely, I would, I think that would be sweet. Now, well, will they do it or not? I have no idea, but if it was up to me and I was the Notre Dame football god for a day, <laughs> next time you know, you're having that conversation with Marcus, yeah, that, that would be. And I've heard people say, well, about green pants and Matt 2011 GT, uh, and he said the same thing. And, um, I, I would never do green pants. I don't I don't like I, that's too much green for me. Right. Like I don't right. love the green jerseys per se. You know what I mean? I that, see, I don't that, mind the ones that they've been doing, like the recruits wear and stuff. I really don't mind those green ones. Just not every day. I mean, that's yeah. not that's I don't not I don't I love them. them. Like I don't hate them. Yeah. I don't love them. The only time yeah. I've ever seen a green uniform that I liked was the Fenway ones. Those for whatever reason, those were sweet. Because I think it's because this is all green. I feel like green doesn't mesh well with other colors except for white. That's just kind of my weird thing. Like Celtics uniforms look sweet because just green and white. But I feel like when you have green as a dominant color, like I think green is a great complementary color on a uniform. Sure. I don't think green is a great. That was too much green for right. me. Fenway. Like look at the flag, right? Like, yeah. You know, but well, the reason I like the Fenway one, because it was just green. Green okay. was the dominant color and you weren't trying to well, contrast it with something else, right? <laughs> like 
green isn't a, a dominant color, meaning like it's a it's a complementary, like part of a complementary, you know, green and and yellow or green and whatever, right? Like that's why I like the organ helmets that my favorite organ helmets are the ones that are all green with just a little yellow. Oh, because the green dominates. You know what I mean? Like I think green with like yellow pants, I don't like. It's just like it makes the green look weird, but just green and green. I think looks good. It's a weird thing that I have. It's a weird visual thing I have with green. Interesting. Um, and, and I don't know why that is. Maybe okay. it's right. growing up a Celtics fan. I just the green and green is something I like. But I've thought about that. Like green pants. No, I don't. I don't. I don't like those. If you're gonna go green, then just go green. Just like, you know jump I mean? in the green. Vat this of is paint. not a political yeah. statement in any way, shape, form, or fashion. It is literally a color <laughs> statement regarding uniforms. I'm not advising people to go green. I'm saying wearing all green uniforms. <laughs> uh, I my, my last little bit I, I will add. I did the BC uniforms. What the, the, you made them look like the '88 uniforms, right? I did like the really the, the big numbers and like I thought those popped. I like those jerseys, and as well as with the pants, I thought that that was definitely something that they could think about going to uh, as a home uniform. I really had. I like those. I, I really I thought those were really cool. But. They look great in person. They did not look great on TV. Okay. I didn't think because you couldn't see the numbers. That was the problem. Like really? This, yeah, you couldn't see the numbers on TV in twenty. No kidding. They mm -hmm. they popped in person, man. Yeah. Like it, oh, I thought it was sweet. easier. They it was sweet. easier to see in person. Like you know what I mean? Yeah. But, okay. So here, here here's the question we got to get to: Notre Dame, Celtics, Broncos, and Reds. Where the hell are you, Brian? Where the hell are you from? <laughs> It's really, it's really simple. Okay. That's funny, That's funny. Notre Dame Celtics and Reds is all my dad. Right. So like my dad is from Norfolk, Virginia. Right. And growing up in Virginia in the, he was born in the fifties. So in the sixties and early seventies, there was no college football. I've explained this before, right? There was no college football. The only college football he got was those Sunday replays with Lindsey Nelson. That's how my dad became right. a, um, it became a Notre Dame fan. Celtics. Again, if you're growing up in the sixties and seventies on the East coast, of the United States, you grew up a Celtics fan, yeah. Right, I mean, it's just yeah. That, and and my my family's Irish, you know. Yeah. I mean, and hello, Boston Celtics, right? I mean, they didn't go full Irish, you know, Celtics, but you know, the Boston Celtics, Close enough. right? Yeah, right. So you know, obviously, and he was a Celtics fan before the '80s, you know. But that's when I became a Celtics fan. So if your dad's a Celtics fan and you're born in 1978, hey, guess who was a pretty influential person in your life as a sports fan? This guy named Larry Bird, you know. Yeah. So like. I grew up watching Larry Bird and DJ and Kevin McHale and Casey Jones and Robert Parrish and, you know, all those guys. You know, I I remember Lynn Bias dying, you know, and I remember Reggie Lewis dying, you know what I mean? Like, I remember all that stuff. So that's how that came. The Reds thing is just I was born and raised in Ohio, and my dad – I guess my dad liked the Yankees when he was a kid. Hmm. I was a big Mickey Mantle fan, but when he moved to Cincinnati, he moved to Ohio is kind of when the Big Red Machine was coming along, and – that makes you know, sense. He quickly fell in love with the Reds. So uh, that's how I became a Reds fan. And Broncos, I still don't know that one. My dad, oh, my dad knows that one better than I than I do. And he just like I guess when I was like five years old, he had he used to get Sports Illustrated magazine, and I saw John Elway on one of the magazines, and I was like, that's my dude. That's my favorite player. I was like five, six years old. My parents are Redskins fans, and so they grew up. They my whole family was Redskins fans in Virginia. And then my family in Ohio were all Browns fans. So as my fa my parents as Redskins fans, everybody there is, you know, um, you know, growing up was was Browns, some some Bengals, but I just saw John O and was like, that's my guy, right? So the the Broncos one is the only one that doesn't have some sort of tie into my doesn't dad. Fit. Yeah, one of these things yeah. is not like the yeah. other. Yeah. Yeah, that's the weird one. But now that kind of explains I don't have a hockey team. I don't I never really watched hockey. And um and no, I don't. Somebody said, you mean the commanders? No, I don't mean the commanders. My parents and most of my family aren't Washington football fans anymore. Um, they stopped liking the Redskins years ago. And so they haven't adopted the new uh, team. Right. So they were Redskins fans because at the time they were. I knew someone was going to. They were Redskins. That. So I that almost was their did. name. I almost did. What? Brought up the commander thing. Yeah. It's a, Whatever. I, I don't, know. I it don't is, care. Whatever. It is what it I, is. I have no no feelings on that one way or the I, other. I just did don't you, care. Okay, let me ask you this. Did you see like the the, the 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 picture that showed like all three of their uniform choices or whatever? Barely. Somebody put on there is like, wow, I didn't realize Washington joined the Pac-12. Oh, like, wow. I, I actually thought that was pretty funny because 
they do kind of look like Pac-12. You know, they look like, like Arizona State basically mm-hmm. with a lot of their picks. But I thought yeah. that, was, that was kind of funny. And just so people know, like I don't, I don't have a hockey team, and I don't really watch the NBA anymore. And I'll be completely honest with you, I've thought about finding a new team to root for in football, NFL. I just don't have the same loyalty to the Broncos as I used to. I just, you know, I, I mean, I know like Elway's kind of still like, you know, he's a higher he's up, but, I just, off, but he's not the GM. Yeah, or anything. Like, I just like, I remember watching the bills play the chiefs and I'm like, I would much rather watch one of these two teams every week, especially oh, yeah. the bills. than bills are fun to I, watch. Cause as much as I love Pat Mahomes, he's still on the chiefs. And, and I just, I can't See, go that's full where your sell Bronco out. loyalty will never I die. I can't go full sell out, yeah, man. I fair. just can't, I can't root for the Chargers like that. That's I, fair. I root for the the Notre Dame players in the Chargers, and there's like 43 of them on the Chargers. <laughs> it's like half the roster. Yeah, yeah it's like Notre Dame guys. Yeah, <laughs> the Los Angeles Fighting Irish. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I've I've kind of thought about that. I probably won't because I just don't watch enough NFL or care enough to pick a team, but. If well, I were to switch, it probably go to yeah. It unless was, you pay to get the I'd ticket. Find some, but see, the reason is, is the reason I thought about switching to the Bills or the Chiefs is because those two quarterbacks, more than any quarterback in the last thirty years, remind me so much of John Elway. The way they play, yeah, that's you know, fair. Just big arms, athletic t- playmakers, and they're they're the, the thing I love about them is this is what I love about John Elway is, is as long as there's time on the clock, you're not you're feeling nervous. Twenty five you know points I mean? in two minutes. Yeah. yeah, 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 and yeah. Like that Pat Mahomes drive at the end of the of the Bills game was like that's like such a John Elway drive. Sure, you know, and that's 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 kind of why I like watching those guys. So that was kind of my fair enough. That was kind of my thing. But I I do I will say this: I'm not a big NFL guy, but I've thought about watching more of the NFL. Th- then they do something stupid that makes me like, oh yeah, that's why I don't watch the NFL anymore. But I love, like, part of the reason I fell out of love of the NFL was just it was bad football for a long time, in my opinion. Because there's bad quarterback play. It was like Tom Brady and one or the two other guys, and then a bunch of garbage. But man, the quarterback play in the NFL the last two or three years yeah, becoming a has just, yeah. I mean, with what was, I'm trying, wasn't like, didn't like Josh Allen and Lamar Jackson like come in like one draft. But just you look at just like the last few years, the quarterbacks that have entered the NFL just in the last three, four years, it's insane. I mean, you just go back to the, was it the 20, the 2017 draft, you had Pat Mahomes and Deshaun Watson entered the league in 2017. That's just five years ago, right? So those two guys entered the draft. Then 2018, a year later, you get Josh Allen and Lamar Jackson. So in two years, in two drafts, back-to-back drafts, you had Pat Mahomes, Deshaun Watson. I'm sorry, Vince, you also had Mitch Trubisky. The Bears could have had uh, could have had Deshaun Watson. Or Pat Mahomes, but said chose Mitch Trubisky. For reminding me. I just yeah. thought I'd throw that in your face. Like I didn't bit. realize that was the, the next case. year. So after those two, the next year you come out and you have Kyler Murray, who you know Daniel Jones, who I still think there's hope for. I'm not ready to write those guys off. And then the year after that, you had Joe Burrow and Justin Herbert in one draft. And then last year you got you know you got you got Trevor Lawrence. And so in a very very short period of time, you've seen quarterback playing the NFL really skyrocket. And and I wonder. I don't have any evidence of this. I wonder if that factored into Tom Brady's decision to walk away. Like he, I feel because part of me, like it could have nothing to do with it, but I've always felt like that's a unique position where like, you know, I feel like the game is in a good place with these up and coming kids. It's time for them to get their chance to shine. It couldn't, it could not have anything to do with it. That's just something I've wondered and thought about, you know, like passing of the torch, you know, like, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe not, but I, that's something I, at least that's something I thought about. <laughs> <laughs> and guess what? It's your show. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. Talk about whatever the heck I want to talk about. <laughs> Just saying. Uh, okay. John A1 coming in hot with uh, all kinds of questions. And John, I promise you we'll get to all of them, but probably not all in a row. Uh, John says, Jack Cohn had a good showing at the Senior Bowl. It was actually mm-hmm. the East West Shrine Bowl, right? So. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if coaching at wide receiver O line was at a good level in 21, do we see Buckner get the experience in the manner that we saw? Would Pine have gotten most of the work? I assume he means as the second string quarterback. Yeah, Pine. We would have seen less of Pine. I agree. I think we would have seen. I think we would have seen Buckner. In we would have seen we barring injury, we wouldn't right. have seen Buckner like we saw in the West Virginia game. Right. With a better O line and receiver coaching. I don't. I don't think we see Jack Cohn benched at any point in time this right. season. Right, and I think I th- 
I think I think Buckner's role is much more defined. Remember, like it would have looked like what it did at the end of the year. Right, first half of the season, it wasn't quite as defined as it became, and I think it becomes more defined. It kind of did because if you remember, like the the Toledo game when we first saw him, he came in for a whole series. Right, you know, not sort of as a change of pace guy like we saw late in the year. I think it would have looked a lot like it did from the North Carolina game on where he would have come in, change the pace guy. But if Jack had the offense rolling, and we weren't going to see him. Right. Exactly. And and so I think that's kind of, I think that's what we would have seen to be honest with you. Yep. I, I, I don't think we would have seen Tyler throw as much. I think that's the other thing we wouldn't have, because we wouldn't have seen a couple of the throws he made against Virginia tech. Um, may, maybe we'd have seen him throw deep more. Maybe, maybe that's something we would have seen just as a change up. But if, if Jack Cone played with a better offensive line and receiver coaching, he would have, I mean, he had a pretty good year anyway. Sure. Oh, yeah. I mean, he, had a, he had a very underrated season for Notre Dame this well, year. He's, I, he's climbing up some draft yeah. boards, too. I mean, again, and I'm not, not saying. not a great quarterback draft class, period. Which helps from him. From, yeah. Like 100% yeah. helps him. There is no question. What is the kid from Liberty and the kid from Pitt? I think those are kind of the yeah, two. Yeah, Sam Howell at Nor- from North Carolina. You know, there's Carson Strong from Nevada, who I know Ryan really likes. I mean, so, but there's no Joe, there's no Trevor Lawrence. There's no Justin right. There's no Trey Lance, you know, a top five talent, you know, and those guys were drafted as much for their potential as what anything that they did. And sure. Like Trey Lance was drafted on 100% on potential. I mean, Absolutely. He played one year of one double A football and there was a playoff game where he threw for less than 100 yards because they were just so dominant and he ran for a bunch. It was all about potential. And, yep. you know, but that's, there's that's there's what the NFL has become a quarterback, though. A lot that, there's, there's not like to me, if I'm a top 10, if I'm in the top 10, I'm not drafting a quarterback this year. No, I wouldn't either. No way. The problem is that if you're in the top ten, you probably have quarterback problems. Right? <laughs> is that you're you're just perpetuating yeah, it? I agree. You know, no, opinion. I agree. I think there's other holes that those teams would have, and we could do. I'm sure that we'll do an NFL draft show uh, with Ryan here, moving forward, but not today. And speaking of that, Vince, he does have an article out about because so Ryan has access to the practice film from the Senior Bowl and the Shrine Bowl. Oh, nice. His, his recruiting, his, his scouting contacts, and his work in, in the scouting department for the NFL draft. Cause that's where Ryan came from. Like that's where I saw the work he did. That's things right. he had done for me. That's where I saw his ability to evaluate players, things like that. So he still has, so he's, he watched the practices cause it's the practices care matter more than the game. Oh, like Jack, 100%. Jack played really well in the game last night, but it, if he'd have played bad all week, it wouldn't have mattered how he did right. the game. The game right. was a, a capping off of what he'd done all week. And uh, there was a throw he made in the game last night where I'm like, that's we never saw him do stuff like that. He he was throwing with so much more assertiveness. Like that he threw a curl out where he just I mean he muscled that thing. Right. Because he had he confidence was playing, in the guy. He, he was I don't think that was it as much as he was a he he was he was throwing as if he wasn't worried about making a mistake. Yeah. And I think that's been the biggest problem under Brian Kelly. And that's the Jack Cone we saw late in the year. Right. Guy that wasn't afraid to make a mistake. Because I think it, we saw that's where I think Tommy Reese's influence had a greater impact. Like, hey man, just let her rip. Point. That's you know, because Tommy Reese was, I mean, Tommy Reese was a gunslinger as a player. Oh yeah, I mean that's where he got the the His arm unfortunate turnover Tommy up. nickname, yeah. which I think is BS. Yeah, you know, I don't I don't like that nickname, but that's where it came from. Because he, I mean, Tommy didn't throw turnovers on like little slide routes and like little you know check downs. He he was throwing trying to throw down the field and take shots and. You know things like that. He was an aggressive quarterback, and if he would have had the physical tools of some of the guys he's coached, he would have been a right a much better player. Right. But that's kind of where that came from. So, yeah. I, to your to your question, I I think we would have seen less of Pine and Buckner. We would have not seen Pine at all, in my opinion. I don't. I don't because again, barring injury, like Pine came in against West Wisconsin because of an injury. Right. That's when we would have seen Pine. But that's it. I don't think we would have seen him coming off the bench against Cincinnati because I think Jack Cohn would would have been much better. And that's the other thing is, he, here's the question I'm going to throw at you, John, and for everybody in the chat. If the O-line and the receivers were coached better, Notre Dame doesn't lose to Cincinnati and they're undefeated in the playoff. Brian Kelly's still a head football coach. Ooh. Ooh. So would you make that trade? Some people would. Some people want Brian Kelly back. Some people would. Short term pain. I personally, gain. I personally would not. I would not make that trade. Look, you and I had this conversation years ago. Okay, years ago, like okay, you know, we talk about what the win loss record was going to be and all that, and you're like, dude, I hope they lose some of these so that maybe there's a chance. Like 
you and I have had that conversation. No, not that I hoped that they would. Well, I never hoped that they would lose. It was more right. like a if they if lose. If they do, that's not an all bad thing. Right. Like that, that, I think that that's a better way to phrase it. So I wasn't but, as upset during the 2016 season. I thought that was going to be the end of Brian Kelly. Yeah. But it turned out to not be that way. And <laughs> you were not correct. In, in some ways, it worked out really well for Notre sure. Dame. And sure. it's kind of led them where they are now, where Marcus Freeman's the new head football coach. So, right, right. If Marcus Freeman was the new head coach in 2022, to replace the guy that replaced Brian Kelly, it would have meant he inherited a bad situation. Absolutely. Because that correct. guy would have most likely been fired after five Absolutely years. Absolutely correct. Yes. The fact that he's doing it now, I think it was a he either wouldn't have been the head coach because that person would have done been successful and stayed. Like if Jeff Brom would have got the job from Western Kentucky or something like that, he'd still be here. He wouldn't be going anywhere. Right. You know, right. so things work so, out for a reason. I mean, yeah, you know, I yeah. agree with you. John, next question, which players should cross-train on defense in the spring to allow shifts defending the hurry-up from 4-2-5 to 3-3-5? Well, I don't think anybody needs to cross-train. I mean, it, it, look, like the Viper position, that's just kind of, you know, being able to drop into coverage and play off ball is just part of the Viper's responsibility. That's part of what it is, yeah, exactly. That would be the only one. I think there, there are some cross-training elements to that. Maybe they should cross train that a little bit. Let the linebackers coach work on those things. Although the interesting thing is, obviously, without Washington having spent so much time coaching linebackers recently, and Mike Elson did in 2015 and 16, but how Washington did the last four years, you know, there's a there's a you know someone there that can kind of work on them on that. But I don't think there's a lot of cross training, John. Needed, John. It's just that's who you are, right? Like Jason Adamiola doesn't need to cross train to go from three technique to five technique. That doesn't need to be the case. He just need that's just part of that job. So that's the deal. So Charlie Weiss's last belt loop, still top five for me, name wise. Thank you for the super chat. Have a good show, guys. Brian, I don't know if you saw my question in your inbox, but if so, please answer it if you can. Thanks, Irish Breakdown, and have a good day. Chat. Let me see what his question is, and maybe we can pull it up. So, Vince, okay. why don't you go like ahead to that. the next question real quick while I pull this one? No I pull his question up because problem. If we can maybe bring it up on the screen. I just got to see what the question was. There we go. John A1. Uh, now that Brandon Joseph has transferred to Notre Dame, if a young corner steps up and Clarence Lewis moves to safety, will we see more three safety looks or is Rover the future of the defense going forward? I think, honestly, I think that that is more situational than anything else, right? Because mm -hmm. safety brings a different set of tools to the the defense than a rover does right and so i think it i think it's more about the team that you're going to play as opposed to you know an overall this is what who we're going to be mm -hmm. uh, and i think this defense has enough flexibility to it where you can be that way you can bring mm -hmm. out three safeties especially if clarence lewis is one is a safety right you have a lot of faith in bringing in three safeties and then you also have mm -hmm. faith in your rover position so I, I just think Notre Dame's defense is going to be multiple in that regard right there. Mm -hmm. So I have his question. It's a recruiting question. So I'm going to oh, okay. off onto it. I just start Perfect. it. Perfect. Uh, and we'll we'll get to that here um, in, in, in the second that, yeah. half. Second half, yeah. we'll call it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Q Kibbs, and I think we are going to attack this maybe in a football 101, but I, I want to bring it up so he doesn't think that we skipped him. Uh, can we talk through the differences between Viper and defensive end and outside linebacker? What traits make someone more suited for Viper? Well, number one, they don't really have an outside linebacker position. I mean, the only outside linebacker they have is the Rover. Right. And it's nothing like that. They don't it's really not have like a an four, It's not like right. a 3-4 outside linebacker yeah. where you might and see just up on the line. And just one small nitpick, they spell Viper with a Y. I don't. I don't know why, but they do. <laughs> no pun intended. Uh, but they spell Viper with a Y, and I don't know why they do that. Uh, but uh, th there's two differences. There's a few differences, and we'll just briefly get into these, and we'll we'll, we'll do a more extensive football 101 as we get kind of closer to the spring or after the spring. It just depends on <laughs> the news just keeps breaking, right? I know, right? Viper is a more of a, a, a boundary position. So Notre Dame has tended to be a field boundary team. And we did do a football one-on-one -on, -one on this. We did talk about field boundary. So you'll want to check that out. But the Viper is the boundary position. So if the ball's on the 
you know, if you're the defense, all right, looking at it from a defensive standpoint, the ball's on the right hash, the Viper's going to go to the right side. He's the boundary guy. He's going to be on the short side of the field. And the big end is going to be to the strong side, right? Or, you know, which is also the field side. Okay. And <clears throat> that's one big difference. Second difference is, is sort of a responsibility or, or a, a superficial di- difference is the, the big end almost always has his hand in the ground at three point stance. Three point meaning three points of your body hit the ground, feet, feet, hand. All right. Two point is two, right? You get it. Four point stance is when you put both hands in the ground. Do you get that? So it's like, basically points of impact points of on contact the ground, yeah right? points of contact yeah and uh so a big end is in a three point stance the viper is in a two point stance almost always the another difference is the big end responsibility wise is is a guy that has to be great at setting the edge right he's got to be you now both guys have to be able to rush quarterback both guys have to be able to to set the edge and play the run the viper is it's more critical that he be that he has to be a either force or spill, either force back inside or spill outside, depending on what the responsibility is and what the play call. Some calls will have him set to, you look, you need to force everything back inside. Some calls will be like, hey, we need you to spill it outside and let the defense run to it. Just depends on the call. But that is a very important position. If you have a guy that's an okay pass rusher, but a great run defender, you are fine with that to a degree at big end. If you have a guy that's that as a Viper, your defense isn't going to be as good. And that's partly why the defense, in my opinion, was so much more impactful at times this season uh, is because they had a Viper that was much better at rushing the quarterback than than uh, the guy they had last year. Dalen Hayes is a very, very good, very, very good all-around player. Sure. But he was not the pass rusher um, that, that Isaiah Foskey was. And I think that impacts the defense better. You know what I mean? So that's that's my answer to that. And we'll dive more into it and responsibilities and you know the the big end sometimes has to play inside and stuff like that, but that's the the basic premise of of the difference between the two the two positions. Hulk strongest. Hey guys, love the show watching the Toledo game. On the Chris Terry touchdown, it was uh I'm I'm guessing this is was I dreaming that or can George Takis really run? He looked fast. No, he can I, run. I think George I mean, Takis is he, he can good, run. I mean, he's a good that's why we've been George's only problem has been I don't want to talk too much about George Takis right now. Um but he just he's a little inconsistent catching the football. And then we'll we'll kind of we'll kind of not chat uh about George Takis for now. And we'll hopefully have more on on that here in a little bit. So next question. But no, he he can run. Johnny, also, he's got those real long strides. That's yes. the other thing that plays into that it. Helps. Well. That helps. That helps. John A1, have you heard if Jason Onye was able to maintain his athleticism with his big size jump? Where do you think he can help the most? Was he more of a project guy coming in? I have not heard anything about him losing athleticism. I actually heard that they were very impressed with what they saw from him as a freshman from a size, strength, athleticism combination. The problem is you talk about being a project. He is the very definition of a project. The kid played two years of high school football. Right. The problem is, is that the the COVID stuff meant that he couldn't play his senior year. They canceled football senior year, so he didn't get that chance. But I mean, his first year of playing football, he went to the the he went to a school called Bishop Hendricken, right? And and he went there to play basketball, and they convinced him to play football, and he went out as a sophomore and was pretty good. And then as a junior, had like fourteen. I mean, some I have to look it up, but it was something like. Um, a bunch of sacks. I mean, he had a monster year, but by that point in time, he'd already committed Notre Dame. And so nobody really, you know, nobody was really able to get involved with him, but he was a kid that with, with some work, they think could be a really, really good player. And he's most likely going to be an inside guy at this point in time. Now yeah. there's a chance he could still stay at big end, but I think the makeup of the, of the, he had 70, 76 tackles and 15 sacks as a junior in high school. That's without without playing. He had one year of football experience at that point in time. So the talent is certainly there. Uh, it's it's um, he's 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 a real he's really good. Now, can he learn? Can he learn some of the other things like technique? Can he learn yeah. things like you know how to properly use your hands? Those are all questions that we 
we uh, we're gonna have to find out. And that's what we don't know. That's what I haven't heard a lot of in regards to how has he picked up those part that part of the game. But from a like in his size, speed, athleticism combination, they 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 like him. They like him a lot. Now, the thing is, like I said, project, he's gonna need some time. That's gonna be the big key. He's gonna need some time. And you know, we'll we'll see if he's gonna get it. Cause the problem is with a project like him at a place like Notre Dame, it's you may get passed up by the time you figure it out when you're when you're followed up a year later by guys like Tyson Ford and Aiden Gobira, and then the year after that it's Brennan Vernon and <laughs> Keon Keeley. You know, you you know, you you may get passed up if you're an yeah. end. Now, yeah, I do think, however, that part of the reason they're not really focused, they weren't really worried about interior players in 2022 recruiting is because of guys like him that they might be able to slide yeah. down inside. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. like there was a kid signed with Penn State. I'm trying to remember his name. Uh, boy, Caleb Artis wanted to come Notre Dame, and they said, no, we don't have room. They took Donovan Heinish instead. Now, I personally don't agree with that decision. I think Caleb Artis is a better player, but that's what they decided to do. And that was one that Coach Freeman, I think, gave to to Coach Elston because it's like, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take your word for it that this kid's better than Kurt was coming out, right? And that's a comment he had made in the interview yesterday was you know look this is one where you know people he goes i don't i didn't recruit kirk coming out of high school i couldn't tell you that i was only with him for one year but you know the people that i know and people that knew both of them referring to mike elson basically felt that he was better than kurt was coming to high school and if he's better than kurt that's a pretty good football player right i mean kurt Heinrich is a good football player no yeah Right. And, and, you know, but I just, as a prospect, I, I thought artist was better, but I, yeah, I and that's learned long that's ago not to, <laughs> not to bet against. I mean, you've got a dad that's beat cancer multiple times, right? Like, like multiple times he's beat cancer. You've got Kurt did what he did. Right. Right. Like, right. And, and it's like, I'm going to now bet against Donovan. I don't think so. Well, and that's the thing. It's like when you watch their high school film. Right. And I think, when we when he committed, we we obviously watched his film, and I remember thinking to myself, he's just a more athletic version of Kurt, right? And if that's the case, and his ceiling is higher than what Kurt's is, and that's what ends up taking place, then okay, right? Now there were better inside guys on the board. There's no question about it. But if you feel like he is the better guy, as far if you feel like he can turn in to somebody that's better than Kurt then you you take that chance you take that plunge and you're obviously very familiar with the family and you're familiar with it's everything the known versus the unknown right Absolutely. you don't know what kind of player Caleb Absolutely. Artis is going to turn out to be if yep. you you kind of feel confident that, that with with Donovan you know what kind of family background he has you know what kind of home right. support he's going to get you know he's going to have a brother that's going to be up as you know what about putting in the work and exactly. you know what kind of demeanor he has you know what kind of work ethic he has cuz not because not that Good he's going to because of Kurt because not every brother has the same work ethic as another brother, right? right? It's more of because you, because you've known Kurt for five years, you've had a chance to get to know Donovan over a five year period. Exactly is what I'm referring to. So no you've been able to yeah. vet that work ethic and know right. that it's going to be exactly. like Kurt. You don't assume it would be poor form to assume that uh, I this kid works hard because his older brother did. No, no, that would be a very poor decision in my in my view. Um, so. You know, Vince, before we move on to the next question, I know you said you lost a bunch of questions. I did. I'm starring them. Are you able to see I, them? I'm, I'm, I'm there. Yep. Okay. So I had then the I'll star them, and then you can you can pull them up. And as we pull that's, them up, that's a good them. question, John A1. I love when people ask about players that we don't often talk about, because sometimes I feel like, how many times can we talk about Isaiah Foskey? How many times can we talk <laughs> about certain right. players? You know what I mean? So I right. love when people ask. It's just the problem is a lot of those guys were playing scout team last year, so – there's just not a lot that's known about them, but Jason is a guy that people do think has a, a future at Notre Dame. It's just it's going to be a future in a crowded defensive line, and that right. could, you know he's going to have to he's going to have to battle some people. Corey D in big games, Brian Kelly valued experience over anything else, which was frustrating. Do you see this changing under Freeman? I hope Marcus Freeman isn't afraid to play inexperienced players when we go to Columbus. I mean, I mean, it remains to be seen look, because here, here's the thing. Oh, no. Here's the thing. We can't go. We can't err on the side of we can't look at 
Brian Kelly was too focused on experience. Yes, agreed. Because we didn't like that, we can't then err on the side, the opposite side of just right. playing young guys, just because they're more just talented. Yeah, more talented doesn't always equal best. I agree with that too. And 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 you've got to find that balance, right? And and that's going to be the key for Marcus Freeman and his in on in his defense in the defensive staff, and then Tommy Reese and the offensive staff is yes, you need experience, right? So like if you're if you're three best receivers are all freshmen like best meaning most let me rephrase let's just say hypothetically your three best receivers are three most talented receivers are true freshmen well that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to want to roll with three starting true freshmen at receiver because yeah they're your most talented but they know four route combinations each and it limits what you can do and they're not so much better at talent wise than the veterans that they're better players so you're finding that blend you know, this guy's older. He's not quite as talented, but he's a better player. So he's going to start, and we're going to make sure we get this younger kid 10 to 12 to 15 snaps. Right, with the hope right. of being in by game 5, 6, 12, that he's figured it out and he can take more of a load, right? Because then he may be the best by August, October or November. And so I think that's kind of where that balance comes from. And if it's close, you know, for a game like Ohio State, you may say, hey, look, if, if – if all things are equal, like talents equal and those type of things, you're going to go with the veteran, you sh- as you should, right? It's just if the younger kid's here and the veteran's here, then go with the younger kid. Like, li- right. Because you're either going to give up plays because this kid's young and makes mistakes or you're going to give up plays because this guy's just not that good. Right. I'm going to go with the kid that's that's really talented because you may, he may make a mistake or two, but he's also going to go make some plays. And, you know, look, like if you, you put Jalen Snead at Rover, he's going to make some mistakes in the opener. But if he's if he's physically ready to play and he has some semblance of a grasp of the defense, he's going to make some plays, too, is the thought process. So right. if he's close, get him, give him a chance, get him on the field some way, somehow. I just it's not a deal where, you know, you put your 11 highest ranked recruits on offense <laughs> and your 11, high, 11 highest ranked you know guys or your 11 you know, using a different, your 11 highest ceiling guys on offense and your 11 highest ceiling guys on defense. That's not how it works because most talented doesn't always equal best. Sure. The problem is Kelly went too far in the opposite direction. Right. Experience matters. And, and we got to make sure that we're not going so far in the other direction right. with the young guys. The reason Clemson did that is because Justin Ross, T. Higgins, and Trevor Lawrence and Travis Etienne in 2018 were just way better than anybody else that they had. They were elite players. And, you know, that's – Experience matters. Like Michael Mayer. I mean, yeah. Michael Mayer and Chris Tyree sure. forced themselves onto the field Correct. in 2020. Correct. I mean, you could not play. Robert Hainsey did that in 2017. Harry Heastan did not go into 2017 thinking, I got to find a, you know, we're going to, Robert Hainsey's going to start for me. He went in thinking, okay, I, I'm going to see who my best guys are. And Robert Hainsey just kept saying, hey, dude, you better play me because I'm I'm good enough to play right now. And so he did, found a home for him. And, you know, that that's, that's kind of what you want to see. With Foskey and the Adamiolas likely in their last year, how important is it to get Aiden Gobira reps down the line? I, I don't think you need to get Aiden Gobira reps now. Right. I, yeah, down the line. It's does he mean down the line like in the future or like down the line know. as far as different positions on the line? I don't like know. I, I mean, I, he's – to me, he's not – He the two guys he mentioned are both Vipers. He's. I'm assuming he's talking about Justin Adamiola, not Jason. He said Adamiola's – Okay. Both of them. Gotcha. So, yeah. uh, Aiden Gobira and Jason Adamiel have nothing to do with each other. Like yeah. nothing. Aiden Gobira is going to be a Viper, and that's where Isaiah Foskey and Justin Adamiel will play. Right. So do am I getting him snaps this year? Yes, I'm getting him snaps this year. Now, does that mean you play him in every single game? Not necessarily. He may not be ready for Ohio State, but I'm darn sure going to make sure he gets he gets eight to ten snaps against – and I'm not talking about waiting for mop up duty. I'm talking about getting him in, er, you know, in the rotation early against Toledo and Marshall, you right? Know, and get him, get him some, and then see how he does. And then do the same thing when you play UNLV and sure. Syracuse. And if the moment's too big, then right. okay. I mean, you get in, right. you go back to the drawing to board. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, I would absolutely, John, get him right. Get him involved some way somehow early. Here's the other thing too: if he can give me eight to ten snaps. And he takes away from Jason and or Justin and Isaiah early in some of those marshals and those type of games. And he takes away eight to ten regular rotation snaps, meaning like first, second, third quarter. Then you blow those teams out, and he he's playing a lot in the fourth quarter. You just took a lot of pressure off of 
of of your your veterans. They're like what can happen is if you play those guys too much early because they're fresh, you over you you kind of start getting that that high work volume now, and then it, you know, you try to recover and down the road in November, and that can be hard to do. If you can take some of that burden off of them in September, then you're going to be in a better place in November. So Absolutely. that's again, I'm not doing that against Ohio State. I mean, in Ohio State, it's you got to play your boys. Help us win yeah, that game. Absolutely, help us win that game. Yes. But that's the way that the that's the thing I like about how the schedule sets up. And I'm trying to pull it up uh real quick here. Right after Ohio State, you've got that real nice two game schedule against Marshall and Cal and Cal, right? Which gives you a chance to kind of work some guys in. Now Cal's no pushover, right? Like you can't just, you know, take your take the ball state 2018 approach and just practice your third teamers all week. But there a guy like Obira, Tyson Ford, you can get them a couple snaps. Then you have North Carolina. Then BYU and Stanford. And then you've got back-to-back games against UNLV and Syracuse. Again, the way that those are set up are like, hey, take a couple snaps from those guys off that. So that way when they go to Clemson, they've played 20, 25 fewer snaps in, in those games leading into that than maybe they they would have. And then if you did that also in September, and then you've got the bye in October 1st, you know what? Those guys are gonna be a little a little more fresh going into right. that that November 5th Clemson game. That's how you work a schedule like that. Like people talk about, you know, all these games and, 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 you know, they're, they're going to play 16, 17 games now and all that. And if that becomes reality with an expanded playoff, you're going to have to do this. Yes. You're going to have to play more guys. Like people, the, people say, well, you know, NFL guys versus college. Well, here's the difference between NFL and college. In the NFL, I think you only dress like what, 48 guys? I thought 53, but is there like a, do they take some of that off and make yeah, them like, like reserve like not everybody's or whatever? Active. Not okay. everybody's active on game yeah. day. Okay. And in college, you dress however many dudes you have on scholarship, right? Yeah. And, you know, find well, ways to get games, those you dress right. Literally everybody. Right. So. so find ways to get more guys in the rotation. That's how you can ease some of that, that pounding that people are going to, people are going to take. Hey, I want to bring up something real quick too. Here. Oh, Irish no. for life. Uh, he's been having a tough time here lately, physically. And, um, dealing with a lot of different things. And so uh, he has asked us for uh, prayer and cause he's dealing with a lot of pain and you definitely have it. You have it for me and Vince. And I know that there are other people in our community as well. Um, we're definitely always right definitely keeping in our, in our thoughts and prayers, buddy. No All question right. about it. So I appreciate you coming here and asking for that. I, I, I really, I really do. We always encourage that because we do say this is a family, right? And sometimes families struggling and, you know, um, a, a regular member of our community and uh, Shelton Hager uh, last night posted that he, him and his family suffered a very, very sad, tragic loss and needs prayer as well. And, and he's certainly thinking about that. And I just, I love the fact that when the people are going through really tough times that they come to our community because they feel like this is a brotherhood. And, and I mean that in a, a broader sense than just a bunch of men, you know, cause we have plenty of ladies in here too, but um and they feel like, hey, that's a group of people that care about me, and we do, we do, buddy. So, you certainly have, you certainly have our prayers. No question, certainly have our prayers. God, country, Notre Dame barbecue, which is hilarious, by the way. Mm-hmm. All right, here we go. Would you? What? Who would you predict as Notre Dame's leading rusher, receiver, and tackler next year? I already wrote mine down. I cheated uh, because I saw this question coming. I think Chris Tyree is my leading rusher because, and I I think that Logan Diggs and Audric Estime may, Logan Diggs specifically may get more carries than him, mm-hmm. but I think that Tyree has obviously the ability to break the big ones, mm-hmm. and so I feel like he is going to end up with the most yards. So I've got Tyree there. Receivers Michael Mayer. Uh, I mean it says receiver, but I'm thinking receiving yards. So I'm going with Michael Mayer, and I went with JD Bertrand as the tackler because I still think he's going to have a ton of tackles. It's a good one. I, I really can't, I don't know about tackler. I'd have to think about that one a little bit more. I kind of feel like Maris Lewis, I was going to, if as Ooh. the will, because I think JD at Mike is going to make a lot of play. Let's say JD wins the starting Mike job. Sure. He's going to make a lot of tackles. He's on the field. He's not going to play as much at Mike because he's going to rotate with Bo Bauer. Right. I mean, Bo's going to play. That's it's just how much is Bo going to play? Yeah, sure. I don't know if you're going to see as much of a rotation of Will. I hope you do. Uh, I would love it if, like, they don't have a guy with 100 tackles next year because that means Prince Collie's in the rotation. It means that you've got, 
you know, guys rotating in and out and your rotation is really healthy. So you could end up seeing a DB lead. You know, you could see Brandon Joseph lead the team in tackles with like 82. Yeah. Good right? point. Something like that, you know? So I think that would be, that would be my caveat is, is I, I'm a little less comfortable predicting who's going to lead the team in tackling because I think we're going to see a lot more of a rotation situation, but I would say right now, my, just the nature of the defense and and who normally is the leading, like where did, why did JD Bertrand make all those tackles this year? Because the will by nature is your playmaking linebacker position. Sure. And that's going to most likely be Maris this year, not JD. That's fair. So that's why I'm and it would have been if he didn't I'm get hurt. That yeah. one. But okay. I, I agree with Chris Tyree. I think, I think Chris Tyree is a very underrated player. I, I think that Notre Dame fans have not appreciated what I he brings to the table, that. partly because he has not been used correctly. Exactly. And I that think that's going to be a change. big part of it. That's, that's a huge if, part if of it. If that doesn't yeah. change, then he's not going to be the leading rusher again. But if used correctly, I think he could be their leading rusher. But I also agree with you that I don't. That doesn't necessarily mean he's going to get the most touches. Right. Like Chris Tyree, if 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 you know behind a Harry Heastan line could, you know, we saw this with Dexter Williams in 2017, right. and I think Chris Tyree's much further along than Dexter was as a football player. And and you know he averaged nine yards a carry. He, right. he could do and you know he would come in carry the ball four times and go for, you know, fifty some yards. You know things like that, and sometimes rip off a big one. Well. All due respect to Dexter Williams, Chris Tyree is an even more explosive player. Yes. So that's um that's yeah, that's that's gonna be an interesting one. Receiver? Uh I mean mayor. Okay. Catches and yards, mayor. Yeah. <laughs> Michael Mayer's I mean, there's a chance it could be somebody else, but I'm not predicting that now before the spring. Yeah. I right. mean, we talked before about how the boundary position by the nature of the offense has been the leader. Is that just yeah. gonna be one guy or not? I you know, sure. I don't know. Michael Mayer will lead the team in catches if he it, as long as he doesn't get hurt. As long as he's healthy, yeah, right. Uh, I'd be a little surprised if he isn't one or two in receiving yards, but I don't know if we're going to have a boundary guy that's going to be like Kevin Austin, where that's going to be the guy. So um, I could, I would much, I would feel much more comfortable saying someone else is going to lead the team in receiving yards. Lorenzo Styles, you know, Deion Colsey, if he takes over the boundary job, somebody like that. But I, Michael Mayer is going to lead the team in catches. There's no question, and he better lead the team in touchdowns. If they, that, if they want their red zone offenses to do better, I have an idea yeah. for you. If you want your yeah. red zone offense better, <laughs> do more things. Get Michael Mayer the football. Throw the ball to 87. Yeah, really crazy. Like that just shows my football genius, right? I'm saying sarcastically that mm. hey, you might want to get more plays for Michael Mayer in the red zone. He's pretty good. Yeah, he's right? average. So he's whatever. average. Dan, I heard the bulldog with the super chat. Thank you very much. Great show, gentlemen. Is there a change now? For Coach Bayless in is in training the O line with Coach Heastan versus Quinn. I don't think no. so. No. I don't think any coach is coming in and telling. Let's coach not Bayless. forget that these two have worked together before. Correct. Yeah, they worked together in 2017, right. and we didn't see a sh shift in training. The offensive line coach isn't going to dictate that. It's it's more of the makeup of the type of offense you run, the tempo stuff like that. That may change, but that's more of a time. Hey, we're going to do more tempo this year. We're going to go faster, so we need these linemen in a little better condition as opposed to the big physical mauler types. So those are the type of things that that we could see, but it's not going to be a situation where um, you're you're gonna you're gonna see them doing anything necessarily right. different than right. he would have already done with I mean because you always want to nuance, you want to keep things fresh, like you know, sure, hey, there's new science, there's new data, there's this team that's using this technique. I studied it, I think it's gonna work. You do that in football, right? Like, man, this this offensive team is killing it, man. They're they're really good. Um, we need to study what they're doing. Well, the same thing happens to strength conditioning, right? Right. So, yep, that's that's kind of part of it. Van Gorder's fist pump. Thank you so much for the super chat. Do you guys think Drew's swagger could outperform Tyler's athleticism on the field? Feels like Drew has a chip on his shoulder, and players get behind him. If I mean. Go ahead. Go ahead, Vince. No, I go was ahead. gonna say if if Tyler lives up to who we think Tyler can be by the beginning of the season, even into spring, then the answer for me is no. I mean, swagger's important. Don't get me wrong. Playing with a chip mm -hmm. on your shoulder is important. Don't get me wrong. I like Drew Pine a lot. I, I think he serves a purpose on this team. There's no question about it. Could he beat out Tyler Buckner? Oh, yeah, he could. But if Tyler Buckner is who we think he is, then my answer is no. I don't. I do not think that it will beat him out based mm -hmm. on just that. Right. He would. Ha it would be it, the way that that works. And 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 the the. And by the way, I'm trying not to laugh at the Lane Kiffin 
avatar he has there. And Slane Kiffin is the Tiger King. Oh my guy. gosh, it is. I With didn't. I couldn't BK. tell. Yeah, wow, I'm freaking okay. dying. Trying not to laugh on that one. <laughs> um, but um, for me, the only way that you do this is if all things are equal. Like they're they've graded right. out. Like things are close. And Drew's the better leader, which is exactly why they should have started Malik Zaire in 2016. Because things were close, you know, how they went in fall camp. I mean, you, yeah. I remember you and I discussing this, and I took a lot of crap for this, but I kept telling people, like, Malik's out playing Deshaun in, in, in scrimmages. I, I don't care what anybody says about NFL talent potential. Malik outplayed Deshaun in the practices we went to. And he was a far better leader. Players wanted him. Yes. When things are close, that's what you do. Yes. The difference here is, is that, Players don't dislike Tyler Buckner like they disliked Deshaun Kaiser. That's the difference. And so I don't think it will matter. I think the players like Drew uh, Tyler Buckner. I've never heard anything about players not liking Tyler Buckner. Drew is just a more outgoing kid, right? And he just right. kind of draws that. But, I mean, l- let's not forget that during the season, people are like, man, the offense just works better when Tyler Buckner's in the game. That was the mantra a lot of people were saying because when Tyler would come in, they'd go down and score. Right. It's going to be about production, not chip on your shoulder, not those kind. Of, it's like who moves the ball up and down the field. Right. Yeah. So, hey, Ryan, are you ready to go? You ready to jump in here? All right. So we're going to bring Ryan in with us. We're going to do a little Woo! we're going to do a little, little three man show here for a little bit. But yeah, that's the thing I want to want to make clear to you is it, it, the only way that works is if it's all things are equal. Right. So Ty, Tyler's athleticism. I mean, but here's the thing. Could Drew outplay him? Sure. Could Drew win the job? Sure. But it's going to be because he outperforms him in on snaps and plays, not because he's just the better leader. That's that's how you break a tie. That's not how you pick a quarterback. Could not agree more. Since we have Ryan in the chat, I'm going to go ahead and throw this one up. Yeah, we can start bringing up some recruiting. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is kind of recruiting. He's on the team now, so that's why I had that one start as a team question because Tyson Ford's – I mean, he's he's enrolled at Notre Dame now. Yeah, you're right. He's on the team. He's not not really recruited anymore. But Ryan can still answer the question. He can still jump in. Notre Dame 2164. I'm really high on Tyson Ford. What do you guys think his ceiling is for his Notre Dame career? Ceiling for Tyson Ford. Um. So he's a little bit of a, a weird one for me, right? Because he's a guy that just for like projection wise, because I mean, strong side defensive end, but he also has a body where like could work inside and out maybe a little bit. So ah, uh, ceiling, I'm not good with this one. Um, yeah, I'm not good at projecting like four or five years so out. I, I think like stylistically speaking, and maybe I'm not speaking to the impact as much, like maybe like a Justin Tuck type of vibe, right? Like, again, I'm not saying that he's going to be Justin Tuck, but stylistically speaking, maybe Mm -hmm. similar traits as far as the length and physicality and power profile he brings to a degree, but not a perfect comparison for sure. The comp that I came up with. So uh, just so people um, know, like I, we, I released my rankings for the 2022 recruits now that signing day is over and Tyson Ford was the number three guy on the defensive class for me. He, uh, is we'll see behind Jalen Steed and Josh Burnham. I ranked him as a four-star recruit now as a, as a top hundred player. And I gave him a five-star upside because I love the tools, right? I think if he pans out, he's a, he's a great player. The comp that I gave him and Ryan, I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on this one. The comp that I gave, and I kept trying to find Notre Dame guys like Stefan to it. He's not like Steph- Stefan was a, a different type of player. Stefan was like a, just a, a, a different animal. The guy that I, whose game he really reminds me of and how you can use him as a big end and also as a five technique and even sliding side, Zach Allen from BC. Like, that's who I see as the upside because the thing about Zach Allen, he was 285, but he could rush the quarterback. And Tyson, right. to me, has the tools to be a good pass rusher as a big end. You know, 6'5", he'll be, he'll be 275, 280 when it's all said and done. If not, if not it's better now, Ryan. Oh. If not more, but... Mm-hmm. He's got pass rushing potential to be an eight, nine, 10 pass rushing guy, a sack pass rushing guy. And so that's why I love the Zach Alice Allen comparison. Cause again, Zach was what? Like he's about six, five. He was like mm-hmm. 280, 285. He was a good athlete. I think Tyson's even a little bit more explosive than he was coming to high school. The difference is, is Tyson's still really raw, like right. really raw, but yeah. upside like body athleticism and potential. And Zach Allen at BC was a, in case people that don't know, 
he was a third round NFL draft pick. He was a really good player, and his career numbers would have been a lot better if he wasn't trying to beat Harold Landry to the football for sacks for a couple <laughs> right. years during his career. But his last two years at BC, and I think, and I think that actually Tyson is could even be more sacks. But Zach Allen's last three years, he had 10, 15 and a half, and 15 tackles for loss mm-hmm. in his last two years. Uh, and he had see 12, 16 and a half sacks in his three seasons. But again, in, in two of those three years, he was he was on the same defensive line as Harold Landry. Well, but, I was going to say, and he, he's he's super. Uh, he's obviously a very disruptive player. Speaking about Zach mm-hmm. Allen, if I remember correctly, he also had like crazy tackle numbers, right? Like he was a yeah, guy oh, who yeah. was just in the run game was just a difference maker. And yeah, his you know, his junior year in 2017, he had 100 tackles, which for a defensive yeah. end is an absurd number of tackles. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, and he had 47 solo tackles. I mean, yep. high motor guy. I think Tyson could be that, but he's got a little bit more burst, in my mm-hmm. opinion. Now, right. can he learn to play the game the way Zach did? That remains to be seen. Sure. But that was my up. Uh, that was my comp for for Tyson Ford is Zach Allen. And if if even if he just matches Ty- Zach Allen and doesn't improve on the sack numbers, I'll take 10, 10 tackles as a sophomore, ten tackles for loss as a sophomore, fifteen mm-hmm. and a half as a junior. <laughs> And then 15 and a half uh, or 15 as a senior and 16 and a half tackles for loss. And this, yeah, I'll take that. Yeah, I'll take that. He had seven pass, he had 14 pass breakups in his three years. Yeah. Uh, he had four fumble recoveries. You know, I mean, he was a very disruptive player. That's why he became a third round NFL draft pick. Although, like I said, I would argue that, that Tyson Ford comes out of high school with a little bit better, a little bit more juice athletically than what yeah. Zach had. Now, He's now he's just got to figure out how to how to how to go play, in my mm-hmm. opinion. Yeah, he's. Um, I mean, Zach Allen's kind of like also. I don't know if you remember the kid from Baylor a couple years ago. Last name was Lynch. Yeah, yeah, big, yeah. big defensive end as well. Yeah. They're kind of like similar stylistically, and I I agree. And I think that the Is it James was that his name? Because James Lynch. Yeah, it was yeah. definitely started with a J. I think I think it might have been yeah. James. I'm trying to remember that. how how long he was. I don't. I remember him I, as a player, but I don't remember I him was, like. I, I think he was like right around six foot four as well, like somewhere okay. in that ballpark, like six yeah, four, six, two four, two eighty nine. Yeah. yeah. So. And if I remember correctly, he was even more of a sack guy than Zach yeah, he, Allen was. He had the big last year. I think that he was in double digits, but I th- I'm pretty sure his last year tackle tackle for loss numbers were like twenty something. If I remember correctly, yeah. it was a nice season. He was nineteen and a half tackles for loss and thirteen yeah. and a half sacks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But but similar, but like again, structurally thinking for people that are listening, that's what type of football player Tyson Ford for me is. Tyson's going to a be. lot longer, a lot longer, longer yeah. for sure. But strong side defensive end, and then the I think the high upside of pass rush is the fact that hey, on third downs, let's kick you down, let's get some more speed yeah. on the outside, and then yep. that length is going to be just yep. a lot for interior offensive line. And you've reduced the distance between him and the quarterback for sure. Which. Yep. <laughs> Mm-hmm. For a kid that I'm talking about, athleticism can be a a really impressive. I mean, it, look, it's not inconceivable in three years that in a four man pass rush on third down, you've got Keon Keeley and Aiden Gobira on the outside, and Brennan Vernon and Tyson Ford on the inside. Could and be that, worse. That, that's that's <laughs> and and your small guy is you know lengthwise is probably Tyson Ford, yep. like height wise. You know, I think Brennan's probably a, a touch taller than Tyson is right now. Yeah, I mean that's you know, when you're on a defense and Aiden Gobira is not your longest guy, which he wouldn't be. Keon Keeley would be. You you you're 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 doing some things. There's mm-hmm. there's no question about it. But I'm I'm very high on Tyson Ford. Yeah, very high on Tyson Ford. There's no doubt about it. Mm-hmm. Okay, boys, another question. God Country Notre Dame barbecue. How much can an opponent like Ohio State coming in week one motivate our kids to stay locked in in the off season? On the flip side. Does it counteract because they are playing ND? How can Freeman best utilize the game to keep the kids locked in? Do you put a beat Ohio State sign in the weight room or something like that right now? Personally, I feel like if you need that to get your players motivated, you have exactly. a leadership problem on your football team. Could not agree. I think right now, I mean, those things are fun, and and I think there's some whole they have Ohio State, State mentality, things. I'm sure. Yeah, but you know, you always when you're when you're the program like Notre Dame right now, your focus is on, hey, fellas, I'm not worried about Ohio State. I'm worried about us. If we go play our game, we can beat anybody. Now, is that true or not? I, I don't know, but that's 
that's the co- that's what we talked about the other day, Vince. That's that mindset that you're trying to build up. That hey, exactly. Anytime you step on the field, you're the best team on the field. Now go prove it. Right. right? Mm-hmm. And now the next several months are how you go about building the necessary traits to do that. Right. right. Athletically, strength wise, conditioning wise, technique wise, mindset wise, discipline wise, all those different things. You know, you're building towards that, but it's kind of like, hey, we're worried about Notre Dame. If we play our game, we can beat anybody. We'll we'll figure out how to stop C.J. Stroud, you know, in August. We'll figure that out down the road. Right now, I need to make you the best player you can be. Now, are, are there some things where you can kind of do for a little extra chip on your shoulder when it comes to Ohio State? Yeah, absolutely. But for me, it wouldn't be like a beat Ohio State. I, every, I'd, have a, I'd have a board on there, and every time somebody wrote a, art, an article about how Ohio State's better than Notre Dame, Ohio State's going to beat Notre Dame, Ohio State's this, Ohio State, I'd pin that sucker right up on there. Yeah. And nobody thinks you can beat these guys. They don't know what's coming for them. Like that kind of, that's the mind game that I would play. Not sure. like a, you know, beat Ohio State. Because I'm not think sometimes you can put so much into that one game that if you lose that game, you feel like your season's over, even though it's not. Mm-hmm. And so I think there's the there's the danger to that as well. It's about who are we going to be as a football team? Because when you've had the success Notre Dame has had anymore, it's, it's fellas, we're out there to prove that we are the best team in the country. And, and whether it's Ohio State or Cal or Marshall or whoever else, we're going we're going to go into the Marshall game just like we do Ohio State game, and not in a business like approach that Brian Kelly did, but that we're going to go out here and show you that you don't belong right. on the field with us, right. right? And that's the kind of attitude that you want a great team to have, and and that would be my focus more so than Ohio State, because again, if you need the Ohio State game, and you can use it, but if you need it. Right. Keep your players focused and locked in, then you have a much bigger problem than Ohio State when it comes to where you are from the character of your football team. Yeah. Uh, I would be very concerned about that. And and camp sucks too, right? So these guys have been just hitting each other every mm-hmm. single day. There's no preseason games. Like, I, I don't think they really need any extra yeah. point of now, emphasis to be ready to play. Right. Right. So. right. Now, fall camp, maybe you have more of an Ohio State emphasis, but not February 4th. Right, it's not for me. Exactly. I'm just not that it would be bad if they did it. It's just I don't think it's necessary. I, I think it's hey, let's let's focus on let's focus on making ourselves as good as we can be. And if we do that, you know, Ohio State doesn't know what's coming for them. That that would be my mentality. Here's a bit of a recruiting question here. Johnny S says, "Hmm, Ohio State cornerback Seven Banks has entered the transfer portal." Can I? Can I just say how funny I think it is on Twitter? Because I saw this on Twitter that people like tag Marcus Freeman in the fact that he's like, he, oh, snap. oh my, seven you... banks is in the portal, guys. Right. I know, right? Like, he doesn't know already if that's something that they're looking at. Like, oh my God, thanks so much for letting me know. Like, that just cracks me up. But anyway, he's in the portal. Any interest do you think from Notre Dame? That's where I'll leave that. Vince, you know what's even worse in my opinion? I, I don't know if you ever see this. It's like um like there will be like highlights of like kids going through the NFL draft process and people will tag the like NFL teams in it. It's yes, like, right. Yeah, they're they're looking at you. Well, your we eye. were gonna <laughs> draft so and so, but <laughs> they got tagged in this tweet and they said that we should draft such and such. Oh. And man, I can't believe we need to hire that guy. I know, right? <laughs> right. Uh, uh for seven, uh for me. One, I don't know what his academic standing is, right? So, like, Let's I don't just even assume know if it's... for argument's sake that he could get yeah. into Notre Dame. Just because, because that's an interesting conversation I'd like to have with you, Ryan. Yeah. Uh, so, so let's just assume he can and go from there. <laughs> All right. So last summer, a lot of people had me on podcasts and asked me about Seven Banks because he was a hot name in the summer for like mm-hmm. NFL draft side of stuff. Um, and I tried to not slander him as much as I could, because to be very honest, I don't think he's very good. I think that he has a little bit of length. I don't think that he has, I mean, I think he's very overstated as far as athleticism wise. And I mean, there was rumors about in and out of the doghouse this past year for Ohio state. He was injured a little bit, but like, I mean, he just hasn't showed up. Right. So I I don't know. It just, it, it leaves me a little uneasy. I don't know if he would be a target for me personally. I, I, Definitely not. And, and, and he got and he got bent. He well, and I know. Sir, I saw Charlie Weiss last belt loop just put it. Wasn't he injured? And yes, he was injured at one point, but he came back and he was good to go. And he had still gotten passed up by a couple freshmen, I believe. So he just yeah. wasn't performing and when he came the back. So, yes, <laughs> he that was in the transfer. Struggled to cover on a pass defense that was pretty garbage, yeah. in my mm-hmm. opinion, and. 
Ohio State last year ranked 96 in the country in, in yards allowed per game. Mm-hmm. They ranked 50th in in uh, in in pass efficiency rating. Notre Dame was 25th, right? And like to me, when when I when I, when I think that there's like this assumption that because it's Ohio State, Ohio State has been garbage on defense in four of the last five seasons. The mm-hmm. one exception was the one year they had Jeff Halfley. That's it. They have been garbage on defense. And a big reason why they've been garbage is their secondary has sucked. It has. For several years now. But mm-hmm. it's all it's DBU, right, hmm. is what some people will call it. They had a stretch where they were putting a ton of kids in the NFL, but they haven't done that recently in the secondary in the last couple of years. And some of the guys they have put out have turned out to be not very good. Jeffrey Okuda, before the injury set in, from what I've read, was not good. Yeah. Right. And because I don't think that they're they're not the same program they were defensively. Like for all the talk about, man, why are you so worried about Ohio State, guys? Did you see how many points they scored against Utah? My response is, did you see how many points they gave up against Utah? Right. <laughs> right. Like, you know, it last I checked, they have to play on both sides of the ball. Uh yeah. Seven Banks was not a very good player at Ohio State. No. He gets a lot of, in my opinion, he gets a lot of there's assumptions about him because he went to Ohio State and he plays DB. And mm-hmm. I'm like, that's fine, but he stinks. And their pass right. defense stunk. And you had freshmen beating him out for time right. this year. Yeah. And and they weren't that good either because, I mean, 90, freshmen, whatever. They'll yeah, be exactly. better, right? Yeah, like right. The, right. The, Bur- the Burke kid they had this year, he's going to be Denzel a really good player. Denzel right? Burke, yeah. He's yeah, he's going to be a really yeah. good player, but he mm-hmm. had freshman issues this year, right? Sure. Uh, junior year, he's going to be one of the best in the Big Ten, if not the country. But for now, he's not there yet. But he's a guy I would, you know, that that they trusted at times more than Seven Banks. I just, mm-hmm. I, I he he doesn't he doesn't make you better in my opinion. He doesn't make you better. I just I don't I don't see it. I mean, to put to put yeah. it in context, every time a, a who I who I believe is a really good player answers the portal, I bug Brian and text him like, "Hey, this guy just answered the portal. I don't know what his academic standing is, but maybe a look, right? Like I, the Oklahoma State kid, right? I don't Converse. remember getting a text from you about seven banks for some yeah, reason. Yeah, I said one for Jared Converse from Oklahoma State though, <laughs> right, but right. none for none for seven banks. No, right. <laughs> right. It's it's mean to do that to me because, like, you know, I'm like, you know, they're not going to get that kid into school, right? Like, you, they got no chance on that one. But yes, it's it's you got Brandon Joseph, baby. Yeah. You got Brandon yeah. Joseph. And if there's a couple other future NFL players at Northwestern, I'll, you know, Stanford, I'll <laughs> look at them too. But yeah, uh, Harvard, it's Yale. about the extent of Notre Dame's transfer portal options <laughs> at this point in time for undergrads. It's true. Sad, but yeah. true. Yep. Rob Osgood, I hope that Coach Freeman can bring back the attitude of the Coach Holtz era. It kind of like beat you to the ground, but in a classy way. I, I, well, I think the the attitude of the team from a from the coaching standpoint, right? The hype machine, what, however you want to call it, like whatever you want to call it, it's been missing under Brian Kelly because he was Mister Businesslike, right? So. I mean, I get that. I get where they're coming from there. I would argue that there are a lot of teams that played Notre Dame from 1988 to 1993 that would say Notre Dame was not classy. That's also I mean, fair. I, I didn't touch Notre the Dame talked there. a lot of crap back then. Yeah, I didn't touch and that. And I loved it. I yeah. mean, I, 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 I want swagger. You know, Absolutely. you can talk, tra- you can help a guy. I mean, Alohi Gilman was a fiery dude. If he laid mm-hmm. a dude out, he'd usually help him up, but that doesn't mean you're not saying something to him. I mean, you and know, you're helping them up. Like, yeah, right. like you might want to think about staying down there next time. You know yeah, what I mean? Right. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, I want them playing with swagger. I want them, I want them coming out and just just feeling like we're gonna physically and emotionally beat you up. We're 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 more athletic than you. I mean, just just that mindset of I want them getting in people's heads. This is the difference between Alabama, in my opinion, and Georgia in mm-hmm. in, in recent years. Because again, I still contend if Alabama's even remotely held, even if just Jamison Williams doesn't get hurt in that game, Bama wins that game. But the thing about Bama is they've won so many games the last decade just because they had you beat before the game even started. Sure. You were so like, we can't beat these guys are so, you know, that and and that's the that's how Notre Dame was at times back in the 80s. Like, you know, you were beat before the game even started. And, Mm -hmm. you know, some teams, you know, Penn State was not afraid of Notre Dame. And that's why they actually were one of the few teams that had some success against Notre Dame during that, that stretch of years. Miami wasn't afraid of Notre Dame. And that's why they were able to beat Notre Dame at times too. But Notre Dame wasn't afraid of Miami, which is why they could beat Miami. Right. But most of the teams you're going to play are like, man, we, we got no chance. Like these guys are so good. 
that's that's a confidence level to swagger I want to see Notre Dame get back to. Absolutely. And and I think the physical the, the Notre Dame can't be that without being elite in the trenches, especially on offense, to where you know, I want to see more 2017 USC no moss games, right? Where they're just like, I want no more of this. Like, you know, Rasheem Green, a third right, third round NFL draft pick, correct? Rasheem Green turning yep. his back at the snap of the ball on Quentin Nelson and just letting himself get driven off because he was just he's he done. I'm tapping out. Like tapping I'm, out, I'm, yeah. I'm done. Mm-hmm. Like, yes, I want to see that. I want to see that. And then you know what st- what that kind of did to the next few, you know, when you go out and run for 500 yards on BC, the next few opponents are like, uh, we got to face that. It's the you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah it, it is. And then you when they it. come off and they start hitting you in the mouth, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, Blake Fisher coach, if that's why I keep saying, if Blake Fisher takes to Harry, he, he stands coaching. Oh, <laughs> it's going to be so much fun to watch. I mean, it's going to, that's it's the bottom gonna, line. It's, it's yeah. going to be soul crushing for some people. Upon There's further review, no is going to be a lot more enjoyable oh, yeah. grading out the offensive line. That's all. Yeah. I'll say. Okay. Yeah. No question. No yeah. question. Kevin Park. This seems to be a very common one. So let's get this out of here as well, or out there hmm. as well. If Flores isn't hired back uh, into the NFL, how about him as defensive coordinator at Notre Dame? There are so many reasons this would be a bad idea, and none of them have anything to do with his lawsuit in the NFL. Mm-hmm. The guy, the guy wants to be a head coach. He is not going to be subservient to Marcus Freeman for a year. Right. He's mm-hmm. not going to be totally bought into Notre Dame for a year. He's not going to be on the recruiting trail grinding for a year. He's going to be like Matt Lafleur was in his one year at Notre Dame, looking as a quarterbacks coach everywhere else for yes. a job while yes. attempting to coach at Notre yes. Dame. Yes. And the other thing is, he's never coached in college ever. I was going to say, just like personality wise, he just strikes you as an NFL guy anyway. Like he doesn't come off as a college football guy, you know. Just what do you mean? I'm curious what you mean by that. And I'm like not saying very, you're wrong. He's, just... very, he's very, he's very business, but also like I'm going to be super hard on you, right? Like he's an a hole. Much... I mean, that's what every player and, and coach that's worked with him has said. He's an a hole. He's a sure. he's a jerk. Exactly. You know. So I that don't want really that play too. Yeah, that and it's completely well. opposite the kind of coaches that Marcus Freeman has hired so far. That's a good sure. point. Which are demanding guys and all that, but it, we're investing in their futures. That's the concern I have about bringing an NFL guy in, no matter who the name is. This is not. This is a business off the field in a in a big picture standpoint. It's a billion dollar industry, mm-hmm. but it cannot be a business in how you treat these young men on a day to day basis. That can't. That's still got to mm-hmm. be about college football and developing young people. And if you're not doing that, then I, I don't want you. And mm-hmm. and it appears that Marcus Freeman has that mindset as well. And that would not be Brian Flores. So forget all the, 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 I mean, that stuff to me makes him not a candidate, the stuff going on at the NFL. But even if you take that away, yeah. he's not on my radar. Well, and he's also I, I, part of the power struggle in Miami was that he wanted more control, right? right. So now you're going to put him as a defensive coordinator under a defensive minded head coach that wants a 35 year old, right? 35 exactly. year old head that of a guy that's been in the NFL underneath him, who he is still going to have to go to his, you know, whatever Coach Freeman wants kind of as the standard mm-hmm. on the defensive side of the football. Like, I just don't think that that meshes yeah. well at all. No. Like I said, take all that other stuff out that's going on with him in the lawsuit, which we're not getting into because this is a college football show. That mm-hmm. is not a guy on my radar. Like if even even if he called an ass, I'd be like, mm, no, no, <laughs> no, it's not going to work. No thanks. Another DC question from Garland Doxy: If Al Golden will be the DC, do you think Freeman will call the plays and have him in the booth? He is looking for a defensive coordinator to be to do all of it. So mm. now could Marcus Freeman eventually take over play calling if things don't go correctly? I guess his goal, however, is to hire. And this is partly why he's taking his time with it. He wants someone that he can hand the defense over to. Now there's going to be principles that he wants, and there's going to be certain philosophical things that he's going to want to see. And you know, he's not going to just stay out of defensive meetings, <laughs> but he is going to, he wants to hire a defensive coordinator. That's going to run the show completely, which means, you know, game planning, preparation, practice structure to a degree, uh, Marcus Freeman is going to handle the big picture practice structure. But as far as like, okay, here's the drills we're doing, focusing on today. Here's the install for today. That'll be the right. new coordinator. Day to day stuff. And then he right. wants someone that's going to call plays. Right. Mm-hmm. I think if he was looking to hire someone to just coordinate the defense and he was going to call plays, we'd have seen a hire already. He would have, it might even be someone on, he might make right. out Washington and just and find Mike a Lincoln's linebacker coordinators. Right. Exactly. And then just 
yeah, maybe promote Nick Lazinski to linebackers right. coach, easy, or more, yeah, or go hire a linebackers coach, right? So I think that would have been the direction we've gone. He Good is point. looking to hire a defensive coordinator that's going to be a traditional, true defensive coordinator, which also means Saturday play calling duties, right? Mm -hmm. All right, last one for me, guys. Cullen Turner, thank you very much for the super chat. Best day of the week is mailbag day. Agreed. Any updates on Carnell Tate and Dante Moore? Have a great rest of your day, fellas. So he, it's like a compliment sandwich, we, mm -hmm. but then getting right to the question that everybody always asks. I, I mean, Notre Dame's in it with Dante Moore. I think, what was it, a Michigan insider, right, Brian? Someone posted on the board yesterday that said that Notre Dame is a legitimate uh, contender for Dante Moore. And I mean, you could have been just listening to us for, you know, for the last. Uh, <laughs> and you would have had that exact same. But, yeah. Answer, no, Notre, but... Notre Dame is absolutely in it with Dante Moore. And we talked about this before, and it's going to be a little bit of a long game. And I think that the Dante Moore is the domino to fall for what the what wide receiver recruiting looks like. So, right. yeah. That's all. Yep. Hey, hey, Vince, before you leave, and I'm going to address this question. Uh, yeah. What's could up? you, I got bumped out. Uh -oh. So I'm 131 is my last, my first question. Okay. Is there any chance you could just kind yep. of go star some of the ones yep. before you get out of here before that? No question. You got uh, that. And then, uh, and then you can, you can get out of here. But regarding the Dante Moore thing, I guess my frustration is, and I shouldn't get frustrated about this, but I have been lately. There's been a lot of quite comments about Dante Moore that people are like, so-and-so said this, what do you think? And I'm like, mm -hmm. uh, I think <laughs> what I've been telling you for three months is what I think. <laughs> Like Notre Dame is a much better player in this than people think. And Michigan's not the de facto, like, oh, he's probably going to go there. That people, I've been saying this for a long time. We right. even said last week, hey, Michigan State right now is, to yep. me, maybe just as right. big of a threat as Michigan is at this point in time. Mm -hmm. And this is one, Tommy Reese has done a tremendous job so far, uh, in, in my opinion, uh, when it comes to just building that relationship with him. And here's another, uh, and, and thank you for that super chat, but here was another one about Dante. Brent Byer says, is there truth to Dante wanting to make a commitment in the spring to give time to build town around him? Can't imagine the energy that would add to the current momentum that seems to have built in South Bend. Like, yeah, I mean, we even yeah, talked about this about like yeah. Monday mm -hmm. and I've mentioned this plenty of times. Like, yeah, this has always kind of been the plan. So Notre Dame is a much bigger player for Dante more than people think. Are they his leader? I wouldn't go that far. I don't think he has one right now. I think it's that's twice. Why I yeah, that. I don't think it's he has twice. a leader. Yeah. Sure. Uh, and 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 I that's why I think there are still some schools that could get in the mix. Mm -hmm. But I think he's done a really good job. And the thing that encourages me is Marcus Freeman hasn't really turned up the heat yet on Dante Moore. No, he's kind of letting Tommy Reese continue to do his thing. But I fully anticipate Dante, you know, Marcus Freeman, kind of jumping in and and trying to build that connection as well. Mm -hmm. And once that happens, it's kind of like, okay, this could get real interesting then. But yes, Dante, Dante, it's, it, and I remember even talking to him, I mean, a year ago, he said this to me, and we were talking in an interview at, at the Columbus event, which was, you know, the, the interesting thing for me is Dante is torn between two realities. Reality mm -hmm. number one is I want to make sure that I take the time to make the right decision. Sure. And sometimes you can do that quickly. Like for Nolan Ziegler, that took 30 seconds. You know, by the time Notre Dame was done asking the question, you know, letting them know you had a scholarship, it was like, okay, I commit. Right? I mean, like, it, I'm kind of joking, but like that one was easy. Dante's situation is it's going to take a little bit more time. He wants to make the right decision. Dante is not one of those commit now and then maybe flip later. He wants to make one decision. And that's it. He's a very right. smart, mature kid. <laughs> The other reality that's tearing him, uh, pulling him in the other direction is he knows the power that a quarterback has in putting the town around him. He sure. understands that reality as well. And so Dante is a, I'm, I'm, it, it, you could talk to him for five minutes and you're like, this is a different cat. Like, right. this is a smart, really mature kid that gets it. Like, that's one of the things I say about him being a Notre Dame fit. Like, you talk mm -hmm. to Dante Moore. And you're like, oh, yeah, okay, that kid's going to fit in really well at Notre Dame, right? But he understands that dichotomy. And so his timeline is on, I got to make the right decision for me, but I also know that when I know the right decision, it's time to make it and do it because, you know, I don't want to do the visit thing and enjoy my recruitment and all that like a lot of other kids can do because I got to be the leader of this class. 
he understands that, which is why I think we will see a, you know, a, 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 a late winter, early spring decision for him, in my opinion, because mm-hmm. he understands the longer I drag this out, the tougher it's going to be for whatever school I pick to make sure that we have the best guys around around him. But he's got to make the right decision for him. His his priority number one has to be himself making that right decision. Once he does that, then he can worry about everybody else. It's like the yeah. NFL draft. I always tell people, once the season was over with, players should not think about what's best for their team, their teammates, or fans. They need to think about what's best for them and their family and their future. And then if they're torn, they can factor in their team and all those other kind of things. That's the time you're allowed to be selfish is when mm-hmm. you're making that what's my next step decision, you can be selfish. And Dante needs to make a selfish decision first, then he can focus on being a leader. And and again, I mean, I'm saying selfish kind of to use a, a strong term, just to focus on the fact that right now his priority needs to be making the right decision for him. Because if you commit to a school and you then decommit, it could have devastating impact on the school you left and the school you commit to because you do it late in the process. He wants yeah. to make one decision. And he wants it to be the right decision. And it's just one of the many reasons I love that kid. Mm -hmm. I I mean, he is a really smart, savvy kid, but he also gets, he knows, he knows who he's walking in the door knowing all eyes are on me. Mm -hmm. And not that he likes it from a standpoint of like, you know, T.O., you know, I love me some me, but he embraces it because that's what comes with being a quarterback. Sure. And that's the one of the many things I, I mean, it's just, it's not just the release and the accuracy and the, to to me to fall in love with a quarterback for me it's got to be more than just what's on the film for sure and that's what I that's why I would take him over Nico any day of the week and five times on Saturday it's yeah. that part of the equation that makes him such a special player to me and and I had something to add and I know I want to kind of go off of Garland here he says is Dante Moore and Tate a package deal for Notre Dame mm-hmm. not necessarily what the point is is that Dante Moore is going to attract really talented wide receivers with him and he has a re- you know Carnell Tate is well aware of who Dante Moore is, right? Mm -hmm. Jalen Brown is well aware of who Dante Moore is. But I think another thing when we're talking about wide receiver recruiting, I know the question was directly around Carnell Tate. I will say every wide receiver recruit in the 2023 cycle that I have spoken to so far is raving about Chancey Stuckey. Absolutely Mm -hmm. raving about him. I just spoke to Rodney Gallagher, who's a 2023 Pennsylvania kid. We'll have a piece out on Irish Breakdown soon where he spoke so just – he was, he was honestly pouring uh, just about how much he respected Chancey Stuckey, what type of person he was, and you hear that consistently, whether it's coming out of junior day last week with Ronan Hannafin, whether it's talking to Rodney Gallagher briefly, everybody is very pumped up about Coach Stuckey and what he kind of brings to the I'm, tape. I'm going to so. interrupt you, Ryan, because yeah. I'm going to share this with you. This is from a story that has not been published. Y'all are going to be the first ones to hear this. This is from a story that Ryan sent me. Mm -hmm. about Rodney Gallagher that we'll get up later this afternoon. And this is his comment. We talk almost every day. Every day. He's a great guy that I'm excited about. Ryan, you got hired officially on the 4th, 14th of of January, correct? Yep. We had a conversation, I think, as a week after you were hired, which is Mm -hmm. a couple weeks ago, two, three weeks ago, where you were like, yeah, Rodney, There's a they got to do a lot of work on Rodney Gallagher. That was a comment you made because it just didn't didn't seem – about it. No, it just didn't have that – and now, just fast forward, just two and a half or so weeks later, and it's like this: the 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 to, the entire tone of this update you sent me yeah. is completely different. Now he's Absolutely. like, "I'm going to visit after basketball." It's it's like it's very mm-hmm. definitive, right? About Notre yes. Dame, whereas before it was like, uh, yeah, you know, and it it's full court press. So I don't know how much Coach Stuckey has kind of you know made this this full court press happen, but mm-hmm. it's not only Coach Stuckey that's just reaching out every day. It's Coach Freeman is involved. It's, Other it's coaches Chad Bowden. It's, they yes. love Rodney Gallagher. I like Rodney Gallagher yeah. too. So if, if you haven't watched yeah. Rodney yet, he oh, plays option quarterback for his team. Yeah. Well, he just plays quarterback for the Wildcat team. And he's a runner. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And he is dynamic. We'll just yeah. leave it at that. He's a dynamic kid. He's special. And he's a, he is a, now he has decided he's not going to, I don't think he's going to, did he say he's not going to play basketball? No, he said he's he's going to play basketball, but he's not going to, mm-hmm. he's not going to deal with basketball recruiting anymore. Correct. Is what Correct. he has said. Because yes. he was being recruited by division. And now, now when I say division, he's not Duke. It's not Kansas. It's not right. Right. But he's being recruited by division one teams for basketball. 
Yeah. That's player. the kind yeah. of athlete he is. I mean, and he's mm-hmm. got the foot quickness you would think of a six foot point guard is going to have. And mm-hmm. when you see it on the football field, it, it is impressive. It's, it's impressive. There's mm-hmm. three guys to me that, that, they kind of view as like on a different level than everybody else. Now there's a lot of guys they like, I mean, they like Braylon mm-hmm. James. There's a lot of guys they like, but Cardinal Tate, Jalen Brown and Rodney Gallagher are the three that are just sort of a, uh, uh, like here's the board of guys we want, but there's always sort of like a, we love that guy, but like Notre Dame and like, so Marcus Freeman liked Sebastian cheeks. He did. He liked Sebastian cheeks, but it was like, but I like, I like Jalen seed and Josh Burnham better. And if it's we can get those tier. guys, clear right. tier. So yeah. even though they're all top group guys, there's there's, yep. you know, it's like the NFL draft. To you, you know, I love getting Ryan fired up about the NFL draft. It's <laughs> there's a guy you love that you would you would take him in the top five, sure. but if you're picking fifteenth, you know, you, yeah, you take him. But there may be a guy you love at fifteen, but if you all of a sudden are picking five, you know, yeah, this isn't Avante, no matter what situation, right? Like you're not right. taking that guy there. Uh, and that doesn't mean he's not a really good player in a first round draft mm-hmm. pick. It's just this guy's here and you know, that other guy's really good and help us too, but he's not quite so-and-so sure. that's the trio at receiver. And so I know Jalen Brown and, and Cardinal Tate get a lot of the attention rightfully so, cause they're elite, mm-hmm. but Notre Dame views Rodney Gallagher as elite as well. And yes. it's hard to argue with them because and- and, and it's awesome because, I mean, some recruiting platforms list him as an athlete, some rec- uh, some list him as a wide receiver. And it's, you know, it's tough sometimes to project because, again, he's playing quarterback. I think he had one catch last season. I don't even know what it was. It was probably some trick play or something. He had like 22 yards on a catch. But you're kind of projecting those traits to playing wide receiver. But I will tell you, in the in the in to kind of compare those prospects real quick, Carnell Tate from IMG is a guy where – length right he's a tall guy he can kind of do things outside the numbers still has good speed but like that's kind of more his profile Jalen Brown and Roddy Gallagher are those dudes where you just kind of hold your breath when they have the football in their hands because they are mm-hmm. dynamic type of receivers so Roddy Gallagher guy time. Ryan that we've talked about the last couple of years that Notre Dame just for whatever reason is not recruited I mean everybody knows yeah. how much I love Xavier Bradshaw and I love Xavier Bradshaw Rodney Gallagher's the same kind of player but bigger and more dynamic than sure. Xavier Bradshaw was. He's, to me, a legitimate top 100 football player. I mean, legitimate mm-hmm. top 100 football player. Yep. And, you know, he is – now, again, is there's still a lot of work to do. Based oh, on sure. what I've read in the update, Ryan, You and this is what I – my read, mm-hmm. you, you clear it up for me. Sure. It sounds like what Chancey Stuckey has done is put mm-hmm. Notre Dame in the game where when you were first hired, Notre Dame wasn't even really in the game. They were like an outsider looking in. Now it sounds like – there's other schools that they're going to have to battle, but at least they're in the game now, correct? Yep. I want to make sure we're clear, not making like, oh, Chancey Stuckey's here and Ryan Gallagher's coming to Notre Dame. No, that's not what we're saying. Sure. To, not saying but be, they're in the game now. To be completely transparent, when I initially talked to Rodney the first time, when Brian was kind of talking about a couple weeks ago, I did not even write an update yet. I updated just kind of our sheet behind the scenes because – there wasn't really a story to tell, right? Like he just, he, like he he spoke n- nice about Notre Dame, but he just kind of said like, you know, I, I, you know, I have other schools I'm talking to and he didn't really like give you an insight to what he really felt about Notre Dame. And this time it's just, it was almost like a complete 180 at this point. It was like, yeah, I really like coach Stucky a lot. He's talking to me every day. The coaches are doing a great job. I look forward to, to, to visiting there after basketball season. And it was just, it was nice to see just the change in such a short amount of time. And I think that it's just, it kind of really speaks volumes to Coach Stuckey again because it's not just one player really likes him and then, you know, maybe he's striking out a bunch of with some other recruits. Every recruit that I've talked to, literally, not a single one has said anything but that they love Coach Stuckey. He is an mm-hmm. awesome guy. I love the person he is. He makes me feel like I'm a, like I'm important. And I, I think that we should just – I think we should be <clears throat> optimistic about the wide receiver group because I know it's a big cycle for wide receivers, of course, 2023. I know people are nervous about it, especially on the board. But I think that things are now starting to trend in the right direction now that we have Coach Stuckey aboard and he seems to really have kind of – he's he, I think he's really honed in on who the guys are that he would like to, to come to Notre Dame. Mm-hmm. Now, now we find out if he can close, right? Sure. But he's putting Notre Dame in the game. And that's mm-hmm. the thing I think is is encouraging to hear. And yep. because offense right now is obviously way behind the defense when it comes to guys, guys on the board. So, uh, yep. you know, it, it, it's it's going to get interesting. We'll just leave it at that. And then Philly Fan 21 says that Malik Zaire said that he believes Notre Dame and Michigan State 
were ahead of Michigan for Dante Moore even before the Harbaugh stuff. Do you agree? Yeah. And that's what we were saying earlier. It's like that's kind of what we felt. And and I know that Malik has kind of gotten to know Dante Moore a little bit in, in, mm-hmm. in recent weeks. And like he confirmed to us what I've been trying to tell people for a while, which is Michigan is not the this de facto, like that's the team yeah. everybody has to beat. I I felt that there were three teams that were flat in the just right in that top group and Ohio State kind of an outside looking in. And sure. that is Michigan, Michigan State, Notre Dame. And I've always felt that Notre Dame was in a much better position than a lot of people think. And I think people see Detroit and they see public school and they think, oh, well, he's not come to Notre Dame. And, and I'm just saying Dante's d- a different cat. He he may not come to Notre Dame. We're not, but I think Notre Dame's in a much better position than 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 people realize with, I with agree. him. Yep. He, he, now earlier, um Charlie Bell, Charlie Weiss's last belt loop had left a super chat about recruiting, and we're kind of in that part of the show. We're still gonna do some team stuff, but get in recruiting stuff too. Says so, uh, so this is actually me typing in what he put on the he asked a question in a, oh, in, a gotcha. in a message. Uh, he sent me a, a private message on on the website, the premium message board that he wanted to see if you know I could ask and kind of put off publicly. And he said, Brian, I wanted to ask a question about commitment. How does it work exactly? Are there kids that want to commit and that Notre Dame says no, hold off until the five star says no? I hope that makes sense. Uh, why I'm asking, uh, because didn't Jackson Arden want to commit and still visit schools and Notre Dame said no, just trying to understand how it works. The, the first thing for you is, Alex, is that it's different for ki- different players. Yeah. So, like, if if Peyton Bowen would have said, hey, I want to commit but take visits, you probably say, yeah, okay, that's fine. It's okay. Mm-hmm. Keon Keeley, same deal. With Jackson Arnold, I don't, I, I don't think Jackson Arnold is their top quarterback. So, I don't, I don't think you necessarily in a position. Like, why take a kid's commitment knowing he's going to visit other schools right. when he's not your top quarterback? I just, you know, so quarterback's a little bit different Mm -hmm. than other positions. So it comes down to the specific value of that player. It comes Mm -hmm. down to is that kid in a a position group where the numbers are going to be smaller. So if you're going to take three safeties, one of them wants to commit now and, you know, take visits and he's an elite player. Okay, fine. A quarterback's a little different because you're probably going to take one. Sure. Right. And, And so that's that's kind of what made that a little bit different but you know it, the staff is usually pretty good about letting a kid know where they stand or mm-hmm. there's some things you just you don't push for like you don't right. like there's the there's a there's people use the word slow play uh, that's not what i'm referring to here slow play is for a kid that's just not a just a lot would have to go for that kid to be a guy you would take what i'm saying is within your pecking order of top players this is the guy you want. And he's the one you want to wait for, right? So what you do with the other players on the board is you recruit them like crazy, but you never talk about timeline. You never talk about committing. You never talk about making a decision. You do things to say, you know, before he wants to talk about wanting to commit, you say things like, you know, hey, look, you know, I just have always felt like it's best for kids to go, go see the schools that you like. Because if you do ever end up making that decision and you don't even say commit to us. You just say, whenever you do make your decision, you want to make sure that you've got all the data and all the facts. So just, you know, there's no need to rush. So it's almost like you're looking out for the kid, but mm-hmm. in reality, you're kind of looking out for yourself. For you're sure. not telling him anything untrue because you do want him to take visits before he makes his decision. And I do think that is usually best for kids, mm-hmm. but that's the way to do it as opposed to, you know, the, the slow play, the traditional slow play that people refer to. And if a kid does want to commit and you're not ready to take it, you be, you're honest with them. And listen, here's where we're at. You know, like right now, you know, we'll, here's where we are. But it's easy when a kid like Jackson Arnold wants to commit and take visits. Mm-hmm. And you say, well, just don't commit, right? Just take visits first. Because that, that hurts you both ways, right? Because mm-hmm. not only are you taking the quarterback that is not top of your board, but if he's taking visits, obviously there is still interest outside. Right. So you could be not only be out of him eventually, but then also that hurts your quarterback recruiting because yeah. you already took your quarterback. Yeah. It's, like, it's, let's say like they would have taken forward. Jackson Arnold, right? Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's no guarantee he's not going to flip to Oklahoma. Right. Right. At some point. So then you lose him and Dante and Chris Vizina and mm-hmm. whoever else on the board. So look, we talked about a couple weeks ago. I'm all in on Dante Moore. And, and I, and, and to the point we talked about before, he's going to commit soon enough to where you can go, 
you can go flip a kid, maybe Jackson Arnold down the road. Mm-hmm. You know, and this is such a deep quarterback clash. You can go flip. You can still get a good quarterback if you miss on Dante. And mm-hmm. I would contend that the guys that you can maybe flip are closer to Jackson Arnold and, and Chris Vazine, in my opinion, than those two guys are to Dante Moore. That that's just my two cents. That's my opinion. I think Dante is a, is a legit top ten player. Those guys are more 75 to 100. Good football players. But as we talked about before, there's a Mac Jones, and then there's Trevor Lawrence and Joe Burrow and Josh Allen, right? Mac Jones is a good football player, and if you put the right players around him, you can win. He's a great point guard, Mm -hmm. right? He's a John Stockton point guard quarterback. Joe Burrow's Magic Johnson, right? All right, Josh Allen's magic, right? They're they're MJ, right? That that's the thing you have to understand is, at some point in time, Notre Dame needs to try to go all in for that elite game changer, and Dante is that guy. He's local. He's somewhat local. He's a Notre Dame fit. I mean, mm-hmm. just everything about him screams. If you can't get that kid, then I don't know if it's going to happen for you. And right. so I'm going all, and that requires some risk. But if you're not willing to risk it, then you're just not going to get that guy. I mean, that's just that's just the reality of it, in my opinion. So, mm-hmm. John A1, and I'll let you touch this one first, Ryan, if you would like to. John A1 says, what are the differences between uh, Jalen Sneed and Nolan Ziegler in the rower position? Is it possible for both to be ready to play in 2022? And how can Jack Kaiser hold them off? Yeah. Um, so athletically speaking, I would say Ziegler's a little bit longer, right? Um, a little bit taller, at least. I don't know about exactly about the arm length. Sneed is a much more explo- – well, not much more. He's a more explosive player in short areas. He kind of can re- react a little bit quicker. I think Nolan's got pretty nice ball skills. He's just a smooth mover overall. Mm-hmm. Um, Snead is more just that explosive playmaking type, right? So like uh, him coming and running the alley is just going to look a little bit different than Nolan Ziegler. Ziegler is going to get there maybe, you know, at the line of scrimmage on a screen when Snead's going to blow it up two or three yards mm-hmm. behind the line of scrimmage. Like he's that type of dude. So um, I also think that Snead, I, I think that the coverage versatility of a Snead might be a little higher just because I think that he could probably do a little more in man-to-man coverage. I think Ziegler can do that as well because he has the length and he's a a solid, good all-around – well, I don't want to say solid because solid's underselling it. He's a good all-around athlete who is smooth, while Snead, I think, is a little more quick twitch, and I think that he could just potentially do a little more in man. But I think they both have coverage upside. Will they be ready to play in 2022? Uh, I mean, yes, they can be ready to play. I don't, I just don't know. Like, I think Jalen Sneed has to play, right? Mm-hmm. Nolan Ziegler for me is more a guy that I, I would like him to just kind of get acclimated a little yeah. slowly, continue to grow into his body, that type of thing. So, but I think Jalen Sneed is just such a good athlete that he has to play in some capacity. One thing that Coach Freeman told me yesterday <clears throat> yep. that, that, that's, that I found interesting is they have like in the strength conditioning program, they have like these, um, these, uh, sprint groups like right so mm-hmm. like you run with certain groups and they try to put guys of similar skill there so sure. you have linemen running with linemen and you know mm-hmm. and nolan ziggler does not run with the linebackers all the linebackers in one group he's with the running backs and receivers because wow. his times have been so good so far his i was told that his his 10 yard split is mm-hmm. in the low one fives that's good that's really yeah. good yeah. yeah i think the thing that that and that and it, it surprised them. I mean, just I mean, it's like to your point is Notre Dame thought a lot about Nolan Ziegler, what you just did, and what I thought, which is mm-hmm. long, rangy, you mm-hmm. know, good athlete, maybe not sure. an elite athlete, but a really good all around athlete, natural football player, all those things, instinctive. Yeah. The thing that has surprised people at Notre Dame, and when Coach told me this, he was saying it, and this is for this is going to be in the article. This is not. I'm mm-hmm. not betraying something that he said. This is something he said as a quote in the article that's going to come out, which is because I was mm-hmm. asking him about Nolan Ziegler, and he's like, he he. he you got to remember, he's known about Nolan for years. He recruited mm-hmm. Nolan and offered Nolan when he was in Cincinnati. They found out pretty early that if Notre Dame offers, it's a done deal. Like they, he knew that when he was in Cincinnati, right? Because the legacy aspect. But and he talked about how Nolan was instrumental in putting this class together and keeping this class together. But he Mm -hmm. was like, you know, he kind of did all those. He said all those things you say about a kid that you then followed up with. You know, he's a try hard guy. Right. Maybe not. (laughs) But then he followed up. He's like, and it was like he was like talking like he was surprised 
he's he's talking about like just how I mean, just out like from what I'm told, like so far this spring that or this winter, the the two most explosive guys in drills have mm-hmm. been Nolan and Prince Collie, a wow. linebacker, not Jalen. Now, Jalen is going through an acclimation process that I think is a little bit more challenging for him than Nolan. Okay. Now, Nolan's coming from a Catholic school two hours away. Prince has been on campus. I think Jalen is still kind of going through the mental block of making the transition from Hilton Head to South Carolina to South Carolina to Notre Dame. Sure. That is that will impact how you perform athletically. I'm just telling yeah. people that happens all the time. So I expect Jalen to get back up there and he mm-hmm. has shown some things that they're excited about, but they were very surprised. Even even though they liked Nolan a lot, they were surprised like he has been far more explosive than they thought because their evaluation of him, Ryan, before he showed up was the same as yours. Okay. And, and mine. So I'm just I'm adding that in there as a because you and I, if you read my eval of him, my eval sounds a lot like yours. I mean, you know, not explosive, but athletic and rangy and yeah, you know, fluid and instinctive and natural cover player. But you know, can he really line up and, and run with a slot receiver? You know, can he run with a tight end like a Tommy Tremble or an Evan Ingram? You, you know, but that's that's why I added that little nugget in there because that's not if you would have if you would have said which linebacker is going to shock is going to be running with the running backs and the receivers mm-hmm. during, I during Jalen Sneed. not have said Jalen Sneed, <laughs> right. maybe Josh Burnham, right? Maybe sure. Josh is a little faster than I thought, but that is something. That, and I've heard Josh is at workout wise has just been blowing people away. Now he still nice. has to learn how to play football, but yeah. just the length and the explosiveness is, I mean, so far the linebacking core has been everything that they hoped it would be in workouts. They're, couldn't be more fired up about what that group has done since they got on campus. And and for a little bit of context, I know Brian kind of put it out there that he said it was in the one fives, 10 yard split for mm-hmm. Nolan Ziegler. So just to kind of put that into um, just kind of put that into context for a second. If you go watch the NFL combine this year, you're going to watch the wide receivers who are the fastest guys for the most part um, testing wise you're going to see the fastest wide receivers there run about one four or something. Like they're going to be in the one four. So one five is flying. Like one mm-hmm. fives is very fast, mm-hmm. especially for a linebacker, especially for a linebacker. So just some context yeah. there. Yeah. He, uh, he, that's, that's moving. That's why when I was like low foot one fives, I was like, wow, that's, yeah, it's fast, man. Like that's, that's yeah, that's, which is why they moved him up with the, uh, the other guys. Got a mm-hmm. super chat from John Paris. John, thank you very much. He says, amazing show, guys. Thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate, appreciate your support. It, John. Absolutely appreciate your support. And then uh, let's see here. Uh, we we asked that we answered that question. Okay, here we go. Timeout Tom asks, judging from a recent photo of Brendan Vernon, do you think he's lifting himself from an edge to an interior defender? I think you're giving yourself options a little bit. Like I still think athletically speaking, he, I I mean, there's no reason that he's not going to start as a strong side defensive end, but man, I want to know what his weight is. I've heard some things that it's, you know, pretty substantial, but I mean, so to put in the context, if you're working forward here and let's say that Brendan Vernon does his body does allow him to eventually transition inside. Can you just imagine a defensive line now where we have potentially have, or Notre Dame potentially has Keon Keeley, Aiden Gabira and has guys like Brandon Vernon inside. Maybe a Jason Moore ends up coming to town. Like at that point, the dynamic ability of this defensive line is just something, something crazy to think about. So to answer your question though, it's possible. We'll see kind of how it develops. Like there's nothing like there's nothing set in stone as far as where Brandon Vernon's biggest impact is going to be for Notre Dame. But certainly by that picture, he definitely looks like he's getting to the point where inside out at worst type of football player. And maybe he's an inside guy full time at some point during his career. I think it's possible. I think the thing that, that we need to remember too is guys, it's not about what he weighs. It's about how he moves. Sure. I mean, he could weigh 250 and and not move enough to be on the edge. He mm-hmm. could weigh 280 and per, be move just fine for the edge. I think that's the thing too, is whenever a kid has a big weight gain, you want to know what my first question is. And what have we said about uh, Emil Wagner? Mm-hmm. Emil Wagner can get to 300 pounds. Anyone can get to 300 pounds, right? I mean, Tyler Buckner could get to 300 pounds if he wanted. If he wanted to eat enough Twinkies and late night pizzas, he could, you know, not work out at all and he could still get to 300 pounds, right? It's can you move when you get that weight on, right? Mm-hmm. My question about Emil Wagner is when he's not a natural 300 pound guy, if he gets up to 290 plus, can he still move like he moves now? Because if he can't move like he moves now, then you're losing what makes him a such a talented player. 
That's yeah. the question. And that'll be the question about Brendan Vernon. It's not, oh, he's 290. And I don't know if he's 290. I'm just using an example. I think he could get to 290 at some point in time in his career. For and sure. it won't matter. Like his position won't be affected by his size. It'll be by move. Perfect example is Riley Mills. People are like, mm-hmm. no, no, you can't move Riley Mills out to the strong side end. He's already 280 and he's probably going to gain five more pounds. So <laughs> that, that doesn't determine where you play. What matters is can he move and do the things athletically at the big end position that you want him to. And that's what Riley brings to the table. Guys like that are they're not – you don't see him a ton. I mean, the Zach uh-huh. Allens, which we talked about earlier. You know, J.J. Watt is kind of that Cam, unique player. Cam there Jordan. are some guys like that. Yeah. Right, Cam Jordan. Yeah. Yeah. There are guys like that. and They mm-hmm. don't come along often. But it's it's about how you move, not what you weigh. And you got to mm-hmm. make sure you're putting on natural weight. And mm-hmm. what will happen is, is if he shows up too big, They'll just do what they do with every other kid that puts on high school, bad high school weight. Because kids think, hey, I'm getting big for football. And it's it's like, no, that's what <laughs> that 30 pounds of that's going to be gone by the time we get spring ball, just so you know. Right. And what they'll probably do is if they get him on campus and Coach Bayless thinks he's putting some bad weight on, they'll let him know, hey, look, we need you to, you know. So, I mean, Notre Dame has seen him recently. They will see him plenty. If he's putting bad weight on, they'll let him know and he'll mm-hmm. work it off. So I'm not, I'm not as, I'm just not as concerned about that. To be honest. Brian, quick, quick, quick compliment for you uh, the, for the, um, on the message board for the final rankings that you posted for the offense. I thought the Emil Wagner, Nicholas Petit Friere comp was fantastic, by the way. I yeah. just want to throw it out there. Yeah, similar, you know, similar things, right? Similar everybody projections. said Tyron Smith. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't think that he really compares because Tyron always had like a really good frame. Sure. You know, yeah. I mean, he he had a projectable frame. I think that Nicholas Pettifrero, I was always the only concern I ever had about him is he was a little bit narrow. Yeah. You know, could he add the weight? And I think that's an issue. Like he he's a guy that gets a lot of first round draft love. My concern with him is I don't think he plays as athletic now with all the weight because he's over 300 pounds now, right? Yes. I if I was if 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 I was coaching him, I'd say we're gonna take about 12 pounds off of you. Right, mm-hmm. because you're not moving like I need you to move, and that's the one problem that I have with Ohio State's offensive line. Period, is they put a lot of bad weight on these kids, and I don't think they move as well as they should. And that's something that Harry Heisen is. I'd rather you be 295 and f- strong and quick right. than 315 and lumbering. Now, obviously, I'd rather have a guy that's 315 and athletic and strong, <laughs> right? But you know, or or 340 like Quentin Nelson, but. That's the mentality because I don't think he moves as well as he should because I think he's got too much weight on. And that's another reason why I say, like, look, you can put the weight on, but are you going to be able to move as well right. as people think? That's that's a much bigger question Because why? Because why do people like Emil Wagner so much, right, the projection? It's because he's such a good athlete. At some mm-hmm. point, your frame can only take a certain amount to start sacrificing that athleticism. Right. So, and that quickness yeah. and that cha- you know, your hit your feet get slower, your hips mm-hmm. get tighter. All those things are are part of it, and you just you don't want to you don't want to lose that. There, there's no doubt about it. All right, um, what did you think of some of the other comps on there? Were there any other that you that you liked? You know, I love hearing people say nice things about the work that I do. <laughs> <laughs> the one that I was curious more. about is Jadarian yeah. Price. Jadarian, oh, I'm, um, I'm shocked that nobody has brought up that I compared Ronald, him to Ronald Jones, Jones, right? Ronald yeah. Jones, yeah, I remember that one. Uh, I, I like explosiveness, explosiveness. Yeah. I like that one. And, you and know, not a big frame either. That's the other thing yeah. about it too. So just so people understand, because I put something in here that somebody had said something like, you know, I hope Ashton Craig is half the player that Zach Martin is, because that's the comp that I use for Ashton Craig. And it's like, it's that's not what a comp is. My comps no. are not towards. I think he's going to eventually also be the number 16 NFL draft pick. No, it's <laughs> he's got a very similar athletic profile, style mm-hmm. of play, and body type to this player yeah. that you would recognize, right? It's not a prediction of saying he's going to go on to be that guy. So, like, if I compare Riley Mills to J.J. Watt, I'm mm-hmm. not saying Riley Mills is going to be the 11th or 12th overall pick and he's going to go out and set sack records and be a Hall of Famer. It's body type. Skill set, those type of things are very similar to a, a, a player like a JJ Watt. So I want people to understand that. But like body type and that burst, because mm-hmm. Ronald Jones was not a big guy. He was kind of skinny. Small. Yeah. But and, and Jadarian's not a big guy, but he is tough. I would say he's more physical than Ronald was in high school. But mm-hmm. that burst is really impressive. Jadarian is a lot yeah. more explosive than people because they see the recruiting ranking. That's what they sure. see. 
they don't see a kid that played Texas football and just was like a home run every time he touched the ball. I mean, that kid, that kid's explosive, very yeah, Ro- explosive. Ronald Jones is one foot in the ground and get vertical and he is out type of player. Yep. So, and that's yeah. Jadarian. Yeah. Which and then inside in a zone offense, which is what Notre Dame is, that's exactly what you want. You don't For want sure. a guy that's dancing a whole lot. Now you needed it in 2021. Mm-hmm. You needed all the dancing you can get in 2021. <laughs> Patience but, and dancing, yeah. Right. But <laughs> ideally, <laughs> ideally, you want a guy that's willing to hit that thing and, and, and get vertical. And and Loken Diggs will do that once he mm-hmm. gets more work behind a line that actually blocks people. Yeah. You'll see him start to hit it more because that's how he was in high school. Logan was mm-hmm. a you know, he could he was shifty, but he was a hit that hole and, and run with some authority. I think yeah. he kind of de- him and Kyron both developed some bad habits out of need and necessity mm-hmm. more than anything else. I, I'll um, tell you two comps that I did like that I just remembered. One, I like the Eli Raritan to Kyle Rudolph. That one yep. makes a lot of sense from a frame perspective yep. and just kind of a usage. He's not, I wouldn't call him like the most flexible guy of all time, but Neither like above yeah. the rim kind yeah. of a vertical seam that dude that has that big catch radius. Like it makes a lot of sense. And the other one I really thought was interesting was the Joey Tonona to um, Josh Myers. I mm-hmm. like that one a lot. Cause I yep. do think just watching Tonona's film a little bit, I would not be surprised. I think, I mean, obviously I think he could play inside a guard for sure, but like if he's a center down the road, mm-hmm. I would not be shocked at all. Yeah. I actually like him a little bit more at center than Ashton Craig, even though Craig's the guy they're projecting to be a center. I right. actually like Joey Tonona there a little bit more. Because he's got a little mm-hmm. bit more beef to him than Ashton Craig does. For sure. And I think with Ashton, he's so athletic that I want to get him working up on the second level as a guard. I want to get him pulling and things like that. He's so athletic. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is an athletic group of linemen. I mean, yeah. when when you when you would say Ty Chan is your – to me, I would say is the number five athlete in this group. That's I would good. put Billy Shrouth third from an athleticism standpoint, just pure athleticism yeah. standpoint. That's mm-hmm. impressive because Billy Shrouth is your most athletic player you know, a, a interior player of the last two classes before this one. I mean, mm-hmm. that's an that, that, that's an area where they really upgraded offensive line wise. Now, there's some questions about can these guys add the beef, Ashton Craig. I have similar questions about Ashton Craig that I have about Emil Wagner. Now, I think Ashton has a little better frame than you know. To me, Ashton Craig is more Joey Joe Alt than he is Emil Wagner. Meaning, I always knew Joe would get the way. It was just how quickly was the way going to come on. You know, that was the right. that was a concern there. But it's an it's an athletic group of guys. And the 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 first comp I came up with was was the Tobias Merriweather T Higgins one. And that was the first time I ever saw him play. I was like, oh my gosh, this kid reminds me of T Higgins. And I'm yeah. talking about when I saw T Higgins in high school. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean that 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 was a, a very similar. The defensive ones were a little bit harder to come up with, to be completely honest with you. Yeah, I'm trying to remember a couple of them. Yeah, I remember I had, the I offense had, pretty good. But. I had Tyson. So I'll just go through. I, J, I mean, yeah. Jalen Steed and Jeremiah Wusukormo. I tried to find another mm-hmm. one just because I was like, I, that seemed lazy, but it's yeah. like undersized, explosive. Maybe mm-hmm. not like, like I was told Jalen runs a low four five, which is pretty mm-hmm. fast. That is fast. So he, yeah. he's got more speed. Like, J, so here's a little, Ryan, I think I, I don't know if I said this recently on a show, but Ryan, I've told you this before. Yes. Yep. I was told months before the pro day that do not expect Jeremiah Wusukor Mo to run a 40 time. I was like, why is that? He's like, because he won't run a very good one. Like, get out of here. No, like, no, seriously. His testing times and everything will be off the charts. He just does not run good 40 times. He's consistently been a four seven guy his entire Notre Dame career. So he had a hamstring last year at the pro day that kept him from doing that. But he could he could jump, he could change direction, he could do all that stuff. If you got a hamstring injury, you're not doing broad jump and vertical jump, right? I mean, absolutely not. Especially right? not broad. You're not, especially not exactly, not broad. exactly. Yeah. You know, if, if you, it's because he was going to run a he wasn't going to run a good time, but he played fast. Jalen mm-hmm. Jalen plays fast, but Jalen also has a better forty time from what I'm told. Gotcha. Is Jeremiah Usukor Moa my Josh my Josh Burnham? This is the one I was going to ask you about. Josh Burnham, mm-hmm. six four, long, mm-hmm. athletic linebacker. Mm-hmm. Lan, uh, Leighton Vander Esch. I went back and watched Makes his sense. Boise State film, yeah. and I saw a lot because he could also, you know, line up on the edge and rush the quarterback if you need to. Makes sense. Talk, talk mm-hmm. about Tyson Ford and Zach Allen, Benjamin mm-hmm. Morrison. Oh, I saw that one. That one was wait, don't tell me. Uh, it was an Alabama corner, Marlon mm-hmm. Marlon Humphrey. Marlon yep. Humphrey. I saw that one. Yep. Yep. Makes Physi- sense. Physical corner, long and fast. Mm-hmm. Uh, Aiden Gobira, this is one that I that I I thought people were gonna Montez Sweat, six six yeah. can play like a three four outside backer, but just that burst off, very similar mm-hmm. body type, very mm-hmm. similar body type. But the thing I loved about Montez Sweat is he was an athletic guy. His first step was just, it was crazy. I mean, oh, 
And no, he was I so just, he was so long that people didn't really I, I feel like some people didn't appreciate how fast he got out of the blocks because yeah, he was just a little yeah. long, you know. <laughs> now I do not anticipate Aiden Gobira running a four three, right? Because didn't sweat run like a four three? It, it was like, four, like it, that. it was like four four something, but yeah, it was it was, insane. It, was it, it didn't make any it sense. Insane. It was just, yeah. I'm not saying he's gonna do that, but that length and that first step explo- first step explosiveness, uh mm-hmm. I, I like Nolan Ziegler and Pete Werner. Makes sense. Makes sense because Pete yeah. played a lot of safety in high school too. He was right? a pure so, safety yeah. in high school. Yeah. yeah, he was a he was an alley safety in high school. Yeah, man, I love. I really liked Pete Warner when he was yep. coming out of high school. Man, really yep. did. I, I liked him in the draft too, and he had a nice yep. year for the Saints. By the way, he was the highest graded um, linebacker according to PFF. So he mm-hmm. had a nice season. Mm-hmm. And and I've heard their pro grades are a little bit better than their college grades, which are utterly it's a useless. lot better. <laughs> it's a, so much better. It's crazy how much better okay. it is. <laughs> I think like they put all their B team guys, like that's the minor <laughs> league guys, go down and, and grade college games. Jaden yeah. Mickey and Julian Love is my comp there. Although I think Jaden Mickey's probably a little bit faster than Julian was coming out of high school, but similar body types, really okay. instinctive, like inside I, out type of thing mm-hmm. too. Like yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. Uh, Junior to Alamaka Manti. I just I, I couldn't think Makes of anybody sense. else. Ray I mean, Maluga just, maybe yeah yeah Something like that yeah. right yeah. But I just didn't want to I didn't want to compare him to him because that guy's a nut job. I didn't, want, I didn't want people to think that about him. Uh, Jaden Bellamy, a guy that mm-hmm. he re- just kept, always reminded me of is Nick Coleman, former Notre okay. Dame player. Yeah, you know, like okay. good athlete. I'd say Jaden's mm-hmm. probably a little faster than Nick was, but similar body type. A little you know, bit remember Nick played corner and safety, yeah. and he, you know, yeah. he, and I thought that was the comp there. And then, I mean, Donovan Heinish, seriously, I mean, it's Kurt. <laughs> I mean, it's like <laughs> it's an easy one. I mean. Yeah. Uh, you're not kidding that it doesn't get any easier than that uh you know that comp just real quick so people know my offensive comps were steve angeli is jack Cohn, uh you know decent okay. decent athlete at high school level athleticism doesn't project quite as well at college you know decent arm i say jack is more accurate and, and steve has mm-hmm. a little bit better just arm strength but Makes similar sense. player t H- tobias merriweather and t higgins yep. billy shrouth ben bredesen from michigan I liked Brad say, man. He was a good yeah. player. Yeah, he was yeah. a good player. That was the one. Sim- again, similar body type, like 6'4-ish, you know, not super, good super athlete. long, real yeah. powerful. Uh, uh, Ronald Jones and Jadarian Jad- Price and Ronald Jones, Eli Raritan and Kyle Rudolph. And that's another guy that, you know, people said, well, look, when, when Emil stops playing basketball, he's going to gain weight. Maybe, right? Like, I know how that works. That's what I felt about Kyle ha- Rudolph, and that's how I feel about Eli Raritan. Eli Raritan is going to be a big kid. Yeah, he's going to sure. be 250 plus when he stops playing basketball. But you look at him, he's got broad shoulders, like mm-hmm. big hands, big feet. He, Emil Wagner, he stands next to defensive linemen and he looks smaller than they are. I mean, when frame at, wise. Well, I forget what all star game he was at, but I remember I sent you that the picture, army one like, or the old looks like army a, one. I was like, he looks like a defensive yeah. end there. He doesn't look like an offensive tackle. Yeah, so. he, he does. I mean, he, I just don't know if he's got that frame to get there. We'll see. I hope yeah. he does because if, if he. He pans out and he could put the weight on. He's he's got talent. He's, he's gifted, yeah. Yeah. Joey Tonona and Josh Myers from Ohio State. Holden Stace mm-hmm. and Austin Hooper from Stanford. I don't know how I feel about that one. I need I need to think yeah. on that one a little bit. I'm not yep. sure about that one for me. Real smooth athlete, you know, similar it. body yeah. type, you mm-hmm. know. Yeah. I don't love Austin Hooper as a player. I think yeah. the skill set. I don't I just I uh, I'll leave it at that, but I think the skill set and the body type is similar. <laughs> Emil Wagner, and you talk about Nicholas Pettit. How do you say that? Is it Pettit Frere? Petit Frere. Petit Frere. Ashton Craig and Zach Martin. Mm-hmm. Ty Chan and Michael Dieter from Wisconsin. Oh, I like Dieter, man. I like yeah. him. He's playing center now in the NFL. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think I think eventually Ty Chan's more of an interior guy from what yeah. I've seen. Well, uh, Dieter, Dieter played all five spots, I think, at Wisconsin. Yeah. He was so a he left was tackle really... in his last year at Wisconsin. But yeah. he's moving. And when I talk about Ty Chan, when I talk about moving inside, I'm talking about if he pans out and he becomes an NFL player, I think he kicks inside. I think he can sure. play tackle in college, but I think he would have to kick inside at the next level. So mm-hmm. for people that kind of were are curious about that kind of thing, those are those were my comps. And I don't love doing comps, but I had a lot of people ask about it. So I was like, what the heck? Let's have some fun with it. And people love that comps, was harder man. to do people than the them. evaluations. Like yeah. I can easily break down film and tell you what a kid can do. But then you're like, who does he remind you of? And I have a buddy, Tony, that's all, he's like, who does this kid remind you of? And I'm like, I don't know. He reminds me of himself. Like what, you know, cause, cause what, the, what frustrates is I'll, I'll make a comp and he's like, you think you can be as good as him? I'm like, like, that's not what you asked me. You asked me who he reminds me of. Okay. <laughs> you didn't ask me who is going to have a direct same career type. And that's what kind of can, can be a little bit, uh, 
challenging with those is because some people think when you say Riley Mills is like J.J. Watt that you're predicting Riley Mills is going to be a Hall of Famer. It's like, it's no. gonna, yeah, it's first ballot Hall of Famer, Riley Mills. Yeah, that's <laughs> not what I'm saying. Here we go. Here's a super chat from Triple Deck Poe. Appreciate that very much. He says, Brian, and and Ryan, you can comment on this too because I know you've watched – reason mm-hmm. I'm bringing this up for you is because I know you've watched a lot of Baylor film the last couple of years – yeah. Of Tyquan Thornton, I believe, and RJ yep. Sneed, as you uh, you know, before before I stole you from the draft and brought you into the recruiting <laughs> world, yeah, I know you had seen that. So I'll allow you sure. to uh, uh, to start off with this answer. But Brian, when studying Stucky and his work at Baylor, did you get to see how many receivers he used in their rotation, and what determines how many receivers in a healthy rotation? So I want to answer this question, but I also want to talk about. We had some some people have asked me before about you know how do they play. You know, are they mm-hmm. fundamentally sound, are good route runners, things like that. Do they get off the line well? So I'll, I'll, I want you to first address that because I'm going to have sure. a video about that. So I'll have my opinion down the road. I want you to address that, and then I'll I'll take the 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 next part of of his of his question. Sure. Yeah. So like Brian said, watching Tyquan Thornton over the last couple of years now, because he has been draft eligible for a little bit. So he's a longer guy. Um, So the biggest things that I really liked, and I would say this is Tyquan Thornton in the past, I felt was like vertical guy has some speed, right? Like that's kind of what I think of him. He's like a six, two, six, three guy in the year under coach Stuckey. I thought he was a lot more well-rounded in terms of his ability to run routes. I thought he got, I got, I thought he was much smoother in and out of breaks. I thought that he had a much clearer understanding of how to attack blind spots on in coverage. I thought that he stacked pretty well. And I thought for as a whole, not even Tyquan Thornton, but RJ Sneed, who was also in the transfer portal. And, and I, I forget where he ended up at Colorado, I think. Right. Or something like that. The, all those guys. Yeah. RJ Sneed is from my right. Yeah, yeah RJ C. Mm-hmm. So all of those guys do a surprisingly good job. And I think Brian put out a stat. It was like 50% of the time they're winning contested catch situations. So they attack the football well in the air. They're good hands catchers. They extend away from their frame. So to answer the question directly, I thought from the one season under Coach Stuckey, Thornton and the rest of the receivers were much better than what I had saw in 2020. They seemed a lot more, it seemed like they just had a much more developed understanding of how to play the position, in my opinion. Agree. And now see, I can't, the reason I wanted you to address it is yep. because I've watched the 2021 film, which you got me, by the way. Mm-hmm. Thank you for that. Absolutely. I hadn't watched, I had no frame of reference to 2020. Mm-hmm. I couldn't compare to what they did from an improvement standpoint. I can only compare here's how they played, which is what my video breakdown will be here. And I'm hoping to get to it here in the next week or two. We'll, we'll see. I haven't talked a lot about it because I don't want to promise you guys are going to come. And then 87 million different things come up and I can't get to it. Uh, but you, you and I think the one big thing that Notre Dame fans are going to ask a lot about, they, they do a pretty decent job of getting off the press at the line and down the field. They use their hands really well as route runners, in my opinion. And they're not overly athletic as a group, in my opinion. Like Thornton's the only guy that I look at and was like, that guy has any chance of being an NFL player. Because right. the other kid, they the other one of their other starters was like a transfer from like Dartmouth. It was like a little yeah. like Hunter, you know, Hunter Renfro wannabe kind of kid, mm-hmm. right? Like yep. you know, nice player, but he's not an NFL guy. RJ sure. Sneed, like like when I heard that Stucky was coming and it Sneed was in the portal, I was like, Oh, you know, hey, let me look at RJ Sneed. I'm like, this kid is slow. Mm-hmm. Like, this kid does not run well but he's a productive player because he knows how to play. There's a reason he wins a lot of contested catches. Right. He doesn't create much separation. That's yeah. right. <laughs> but, that, but that's the, the, the reason that matters, Ryan, is because when we look at, mm-hmm. okay, he's going to be working with the Braden Lindsay's and the, the Lorenzo yeah. styles and the, and the Deion Colsey type of athletes that he just didn't Different have. In Taylor. Right. And I mean, Deion Colsey's bigger now than, than Tyquan Thornton is. I mean, he's long he, and skinny. He, he weighed in at like 170 something pounds. Yeah. He's a skinny kid. Yeah. 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 Uh-huh. So, He's going to have way better weapons, but they really use their hands effectively and they battle because mm-hmm. they're not a, they weren't a big group. No. They really compete in the run game. And that's something that I like too, but I would imagine that's as much of a, just a team philosophy as I, I don't, I don't want to focus too much on like, Oh, Chancey Stucky did a great job because that's the one thing I did see them do well in 2020 is they could mm-hmm. run block well, but that's a Dave Aranda mindset thing. Sure. And you know, and it was a shift in offense. It wasn't like they just brought in a new receivers coach. I mean, they brought in, Almost an entirely was an entirely new offensive staff, or almost an entirely new offensive staff. I can't like remember they brought in Grimes as the OC, yeah. and like they made a, a big shift 
because mm-hmm. their offense the first year was whew, really bad. It was awful. Yeah. Yeah. It was really bad. Mm-hmm. And and so I, I I liked that. Now to the specific question that that Triple Deck Poe asked, mm-hmm. the reality is is it's hard to evaluate what he views as the ideal rotation and what he did at Baylor because what he did at Baylor was as much about who he had as what he wants to do. I mean, he would play three receivers a lot. They did a lot of 11 personnel. Yep. And honestly, with all due respect, their number three receiver is not seeing the field at Notre Dame. Estrada, I mean, the transfer that you were yeah, talking about. The kid yeah. from Dartmouth. He is Drew not Estrada. seeing the field. I don't know how much R.J. Sneed plays in Notre Dame because here's the reason I say he wouldn't have played in Notre Dame. He wouldn't have been as well coached at, at Notre Dame as he was at Baylor. Sure. Be, and and he, he doesn't run well. So he doesn't run like the kids at Notre Dame is playing. So I – and that's your number two and your number three. The one kid that I think runs pretty well is, is Tyquan Thornton. Yeah, and, Thor- and Thor- yeah, he's like he's like a four four high type of player. Right. And, and Snead, to your point, I, Snead had to play a lot outside. I think in a perfect situation, he's probably more of a slot type. Yeah. But it's just out of necessity what yeah. Baylor had to use. Where he can so. use his route because you had to put the kid at Dartmouth in the slot. I mean, right? You can't you can't play. He outside. definitely yeah. couldn't play outside. Right? Exactly. Right. Mm-hmm. So they didn't have a deep rotation because mm-hmm. they just didn't have a lot of players. Sure. And, you know, look, Matt Rule did a nice job at Baylor in mm-hmm. regards to building that team up. But it was very clear to me that Matt Rule went to Baylor with the intention of I'm going to build it up so I can use it as a springboard for something else. Because I don't think he recruited with the intensity of a guy that you were anticipating being there for a long period of time. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's just that's my two cents. But. They didn't. I mean, they had. I mean, their their receiving core was a three man crew. I mean, that was mm-hmm. it. I mean, they rarely played other receivers, and it's. But it was about a lack of. I can't tell you if that is a a philosophical thing, mm-hmm. by Chancey Stuckey. And here's an example: looking at Pro Football Focus, Tyquan Thornton had 863 snaps. Mm-hmm. R.J. Snead had 673. Drew Estrada, it's the other kid from uh, Dartmouth, had 447. Mm-hmm. The next guy was Josh Fleeks at 133 snaps. Right. So, so they're, they're a three-man yeah. show. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, but but what I don't know, because I don't want to assume in either – I don't want to assume he only did that because he only had three receivers. Mm-hmm. I'm, I, I mean, to me, I don't think he had anybody else. For all we know, however, that's what he wants to do. I don't, I, so I can't answer that. It, my guess, and I want to make sure you all understand it's a guess is mm-hmm. that he would like, I think all receiver coaches like a deeper rotation. It's also how you keep kids happy and keep everybody from jumping in the transfer portal. If you have town, if you have five talented players, play them. If you have mm-hmm. six talented players, play them. Right. And, but I can't tell you that for sure because they didn't have it. Now, what determines a how, how many receivers are in a healthy rotation? I think five is the minimum for me. Mm-hmm. I think you need, and we're talking five in a, a team that plays a lot of 11 personnel. If you're mm-hmm. playing a lot of 10 personnel, then you need to go to six. And mm-hmm. the way I look at it is you need to have your three starters and you need one guy that can play inside as a rotation and at least one guy that can play outside as a rotation, ideally. Now, if you have guys can you know play multiples, that's even better. But to me, five is the healthy way. I would go to six as part of my not big game rotation. And and to me, and we talked about this earlier before you joined the show, Ryan, mm-hmm. I'm a big believer that you expand your rotation when you're when you're playing everyone not named Ohio State, Clemson, USC, and BYU for the most sure. part, maybe BC. You mm-hmm. know, and, and it's not that you don't take teams seriously. You just know like, look, let's be honest. Mm-hmm. If you know, if you're a Notre Dame coach, you're looking at it from the from the standpoint of if we can't beat Cal and Marshall with Tyson Ford and Aiden Gobira getting some snaps, we have much bigger problems than you know Tyson Ford and Aiden Gobira getting eight to ten snaps a game. Agreed. Same a receiver. So like if my rotation in the first game is is Deion, against Ohio State is like let's just say Deion Colsey and Lorenzo Styles, Xavier, um, excuse me, uh, I'm still still wishing uh, Avery Davis, Braden mm-hmm. Lindsey, and let's say either Joe Wilkins or, or Tobias Merriweather. Let's say Tobias isn't quite ready yet. He just hasn't got the offense down completely yet. And you go with that five-man rotation against Ohio State. I'm expanding that to six to get Tobias in the game for eight to ten snaps the next two weeks against 
uh, against Cal and Marshall. And then how he handles those snaps is going to determine whether he stays in it against North Carolina. You know, but Mm -hmm. then if, you know, but but when I'm going to play Clemson, I may feel like to beat Clemson, I only got four guys that I really trust to beat Clemson. Right. So my issue with Brian Kelly is there, it was whatever you felt was your rotation to beat Clemson is who you played when you played Ball State and, and Bowling Green and, and teams, you know, Navy. You didn't expand that rotation until the game was out of hand and then they were getting mop up minutes. Right. And my point is you expand your rotation a guy or two against a Cal, against a Marshall, against a UNLV, against a Syracuse from the beginning Mm -hmm. to get them some more live fire minutes. That's what I believe. And it doesn't mean that it has to be that because I also believe there's merit to doing that early because then you're taking some of the wear and tear. And because once the once the legs go, it's hard Mm -hmm. to get them back. So when I'm making decisions, expand rotation is also to make sure that. You know, if we're going to be a team that's going to throw a lot more or, or attack downfield more, then I want to make sure that these guys are, we're saving their legs any chance we get. And if you're going to play Tobias eight to ten snaps in a the game, then that means you also need to up his reps and practice a little bit. So that wear and tear isn't just about Saturdays. It's also about okay, you know, Avery knows what he's doing. Avery doesn't need 300 reps in practice to get ready to beat Cal or Marshall. Right. So this week, Avery's going to be the, still the starting slot, but we're going to get Lorenzo some more snaps there. We're going to save your watch some more snaps there. We're going to get so, whoever your slot would be, Jaden, Tom, whoever. We're going to get that guy, you know, maybe 50, 60 more extra reps this week than he normally gets as part of the twos because we know Avery knows what to do. Right. That's how you handle your practice. And that's how you handle your rotation to make sure that you're not only getting ready to win games, but you're making sure you stay fresh in, in November. Right. And I'm a big believer in that. Now, you can't force the issue if a guy's it's not right. If a guy's a liability, you can't play mm-hmm. him, right? But if Tobias Merriweather only knows four routes, then in those games, you better put him in the game and and let him run those routes. And and I'm not <laughs> saying like when you put a guy in there for eight to ten snaps, you just have him pass block every time. I'm throwing him a couple balls. Sure, you have to. So, to me, that's what determines a healthy rotation is is at least to me, five guys in, in 11 personnel, five guys that you can expand to six and maybe even sometimes seven against the really inferior teams. You mm-hmm. got to be careful going too deep in a rotation because then it's like guys just aren't getting enough work to get into the rhythm of the game. They have to get into the rhythm of game. It's, I think it's even more true at corner, more so at corner than it is a receiver. Because I think as a corner, if you're constantly rotating corners, corner is so much a getting a feel for what this dude is doing. You know, mm-hmm. okay, when I know when he does this, he's setting me up for I mean, that's part of the back and forth of a game. And if you're not able to get as many reps as a as a corner, it's harder for you to get a read on that. On the flip side of that, if I'm constantly throwing different receivers at a guy, that corner who's playing every rep is gonna also have a hard time on, well, this is what Deion Colsey's moves are. Here's mm-hmm. what Tobias's moves are, here's what Xavier Watts's moves are, here's what Lorenzo Styles moves are, right? And that make that can make it a little bit more challenging, and that's another reason I think a rotation can help you is because usually in a rotation, different guys have different strengths, which means more things that the defense has to worry about. So that's another advantage to it, uh, in my opinion. I, I, I like that you keep talking about Xavier Watts and the. I'm going to keep doing it until they tell me he's not playing receiver. I'm going to do <laughs> it until they say he's not moving. Okay? I love it. Man. I I'm going to keep doing it. I'm going to stick with it because that's just that's just how it is. You that's know what awesome. I mean. So here, here's a question that we got here from uh, 808 Eds. Hey, Brian, and this is also for Ryan. Do you think it could be possible to let Jalen Seed play safety and Rover being 6'2", 200, 200 pounds? You think he has the speed and athleticism cover receivers? Before you answer, I want to go down here, yep. Ryan, because somebody else asked that about mm-hmm. Nolan Ziegler, John DeCrisio. Why, why not try Nolan Ziegler at safety as a replacement for Hamilton? He seems to be about the same size. I'm going to go back to this question because, again, it goes back to what we said earlier. Mm -hmm. It's not about a guy's size. It's Mm -hmm. about how he moves. Kyle, there aren't many people in the world that move like at 6'4", 220 plus like Kyle Hamilton does, which is what makes Kyle Hamilton so unique. So we got to stop looking at this guy is 6'2", this weight. That means he plays here. Because it's more about how, your movement skills for position. So, Ryan, could you sort of address these two about Nolan yeah. and and uh, yeah. Jalen possibly Rover? Definitely, they can definitely play Rover there. We're yeah, about, 
say the safety aspect of it. All right. Well, let's let's go to Nolan first since you kind of already highlighted that these similar somewhat similar size to, to Kyle. Kyle is even obviously bigger, but he's obviously a couple years older. So that's to be expected. No. So there's a big difference between flexibility and movement skills on the second level comparative to the, to at safety, right? Like Nolan Ziegler is a gifted mover on the second level at linebacker and even out to Rover, but he's not quite the guy that you want in deep zone on the roof. Like he's not a, he's a rangy guy coming downhill, moving sideline to sideline type of thing, right? Middle of the field to slot, like that type of dude. But he's not a guy where you're going to say, I'm leaving you at too high, I'm leaving you at single high, and you're going to flip your hips on a 45 and you're going to carry things to the sideline. Like that's just not stylistically what he is. That's not play style what he is. Now, we already talked Rover for him, right? Like he is a smooth, fluid athlete who should be able to match up in some man-to-man situations, but he has a tremendous zone awareness. If you go watch Nolan Ziegler's highlight tapes coming out of high school, like, I mean, the kid, I would never throw a screen at Nolan Ziegler at a time in my entire life. Like, why Did you would see you? the one in his high school film where he literally intercepted a bubble Jumped in front screen of it. and ran it yeah. back for a touchdown? It's it just uh, incredible instincts. It was and against that, Drake uh, Bowen's high school, by the way. So if yeah. you're wondering if, like, oh, it was against some crap team, no. It was against a team that went 14-1 and one and won a state title or 13-2. Right. They won a state title. I think their only loss in the regular season was to Nolan Ziegler's team in a blowout, right. by the way. Yeah. And Nolan Ziegler – also had over 100 yards receiving in that game. I just want to throw that out there as we're talking he's about. A this. Player, yeah. He's a good player, man. He's a good. No, he's a good. He's a good player. Your and, point was, I'm not throwing a screen at him. I'm not throwing a screen yes. at that kid. Not only is he incredibly instinctive, proactive, but he also is a gifted, fluid athlete. So mm-hmm. that's why I want him on the second level because I want him coming forward more than moving backwards. Right, moving on to 45. Like I don't want that to be his thing. Same thing with in, in a degree with with uh, Snead. I want Snead getting downhill, man. I want him coming forward. I want him working to the sideline in pursuit. Like that's what the type of player Snead is for me. He 100% could play Rover. I think eventually he's going to be a will. Like I think that's just kind of what he – I think that that's where his body projects. I think that Nolan's much more likely to stay at Rover than Jalen Snead. I think similarly – not they're not the same player, but like the Prince Kali type of vibes, right? Like you mm-hmm. want him to get downhill explosive type of guy because Snead is an incredibly gifted athlete. But same deal. I don't want him working in a backpedal. I don't want him going to – like I don't want him working from depth. I want him getting up near the line of scrimmage. That's mm-hmm. a temperament thing. That's a play style. And again, there's a big difference between guys, how ver- how uh, flexible they are maybe on the second level comparative to on the third level. It's just a different mm-hmm. animal. I think the style of play part, you nailed it perfectly. I got, yeah. I mean, this is not going to hear this often, but I got nothing to add. Nice. Love so it. yeah, well done. When you can that's answer a question, there. that's my that's answer. A that's there. pretty good. Like that. That's like pretty that. good. That's very like good. It. But that's why I wanted you to answer it, Ryan. It's like it's it's it, yeah. again because I think sometimes we obsess so much on this guy is this size, which equals that, you know. Sure. And it's like Jason Adamiola. Well, he's only two hundred eighty pound, eighty five. Yeah, but it's not an issue for him. It right. is for other players. For him, it, it's not. And Kyle Kyle, Kyle, ha- Kyle Hamilton is just again unicorn. You know, right. they don't come around like exactly. Him. John A one. If 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 Gerald if Jared Parker gets the tight end job, the offensive staff is complete. What differences do you expect to see in recruiting? How long will it take the staff to change the ID? Uh, I think the the biggest difference, Ryan. I think you would agree. Is I think we expect this staff to be a lot more engaged in recruiting, mm-hmm. yeah. a lot more of a grinding group of coaches, in my opinion. I mean, Chancey, I'm shocked at how many kids Chancey Stuckey went out and saw. Crazy, right? I yeah. mean, and and they're they're going to expand the board. Caden Lee, a kid from Georgia, mm-hmm. is going to be getting an offer soon, most likely. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're going to expand the board, but he has been very active, very active. Uh, Jared Parker comes with a reputation as a good recruiter. Tommy Reese is, I think, has not gotten enough credit for the job. I mean, the offensive work class ended up being a bit disappointing because of the two receivers he lost, but that wasn't because of Tommy Reese. Tommy yeah. Reese is the only reason those guys even were in the class to begin with. C.J. Mm-hmm. Williams and Amorian Walker. Uh, and then it was up to the receivers coach to keep him, and he couldn't. But you still got, in my opinion, a top 100 caliber player at running back. You got a top 50 caliber player at wide receiver. You got mm-hmm. the best tight end duo in the country, in my opinion. And you sure. got one of the two or three best offensive line classes in the country. And a lot of that had to do with Tom Reese. Billy Shrouth does not come to Notre Dame if it's not for Tom Reese. End of, end of sentence, period, fact. There's no debating it, right? Well, now – He's going to have some horses with him, right? It's kind of like, you know, it's like, it's like, yeah, I love moving, using movie quotes, right? Like one of my favorite movie quotes ever is Tombstone, right? 
It's the mm-hmm. end where, where Wyatt Earp kind of loses it when they kill his brother. And so like, you tell him I'm coming and hell's coming with me. Like in the past, it was the time where like, you tell him I'm coming. He's like, yeah, it'll just be me. <laughs> you know, it's like, mm-hmm. now it's like, you tell him I'm coming and I'm bringing, I got my boys, right? Like that's a big thing for a guy like Tommy Reese. Cause it can't just be you to beat Bama, to beat mm-hmm. Clemson, to beat Oklahoma, to beat Ohio State for recruits. It just can't be you. It's mm-hmm. got to be you plus Marcus Freeman, plus Chancey Stuckey, plus Jared Parker, plus Dylan McCullough. I mean, you, you just went and got one of the best rec- running back recruiting coaches by reputation in the country. Yeah. You know, and Harry Heastan's results speak for them. I mean, when you have an O-line coach that can guy to walk in a room and be like, here's my resume. Do you want to come play for me and be a first-round draft pick? Uh, yeah, sign me up. I mean, that was Harry Heastan's recruiting pitch. You come mm-hmm. play for me. I'm going to be hard on you but I'm going to make you a great player and you're going to be a first round draft pick. Do you want to be a part of that? Uh, I have a, yeah. I kind of have a question for you, Brian, and I'm interested. Mm-hmm. I honestly, I don't know mm-hmm. where you're going to, I don't know what your answer would be for this. So Jared Parker, assuming that he does get the tight end job, right. In this, in this, in this scenario, right. He, since he has a heavy wide receiver coach background, do you think that that in turn helps wide receiver recruiting to a degree? I think it's going to depend on the dynamic of the relationship between him and Chancey Stuckey. Right. And and I would hope that mm-hmm. the two of them play off each other a little bit, mm-hmm. meaning also Chancey Stuckey is involved with some tight end recruits. Sure. And I, I be, I'm a big believer, Ryan, in in teamwork as an offensive staff. Mm-hmm. And and I'm a big believer that if you know, if, if you're recruiting a big time receiver, I want Chancey Stuckey being heavily involved. I want. Mm-hmm. Tommy Reese being involved, and I do think that a guy like Jared Parker, if he's a good recruiter, can be a can be an assist to that. But the assist has to come at Chancey's direction. Hey, man, mm-hmm. I'm calling the kid tonight. You give him a call tomorrow night. And if they're tag teaming it like that, I, I it can't it can't hurt. If right. the relationship between the two of them isn't there, and because here's how look, Ryan, you know this, man. You're you're around mm-hmm. a lot of coaches and scouts. There's a yeah. lot of people that get super territorial. And, sure. and these big ego guys in deep down are really small people. And it's about my guys and my numbers. And why are you calling my recruits? And it's like, mm-hmm. no, I want it to be my guy. Coaches that truly care like the, about winning are like, dude, I don't care what we got to do to get that guy there. Mm-hmm. Like if Tommy Reese has the right mindset, he's like, hey, fellas, I don't care what we got to do to get Dante Moore here. I don't need to be the guy giving all the credit for it. We all need to be a part. Of, if we're – I mean – I'm if I'm Harry, I mean, hey, coach, he stand, get on the horn. Hey, look, man, I'm gonna develop all these first round picks, but if we're gonna win a championship, I need a dude behind him. You got to be that guy. I don't know why I'm sounding a little bit like Shaquille O'Neal and my Harry he stand voice. I, I, I was it's more like, where, I it's, where it's, it's, it's more like, yeah. uh, because Harry had that crescendo. Dante, yeah. I'm gonna have a great offensive line, and my guys are gonna be a lot of first round NFL draft picks, but we need a lot of quarterback to play behind him. Like that's how Kerry had that crescendo when he talked. So that's probably a little better voice. But the point being, mm-hmm. it's like, look, man, I'm going to have a great offensive line. Do you want to come be, a, you know, but we, we need the trigger man. Sure. Jalen McCullough. Hey, look, man, you, do you see the backfield we're putting together? Like, mm-hmm. you, you know you know what I mean? Like, wait till you see the kid. Man, but we, we need to, we need to somebody take the pressure off of him when Ty's gone, you know, same right. hey, chance. He is involved. Hey, look, man, I'm, I'm going to go out there and look, I'm here's my commitment to you, Dante. You come here in Notre Dame. I'm gonna do not my my main part in the next three years to go out and get the best receivers in the country to make sure that you know you're throwing the receiving cores like Bama and Ohio State are putting out. I'll take care right? of you. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know that's where yeah. it's got to be a team effort. And sure. so I think that they can work together, but a lot of that has to do with the personal relationship between the coaches. Because if they don't see it as teamwork, you know, to make the dream work, then it's not going to work. It's going to be a lot of back, you know, in fi- and that's we've seen some of that from Notre Dame in the past. You know, like they had a guy that used to coach special teams at Notre Dame who was like super territorial mm-hmm. and he would then try to get in on the recruitments that weren't his. Cause he wanted, and then he'd go tell reporters like, you know, I was part of that recruitment too. Cause he was all about, you know, my name, my name, my name. I don't care about that. I just care that the kid signs and we're out there winning. Right. You, you want coaches mm-hmm. like that. Like, Hey, I don't, this isn't about you building up your name alone. It's about, it's like what I told you when I hired you, like, I'm going to do my best to build your brand up, but your job is to work your butt off to build up Irish Breakdown, right? Like it's, it, you do it together. We're doing it together. And if we both do our jobs right, then the results will speak for themselves. It's the same right. thing here. Look, I, whoever gets the credit at the end of the day, if we're winning championships, teams are going to want us as coaches, right? Mm-hmm. So that, that would be my answer, Ryan, is it just depends on their dynamic. I hope, however, 
that the answer is affirmative that they do work together and partner together. Sure. And that background does pay off. Just like I would like for Coach Stuckey to be involved in. So, hey, look, man, I'm going to tell you something right now. I'm going to be fighting Coach Parker to to try to get you in a slot, you know, Deuce Robinson, because mm -hmm. we think you can, you know what I mean? Just have some fun with it. Yeah. Yep. And, you know, kids love that stuff. Like, oh, man, Chancey Stuckey's calling me. Like, talking about how he thinks I can even play some boundary. You know, he get you in the boundary, man. I, I have enough big guys. I may try to steal you over from Coach Parker to get you to run some W for us. And, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, have some fun with it. And yep. if the relationship between the coaches is there, then I think that stuff can be can be really effective. And speaking of Dante Moore, I just had to get this in there. Demetrius Rex, I really think we're going to land Dante. Okay. Three natties within the next five years. Okay. One with Tyler. Two with more, book it. I'm going to go ahead and not put money on that one just because three titles in five years is absurd. Uh, I'd be curious. Like, I'm going to look at Nick Saban because that's even – because his six titles have come over 12 years. So mm -hmm. they they won 9, 11, and 12. That was the one stretch. Mm -hmm. They have not had another – like so from 13 to 20, they had three in – Two, three, four, five, three and eight years. Mm -hmm. Right. So Bama had that three and four years early, but yeah. since then they've won three and nine, three and nine since then. So three titles in five years is a little hard to do. But it's if if that happens, I'll be a happy guy. I'll be very I'll, happy. I'll take it. I'll yes. take it. Why are you predicting they're gonna lose two? Come on, man. Come on, Demetrius. Go all in, buddy. <laughs> All right, here, here's – I'm going to have you respond to this, Ryan, because because uh, uh, for – Mike Reddy says, would not like Al Golden as D.C. Hasn't been a coordinator since 2005. Reminds me of when LSU hired Bo Pelini the second time. I just want to remind people that prior to taking the D coordinator job at Notre Dame in 2018, Clark Lee hadn't been a coordinator since ever. <laughs> right. Well, uh, all right, so I understand the hesitance, Mike. I really do, and I get it. 2005, obviously, hey, it's a long time. I get it. I get it. So he hasn't called a defense, and I, I completely understand that, so I I accept that premise. Mm -hmm. I, I think also, there's some validity to that, that concern. Oh, it is. 100%. Right? I mean, yeah. Yep. 100%. Yeah, no, it's a very valid point, and I get it. Like, the guy just hasn't done it. So what are you betting on, right? You're betting something that you haven't seen in 17 years. I, I completely understand that. But the other world world is, I mean, Al Golden's been coaching football, right? Like he's been around the game. He hasn't been at Youngstown the, State. No, he's been. Right? I mean, he's been at Miami. He's been obviously he he resurrected a terrible situation in Temple. Like let's call it what it is. They were awful before he got there. Went to Miami. He's been now in the NFL for the last few years. He's a part of a Cincinnati staff, which defensively, they played very good football this year. The, the improvements at the linebackers specifically that he coaches over the last couple of years is resounding. Like He's got guys like Logan Wilson and Jermaine Pratt playing really good football for the Bengals. So I, I think that we should keep an open mind because it's not like he hasn't been coaching football at a very high level. And everything that I've heard from him, and again, these are from – scouts and former scouts that have either been around him in some capacity or have been, you know, no others that, that have been in the building with him in the last couple years with Cincinnati. They speak volumes to the, to the level of football acumen that he has and the ability that he has as a, as a head, as a uh, defensive mind. So that being said, I, th I th personally think it will be a good hire. I do. I understand the, the, reservations that people have again with the layer of the defensive coordinator i completely get that but i would be optimistic with coach al golden i'll just leave it at that yeah and i i think the point that you that i want to hammer specific to this is just yep. because like the difference in bo pelini is two things mm -hmm. number and this is this will be the test for al golden because what we don't know al golden is coaching a very diverse i mean we talked about this in a recent show they'll go from three four against the Titans to a four, two, five against the chiefs like that. Yeah. Um, but that's what the D coordinator wants to do. We don't know mm -hmm. if that would necessarily be Al Golden's philosophy. So, I mean, so there's some legitimate questions, but have, has, as you've said, it's not like he's been out of football, right? It's not like he's been at the FCS level. It's not like he's been mm -hmm. at ESPN. He's mm -hmm. been in the NFL for five years. He's even coached offense in the NFL, which I think is a tremendous learning experience. When you get to see it sure. from the other side, like, Oh, now it's like, it's kind of like you're a spy and, and you're, 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 uh, you're kind of, uh, you're, you're with, you know, you're, you get a chance to kind of be in the, 
the office where your enemies having their meetings and you're seeing how they think and how they put game plans together and how they, how they view you. And it's like, okay, now I have a completely different understanding of why they do what they do. I think that things like that help him. Um, so I just, the, those experiences have been very beneficial to him. They're going to make him a better coach. We still don't know how he's going to be as a coordinator, but I, I don't think he's going to be this like rusty guy. Bo Pelini, mm-hmm. the other problem Bo had is Bo was still, and this is the biggest concern I have with Al Golden because he hasn't run a defense. Here's the one big question. If Al Gold has been willing to evolve with the game of football, then he'll be fine. Just like Nick Saban. Nick Saban doesn't run the three, four power football that he ran when he first came to Alabama and won 3,004 years. Their defense mm-hmm. now looks nothing like that from a structural standpoint. Now, mm-hmm. the coverages are similar and some of the techniques are similar, but they do a lot more four down now. They get more athletes on the field. Sure. Their offense looks completely different. He's evolved, right, mm-hmm. with football, changes of football. Bo Pelini was still trying to run the same defense he had at LSU when they won, you know, however many years ago. That was the problem that Bo had. He That was the problem Bob Diakos had. Mm-hmm. Bob Diaco still trying to run defense like he did 2012 in Notre Dame. The game has changed a ton in the 10 years since then, mm-hmm. right? Where back then it was like just Oregon and a couple other teams are doing this stuff. Now it's like everybody's doing that stuff. And if you're still trying to run your 3-4 defense, you know, two-gap defense, and you know, you're not going to have a lot of success. So that's going to be the big question about Al Golden that we don't have an answer to. But from everything Ryan's told me that he's heard from his sources – this is a smart football guy. He's not. And here's the other thing, too, I want people to understand. If Al Golden came to Marcus Freeman and said, hey, I want to go back to the 3-4 defense we ran at Virginia, you, Marcus Freeman's response would be, coach, I wish you the best of luck <laughs> wherever you're going to be coaching next year. Right. Right? I mean, we, we can't forget that part of the influence is there. Marcus Freeman is there. If there is some rust there to being a defensive coordinator, you've got this cat named Marcus Freeman whose office is right down the hall. Sure. Right? So I think that'll help. That'll help with that too. So Mike, that's a really good question. That's why we brought it up. Uh, but I, I don't. I don't. It's not an issue for me. And if it is an issue, Marcus Freeman will have figured that out, and he won't hire him to begin with. Yep. I got a question from Pasquale. Love this name. Uh, did anybody listen to Jimbo's rant when asked about NIL? I only bring it up because he specifically called out a Notre Dame vice president and the character of Notre Dame as an institution. Thoughts. Uh, my first thought was uh, was it was it Hamlet. Uh, you know, uh, you doth protest too much, methinks, right? Like that was a that was a real like he had all that data ready to pull up when somebody asked him about it. Oh, right? he was prepared. Yeah, like it, that was a that was and it's like that was Jimbo being Jimbo. Uh, mm-hmm. It's like that guy lies as well as people breathe, you know. And I think it was very intentional that he said it the way he said it, but mm-hmm. he never actually he never actually specifically addressed the concerns other than the salary cap part of it. Right. Like it was just a, mm-hmm. an angry rant that to me sounded like a guy that feels like, you know, somebody struck a nerve, <laughs> you know what I mean? Somebody's like, guilty. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's how I felt. Right. I don't know how you felt about it. No, I, I felt the same way when he, when he was, it felt like that. It felt like, you know, when you, when, not that I would ever lie, but like if you get caught in a lie and you're like, oh no, no, you get super loud, right? Yeah. And you're like, oh no, yeah. no, that's not how yeah. it happened. This and is how start, it like and what you do yeah. is you start impugning or you start impugning that person's character. What? Right. Oh, you're this, you're that, you're prejudiced, you're right. this, you you know, and you attack their character. Very defensive. Like, whoa, whoa, now I gotta defend yeah. my character. And I no, if Notre Dame's like, hey man, it's fine. If because like yeah. show me the books then, right? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, show me your call log, show me this, show me that, whatever. But, like, if I'm Notre Dame, I'm like, okay, clearly Jimbo's a little worried about us. Why is he bringing up Notre Dame? Get, right? Guilty guilty people get defensive. Usually when you're yeah. in the right, you're just kind of like, huh? Like, you're yeah. just kind of shocked. Or you say you're an idiot. Right? Like, yeah, exactly. Idiot. Like, exactly. You called yeah. me what? You're an idiot. Like, I'm not even engage mm-hmm. you. Uh, you're an idiot. So, exactly. yeah, I, he, 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 he was responding like a guilty man trying to tr- turn the conversation. And he knows that the lackeys at ESPN who love, who love the SEC are going to do whatever they can to protect the rising powers in the sec, right? Like a and a money program and ESPN is going to protect the money programs. Mm-hmm. And so uh, until they have no choice, but to report, you know, actually do real reporting uh, until then they won't. Cause that's not their entertainment, not a journalism site in my opinion, but that's yeah. a different topic for a different day. <sighs> Brent Byers with a question. Thank you, Brent. I've heard a lot about Tyler Buckner and his lack of passing ability and arm talent and arm strength. You haven't heard that here. Can you guys put that to bed, please? Guy makes 40 to 50 yard throws, not even having his feet set. 
Uh, I'll begin on the deep part. I, I don't think Tyler Buckner has a powerful deep arm. Uh, I've never seen him throw the ball more than 50 yards. I've seen a couple in high school where he threw about 50, and the throw he made to Kevin Austin was about 45. The one against Virginia was about 45 in the air ball. from where he set his feet. Now, 45 meaning vertically down the field. It actually is 45 yards on the longer in the field because you're throwing from the middle of the field, and that guy's running right. up there. But it covered 45 yards of, of you know, Fair. from the where he yeah. threw to 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 him, of uh, basically distance on the you know yardage on the football field. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I look, he's not going to be a guy that's going to do like somebody showed me a play of like a quarterback was scrambling around and he flicks the ball 65 yards in the air on top of the defense. And it's like, you're not going to see Todd Buckner doing that. But mm -hmm. I, how often do you do that in a football field? I, I remember I was talking, I think it was, I think it was Brad Johnson. Remember Brad Johnson played for the, yeah. the, the, he was, um he was working at a camp I was at. That's when I was in high school. Yeah. And somebody's talking about how, you know, somebody's you know, big arms. He's like, you know, he goes, do you know how many times quarterbacks actually throw the ball more than 50 yards in a game? He's Never. like, it's like less than 10 times in an entire season. Now yeah. it's changed a little bit now, but it's mm -hmm. not a ton, not yeah. a ton. Still his background and, looks really the same. Yeah. yeah. And like, so like there was a play Josh Allen made in the championship game where he just threw a post route. Mm -hmm. and it was like one over 60 yards. You're like, okay, so I, I got to take that play out of my playbook. You know who else does? Everyone that doesn't have Pat Mahomes or, you know, Justin Josh Allen is your quarterback, right? Like, <laughs> right. which is everyone. Justin, Justin Herbert. Yeah. Like, those right. Guys. <clears throat> so, uh, what I feel about Tyler Buckner, and I'll say this, Ryan, and you can agree with what mm -hmm. you agree with and disagree with what you disagree with. Sure. I think number one that you have to understand is there's two ways to get a ball out quickly to a player. Number one is just power, which is just it travels quickly. And number two is arm quick you know, quickness of your delivery. Like Dan Marino did not have a real powerful arm. And I've heard a lot of NFL quarterbacks say he did not have a cannon for an arm. The ball got out so quickly that it got there just as long as John Elway, who had a little bit of a longer, you know, yeah. now mm -hmm. on the 30 yard in cuts, that's where you separate the, 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 you know, the great ones, the, the, the great arms, right. Mm -hmm. Cause I can throw a 30 yard in cut. Like you could throw a 12 yard in cut, right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, so I don't see him running a throwing a lot of 30 yard in cuts on a flat line, you know, between two defenders, but you know, who else isn't going to have that every other team in college football with, you <laughs> right. know, really, I think he gets the ball out quickly. Mm -hmm. I think he gets plenty of zip on the ball. I think that you look at the seam, the backside seam throw he threw to Avery Davis, that ball got quickly. It was on a line, the, the ball he threw to, to, uh, to Kevin Austin, to me, I don't care as much about distance what mm -hmm. I care more about is is the speed in which it goes up and down. Sure, uh, I can throw a ball fifty yards that is going to hang up in the air because I don't have a real strong arm, and it's just it's going to take a while and it gets played on. What I like about Tyler Buckner is when he does throw a deep ball, that sucker gets up and gets down quickly. Mm -hmm. That matters more than it went fifty yards. It's it's it went fifty yards and it got there in a hurry. Do I think he can do the same thing at 60, 65? No, I don't. But I don't think there's a whole lot of play calls in Tom Reese's playbook asking him to throw the ball that deep. But his release is so quick, and he does get enough zip that I there aren't a lot of throws that Tyler Buckner can't make. My bigger concern with Tyler Buckner is ball placement. I care more about him improving that than I do mm -hmm. about his arm strength. Plus, he's a freshman. He's going to keep getting stronger a little. Yeah. You know, It's not like he's going to go from – you know, throwing it 50 yards to 80, but he's mm -hmm. going to get more zip on the ball. Sure. I, I have no issues with Tyler Buckner's arm talent. I care more about the mechanical things, the ball placement, the footwork, making the right reads. That's the only thing that's going to keep Tyler Buckner from being a, a great quarterback. There's nothing about his arm talent, in my view, when we talk about the physical tools that mm – -hmm to me, are going to keep him from being a great player. Not at all, in my opinion. Agree, no. disagree, or a little bit of both, Ryan? So I, I think as we see Tyler Buckner get more confident and throw with more conviction, that arm strength will just come in that sense as well. But I also agree that he's a freshman that is going to get stronger. He's going to get, you know, it's just more confident, stronger quarterback. But I still, I, I think he has a good arm. Like, I think it's, I think it's good. I wouldn't say that it's great. It's definitely not elite in my opinion, but it is a good arm. There is no, I don't think there's any, because like you're, you're talking about like throwing 65, 60, like that's a luxury, man. Like to have those guys, right? Like there is no throw on the football field that I don't think that in a, in a, in the structure of a playbook that Tyler Buckner can't make, like he can do all of those things. So I think that there's, 
there should not, there definitely should be no misnomer. Like I, it's definitely not, it's nowhere near a weak arm at all. Like he can make every throw that he needs to make. For me, it's just about getting comfortable, throwing with conviction, and then continuing to, to get stronger in the weight room. Like those things will all come to that zip that you're talking about on those in cuts. Cause I do agree. I think that he has good arm talent in the, in the sense of, I think that he can work different trajectories. I think he can throw from multiple platforms. Like I think he can throw from different arm slots. I think all that stuff is there. It's just about, you know, again, when he was 18 year old kid, he's going to get stronger. He's right. going to get, get more confident with it. I think the other thing too, is like, we heard this about a lot about Ian book. Mm-hmm. There's this thing that you know, Ian book doesn't have the arm strength. I was like, I've never watched Ian book play and questioned, gee, does he have enough arm to make all the throws you need to make in college? Right. It, it was, is he willing? And yeah. that's the difference to me between Tyler Buckner and, and Ian book is Tyler Buckner strikes me as someone who's in drew pine as well are mm-hmm. going to be guys that are much more willing. I'm more concerned about drew pines ability to throw the ball down the field. I think drew 30 yard and in is going to be money. I think sure. Drew has a because like you look at the touchdown pass he threw against Cincinnati, he had to muscle that sucker up, and it was a thirty yard <laughs> touchdown. Yeah, you know now he's going to get stronger too, uh, sure. but but he's also similar like the quickness of which he throws and he gets the ball mm-hmm. out quickly and he he gets really good zip on those fifteen to twenty yard throws. Absolutely. It's the deeper ones that can be a bit of an issue, but mm-hmm. with Tyler, I, I see no limitations physically. Just like I saw again, we're talking college. Is he going to be a top ten NFL draft pick? Okay, that may be a different conversation. Right. We're talking college. Yep. And for college, I don't see a throw in Notre Dame's offense that I don't think Tyler Buckner's going to be able to make and make mm-hmm. impressively from a strength standpoint. The questions I have are going to be up here and here, which is the same question I had about Ian Book. If you say, well, you couldn't throw the deep ball, go watch the post route he threw to Braden Lindsay in 2019. He had Braden Lindsay in stride over six, about 60 yard, 55, 60 yards down the field. He threw off his back foot. Right. Ian Book and, and throw. Yeah. That's a, that's a, that's a toss. His mm-hmm. issues weren't physical talent. His issues were – now, Ian had to muscle things up a little bit more early in his career than Tyler has had to. And I think Tyler's got a stronger arm at the same age than Ian had. Mm-hmm. And by the time Ian was a senior, there were no there were no throws he physically couldn't make. There was a bunch of throws he mentally couldn't make. That's mm-hmm. the difference. If Ian Book had Tommy Reese's gunslinger mentality, Ian Book would have been a much better quarterback. He'd have <laughs> right. thrown a few more interceptions, but he'd have made a ton more plays too. Because sure. he could, he and it would have made him a more effective runner as well. So mm-hmm. good, good, very good question, Brent. Very good question. John Rich says, uh, not that excited, or not that I'm excited or anything. But when will Notre Dame announce the date of the spring game? They already have John. It is going to be April 23rd, correct, Ryan? Is what I believe I saw the other day. Yeah, that you put on the message board mm-hmm. too, right? Did you yep. not? Yes. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Paul Hamilton asks. Can I get some clarification? Sean Davis on the Lucky Lefty podcast said he's confident Keeley stays and is concerned that Vernon is more likely to commit if either does. You have stated the opposite. Uh, Sean is not correct on Brennan on Brennan Vernon. Yeah. So um, uh, I, I'll i ask Sean about that. I don't – well, let me rephrase. I'm not going to say Sean is incorrect because I don't know what Sean said. I didn't listen to the show. I'll ask him about it. But uh, I I if if one of those two were to decommit, I'm more concerned about Keon than Brennan. I'm mm-hmm. confident Notre Dame is going to land both of them at this point in time. Same. But of the two, I'd be shocked if Brennan Vernon decommits. So uh, I don't know if Sean said that or if it was different context. Paul, I'm not saying that you are misconstruing. I just don't like commenting directly to things that people are said to have said if I mm-hmm. didn't hear him say it. So, uh, no, I, I – and I'll I'll chat with Sean about that and, and kind of see what he said and where he was coming from. But, Ryan, would you – do you have I have, thoughts? I, I haven't had a single concern about Brendan Vernon, so yeah. I'm I'm in the same page. I haven't heard anything that would lead me to any other conclusion that he's very firm on Notre Dame. So. All right, Jason Rose, out of the new coaches, which are you most excited about? Can I start this one? Please. Coach McCullough, man. I really like him. I've listened to a bunch of interviews he's done now. He's got energy. He's got a track record. I'm, I'm excited. I know I've heard you state it, and I do agree with it. That running back coach is you know, not usually the most important position to fill, but I think – It's the easiest. No, I didn't say it's not important. I said it's the right. easiest position Sorry. to coach. Bad phrasing, what, yeah. yes. Yeah, for sure. But yeah. I, I think that everything I've heard of him, the track record he brings, I'm excited about it, man, because I think mm-hmm. it's, it's going to be a different dynamic because I really liked Lance Taylor as a coach – but I think Coach McCullough is going to bring a, just a different energy on the recruiting trail that is just going to be – I think it's going to get a lot of people excited because we've seen now a good string the last couple of years with Kyra Williams and we've landed some good recruits. But I think that seeing the uh, Coach McCullough's impact on the recruiting moving 
moving forward here. I'm excited to see and how it just kind of the energy he brings to the conversation. Mm-hmm. I mean, so much of what I of of what I want to say here is Chancey Stucky, because Fair. I'm a Fair. receivers coach and I just the receiver coaching was so poor. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, this is Notre Dame, and it's still about line play. And Fair. I think Jeff Quinn was was not did not get the job done. And I think the combination of Harry Heastan plus Chris Watt, and if Trevor Mendelson Trevor Mendelson comes back too next year, you've got three guys that can coach, you can work with the line in some different capacity. Because I feel like if the line plays the way it's capable of, if the if the potential equals production up front mm-hmm. next year, good luck stopping Notre Dame. Right. That, that's just the way I look at it. And you know, Chancey Stuckey and Dylan McCullough don't have to be great coaches at that point. Just be good. Mm-hmm. If Harry Heastan's great. The rest of them just have to be good. If the rest of them are just okay, if the rest of them are great, but he stands not, it doesn't matter. And we saw that this year with the running backs. An elite running backs coach, in my opinion, had his guys look really bad in the run game for a lot of the year. Mm -hmm. To the point where they had to freelance to make plays, right? The Mm O-line coach not doing his job is going to have a greater impact on the quarterback's coach, the running back's coach, and the receiver's coach than vice versa. A great running backs co- or great offensive line coach is going to have a big impact on those guys, just like a bad one will. A great running backs coach impacts nobody but the running backs. You know what I mean? Now, sure. quarterback is probably next because a great quarterbacks coach can you know impact you know checks and audibles and the line and the receivers and all that. But those mm-hmm. two positions, quarterback and offensive line, but at the end of the day, you could have a great quarterbacks coach and a great quarterback. But if your line's not good, you're not going to be great. And so to me, at the end of the day, that's where I go. As far as like the energy and all that kind of stuff, yeah, that's Dylan McCullough, right? Yeah. Who you want to mic up at practice? He, he's in that. Yeah. He's in that list, right? Yeah. Uh, I, you do not want to mic up Harry Heastan because you won't hear him. It. It'll just be beep 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 beep. You know, form. I got that'd be fun. Step. You know, um, but the results are going to be tremendous. And if I'm right, and and he still has it in him, because that's I think that's the one little concern I have is like. As a coach in a few years, right, right. Now the nice thing is, you know this about line coaches. Line mm-hmm. coaches never truly retire from line discussion and coaching. No. Like they will literally be at these clinics till they die. And it's these, yeah. these O line clinics that they have every year, and they they do. I mean, they do. They talk O line play until they die. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm I'm serious about that. Alex mm-hmm. Gibbs until he passed away recently was always involved in these O line clinics and such, and he hadn't coached. It's been a while since he'd coached, right? Mm-hmm. So Harry Heastan wasn't just hanging back, you know, relaxing, eating Doritos, watching soccer the last few years, right? He was still involved in line play, but that's different than going out there and coaching it. And, sure. you know, so how does that adjustment happen? But I think it's going to be fine, and I'm excited about it. I, I In my in my world, Coach Heastan never left. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I get it. I get it. Just like block out the last few years. I get it. It's kind of I do it 2016 sometimes. Like I mean, they had like six years of 10 year 10 wins in a row. Like, no, they didn't. I said, yeah, they did. 2015, 2017, 28, you know. <laughs> so six in a row. What about 2016? What about 2016? I don't know what you're talking about. It's like the Thanos snap. 2016 yeah. never happened. Yeah, it didn't fine. happen. <laughs> didn't happen. Absolutely. Good, good, good Marvel reference there. Absolutely. I love Marvel, man. Yeah. Seen every one. I'm yeah. there. All right, Brian Swint. Oh, by the way, I watched. I did finally watch Black Widow. The remember we were talking about. Did you that like it? Was the, yeah, I did. I did. I watched it with I Angela. Thought, I liked it. I liked yeah, it too. I did. Yeah. I liked her sister. Was my favorite character. She was hilarious. Uh, she, she's good. Have you she watched any hilarious. of the shows or not? I just not really. I, I binged Hawkeye the other day. Okay, and she's in yeah. it that too. Yeah. The sister. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So I binged that the other day. It was pretty good. I was better it's, than I thought it was going to be because I, I I didn't love Loki. And I watched. I, the first, I didn't either. Yeah. I didn't love Loki. I, I I didn't like the one with uh, Wanda. Uh, Wanda. I, I love Wanda Vision. Oh, yeah. That was my favorite one. I didn't love I really it. Um, I didn't love. I I watched the first three or four of Falcon and Winter Soldier and just it's pretty solid. It's okay. Couldn't yeah. get into it. Uh, yeah. when they brought out the fake Captain America, I was like, I'm done. Click. <laughs> you know. Uh, what was that guy? What was that guy's name? I forget oh, his name already. It was bad. Yeah. It was yeah. bad. But uh. But I, I liked Hawkeye. I thought that was pretty. That one was pretty good. Yeah. And I didn't see them bringing in Kingpin. I didn't see that angle coming because normally that I kind of look at what nowhere. it's going to be about. But I when they start talking about, I was like, oh okay, you know, because 
I'm not a comic book guy. So like some of these, like mm-hmm. when Echo gets it, I don't know who that is. Like, I don't know her backstory in relation to, right. to, to Kingpin and all that stuff. Like I know the characters, but I don't know the backstories. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I was like, that was pretty interesting. And, yeah. but the dynamic between Kate Bishop and, and uh, the, the black, the new black widow was just, that mm-hmm. was, that was the best part that, that, that li- yeah. their little banter, you know, was, was when she, when she's like punching her or whatever, when she's yeah. just like walking through the buildings. <laughs> <laughs> I was pretty good. So if you haven't seen Black Widow, it was pretty good. Right. I heard I heard a lot of people complain about it, and I was just like, I I enjoyed oh, I it. I I, I liked thought it was it. good. Yeah. I thought it, it was good. good. The only one I couldn't get into, like you said, was Loki. Like I just, yeah. I don't know, just didn't. Well, so, and it kind of yeah. like undermined the whole thing, like with the stones that don't work, because it's like all yeah. these different. It's just like that's you start getting like the like I'm, I haven't seen the new Spider Man. I'm not sure how I'm going to feel about that. I don't love the whole multiverse thing. thing. I'm yeah. not. I don't love that. Um I haven't seen we'll Spider Man either yet. I can't believe I haven't seen it yet. But yeah, we'll see. Yeah, well, I get it. I get it. Mm-hmm. So anyway, Brian Swint had a question. <laughs> How much Sorry, benefit Brian. does it's all good? Uh, Brian Swint spells his name correctly and everything. How much benefit? Uh, how much benefit does Coach Freeman get as head coach from having a bowl game last season versus learning to be head coach in his first game next season? Gets time to evaluate. Worked for him versus what didn't. I think it's a. I think it's enormous benefit. Not just from what worked and what didn't, but just allowing the players to see him as the head coach, mm-hmm. getting to put practice things together. It's almost like practice period for you, you know, like to partly what did and what didn't work, but but also kind of as a coach, like you just you, you're getting you're working out your own kinks as far as just. You know, like he said, like I have to get used to, like I'm. Oh shoot, I can't just be staring at the defense the whole time. I got to go down and check out the offense. Right. Just from the mechanics of going through a practice is, you know, there's there's some bad like I'll tell you right now, like when I first started watching games covering the team, I had a really bad habit of never seeing the line play. And so what I've eventually done is I've I've got my iPad there. So I watch because the reason I say that is, is as a coach, I was always watching the secondary and the perimeter. Right. Because mm-hmm. I was the receivers coach. I was. And so I was like, what would happen on the line play? I don't know. I didn't watch it. So what I've had to do is I've got my iPad there and I watch the series and then I go back and, you know, during the commercial break, I'll watch it on the iPad so I can watch the line play, you know? So, cause like you just, your, your eyes go where you're kind of where you've trained them to go on these years, you know, yep. uh, where other people who watch, who only watch on TV, you have a hard time not following the ball. Right. And you don't think about watching the back end in the second, cause you can't see it on TV. So mm-hmm. it's just because that's what your eyes are trained to. So I think for Coach Freeman, like it's that beginning of the process of deprogramming your mindset in practice is going to be important. So he can mm-hmm. make sure he is kind of seeing everything that's going on. And and so I think those things are benefits to him. I think going through a game operation as a coach before Ohio State is going to be tremendously beneficial for him. And that's where I think the whole what went right, what went wrong, not so much from how the game played out, but just knowing how you need to be able to go from here to here to here to here in a game is something that you can't really replicate until you actually go through a game. Right. And I think that'll help as well, too. Ryan, you have any, any thoughts to add to that? Well, I was going to say, especially with it obviously being a huge first game this next season against Ohio State, I don't know if that's the you want to go into your first – game day atmosphere as a head coach in that game. I feel like even though Oklahoma state did not go the way that Notre Dame wanted down the stretch, obviously, like we would have loved them to just, you know, kind of, you know, keep the foot on the pedal and, and, you know, shut it down in the second half there. But I, I still think that it's incredibly beneficial to just understand what that atmosphere feels like, especially going into what is a, a, I don't want to call it a crucial, but it's, it's a big time, obviously first opening week, you know, going mm-hmm. against a team like Ohio state. Yeah. Good one, Brian. And I'm not just biased because you spell your name correctly. Maybe a little. All right. Ian Johnson, what do you think about pulling in so many special teams players from transfers and preferred walk-ons? Will there be too many in the room there for good reps? I'm not worried about that because the nice thing about special teams, guys, is that's all they do. Sure. I mean, yeah. if you have if you have four snappers and four holders and four kickers, you're good to go. You have at <laughs> least four. Because here's the thing. Notre Dame, let's say they're practicing indoors, okay? Mm -hmm. They've got three fields outside. If they're outside on two fields, there's still one field in the indoor field with two Mm -hmm. goalposts on each one that they can kick into. Right. 
right? Like there is plenty of opportunity for them to get those reps. And I don't think all of them are going to stay. I mean, some of these walk on guys, you, you know, they may, they might not stay. There was another question about, um, about the long snapper that we had here uh, from somebody, but uh, here mm-hmm. we go. Have we discussed faded exile? Have we discussed Reno Monteforte yet? Saw a video of him snap uh, long snap the ball, 30 yards, perfect spiral. And that's fine. But he's like five, nine and a little fella, like yeah. part of being in long snappers running down the field and tackling somebody, Length you know? And, so yeah. I just, mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's good to have depth. It's good to have those things. And I like that Notre Dame is doing that. I liked the getting the punter from Harvard, even though it's a preferred walk on, because mm-hmm. if Bryce McPherson's not ready to take over as a freshman, you have some protection there. You yeah. have a guy that's a, a solid, been an all Ivy League punter. Ideally, Bryce McPherson comes in and wins the job. Mm-hmm. Uh, just like, you know, you're bringing in, bringing in Blake Groupie because mm-hmm. he's a consistent, steady kicker, not a big leg. You hope yeah. that Josh Bryan gives you a reason to use him instead. You know, I mean, but now you're protected in case he doesn't. Or it's like, hey, look, Bryce is our guy from 35 in and Josh is our guy from 35 out. I mean, maybe that's how you go with it. Something like that, you know, 40 out or whatever. Yeah. But at least now, you know, you at least have these veterans that can do that. But I mean, some of the preferred walk-ons they've brought on, like Trey Reader, that's mm-hmm. a good pickup. Like that, that kid's is. a good football player. For he is. And is he a guy that you'd offer a scholarship to? No, mm-hmm. but that's the kind of kid that if that kid's going to be running on your scout team the next four years, you're going to have a pretty good football player over there giving you a pretty good look. And that's yeah. really important thing. Like some of the walk-ons Notre Dame has had that run scout team are like, you're not getting any kind of look down there. You know, because mm-hmm. as you kind of have injuries and you got to pull up some young guys and things like that, it's like, oh boy. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when you can get some of these kids like Trey Reader and Chase Ketterer and Matt Salerno and guys that are actually pretty darn good football players, some of them even pan out enough to where they can help you. But yeah. it, 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 they can't help you on Saturdays. They're at least giving you a good look down there. And sure. it's and it's harder for Notre Dame. This is how I think people are the you know, one of the disadvantages for Notre Dame is they're very limited in the number of walk-ons they can bring in. Because the one rule that you cannot break in Notre Dame is you cannot make exception. The, the football staff cannot get involved in the admissions process of a walk-on because then he becomes a recruited player. And and it's a it's just there's there's rules about that. So you have to be able to get into Notre Dame on your own to be a walk-on. You have to then be able to afford to go to Notre Dame as a walk-on. This sure. isn't like being at Ohio State or Alabama where you can get, I mean, you can get walk-ons into school more easily at Alabama and they're paying a way less money because if they're in-state kids, but even Mm -hmm. out-of-state kids, it's a lot cheaper to go to school in Alabama as an out-of-state kid than it is to go to Notre Dame in any capacity because private school, there is no in-state tuition. So Mm -hmm. it's not like there's in-state advantages to kids that, Hey, you go to Notre Dame, it's cheaper because you live in state. Private schools are different than state schools. So it's difficult to get good walk-ons at Notre Dame, and they've done a really good job of that in the last 10 years, and it's gotten better and better and better in recent years. But the other part is it's harder to keep those guys for four or five years, and that's the other difficulty. So sometimes you're having to redo them. But you know, guys like Trey Reader and, and the, the – I mean, the long – hey, look, a long snapper gives you some protection, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and you know, but you've already got Michael Vinson and Alex Peich and those kind of things, so you, you keep looking for new ones and better ones. Mm-hmm. But uh, I don't see a guy like that really being a someone that's going to contribute a ton. Let's let's try to roll through some of these real mm-hmm. quick. Uh, Nicholas Grosh asks, can you define the term dead period besides no in-person contact? What are the other limitations? Thank you for giving us uh, inside info regarding ND football. So a, a that's really what it means. The difference between a dead period and a quiet period is you can have no – like you can have no off cam- – like you can't go off campus. Like you – you know, a, a quiet period, it's like the definition of quiet period is a time when coaches simply cannot scout off campus. You can bring kids onto campus. You can have visits. You can still have unofficials. You can still have a kid come to your practice. Like the dead period, and we're currently in a dead period, kids can't mm-hmm. come to campus and visit with the coaches. A kid can come to campus and take himself on a self-guided tour, but he can't interact right. with the coaches. You can't host an unofficial. Like let's say Notre Dame's got a basketball game tonight against the number one team in the country. You couldn't bring recruits in on campus for that. Right. And interact with them. If they want to be at the game, they can buy a ticket and go sit in the stands. But you can't interact with them. Dead period means no in-person contact in any way, shape, form or fashion. A quiet period is you can't have off campus interaction with them. You can't go to the high school and meet with the kid. They Mm -hmm. can come to your campus, though. And that's the difference. So, 
between a dead period and a quiet period. Bobby S. Hear anything on what freshmen are looking good in winter workouts? We talked a little bit about about um, Ziegler. Uh, Nolan Ziegler. Mm -hmm. uh, another guy that I've heard some some good things about is um, is Josh Burnham. Athlete, he's doing some really impressive things athletically. Uh, I've heard some really good things about Jaden Mickey. His movement skills, his speed, things like that, are, have really impressed some people. Uh, he's a guy that that has stood out so far. Um, I haven't asked about like, Billy Shrouth is not. I don't believe he's going through workouts. He had a surgery the offseason, so we haven't seen a ton from him. Um, Ash, uh, Tyson, Ty, Tyson Ford and Aiden Gabera, Gobira, the linemen usually kind of come along slower because the weight room you know, can kind of kick them in the butt <laughs> a little bit. But yeah. the one thing is like the linebacking core, from everything I've heard, is like these guys are everything we thought they were going to be. I mean, this, this group's going to be everything we thought it was going to be. So I think that's the big thing is no one is like what you what happens every year almost is somebody shows up and you're like, this kid's not as good as we thought he was going to be mm. like, uh Oh, like this kid's not as good as we hoped. That has not been the case from anybody so far that I've heard is everybody's kind of like, yep, this guy's at least what we thought he was going to be. And then some kids have been a little better than they thought. And that's clearly one of it. Here's one for you, Ryan, Keith Wiegand, Ryan, best shot to get Devin Houston or Jason Moore. I'm a Marylander or both. I mean, let's get both, right? <laughs> it's a very talented duo. Um, I think that Notre Dame would take both. and But I, I if as of right now, I would say I feel good about both. But I would say that maybe timeline-wise, Jason Moore might be one that's maybe pops a little sooner than a Devin Houston. I feel like Devin and his family is taking – they're taking their time with the recruitment, right? Like they're trying to go on visits. They're trying to see everything. They're trying to talk. They're trying to make a, a very sound decision. I think Jason is too, to a degree, um, or not even to a degree. I think he is as well. But I think that Jason, just last time I spoke, I've spoken with, you know, people close to him and himself that I, I think that he's in a very good spot with Notre Dame, but I think Notre Dame is in on both. I feel good about both. Um, I would to answer the question though, directly. I would say Jason right now better shot, I guess, quote unquote. But mm -hmm. I think that they would. I think that they're both they're in on both, and they both could potentially get both. Absolutely. And they've they've been on Jason a little bit longer too, I believe. Yes, as well. Yeah. Like, yep. Yep. They got on Devin a little bit later. They they definitely offered him later. I'm pretty sure on that one too. So mm -hmm. this is and Keith also asked the was the one that made the comment about Ashton Craig and Zach Martin and the offense comparison. So. Uh, yep. Thank you for that, Keith. This isn't a question, a comment from Big Jim. Ryan was an outstanding addition. The one thing Ryan doesn't like taking compliments, so that's why I'm bringing this I up. Don't. I really He's don't. a lot like me. <laughs> like he get real uncomfortable, but I he needs to hear it. Ryan was an outstanding addition. The one thing I really like is he's a recruiting guy, but with the NFL scout grading background, great combo. I agree. Appreciate it, Jim. I agree. Uh, I think it was a great hire. I think that it was. It's more about the ability of the boss to recognize great talent is really where <laughs> our focus needs to be you right get, now. You get, you get all the credit, <laughs> sir. You get every single piece. <laughs> you can have it all. He's mastered that too, by the way, folks. That sucking up thing. He's really good at that too. Uh, Ryan Tuck, Ron Tuck. How much do you guys think Prince Kali will play, and in what position? Uh, I think Prince is going to play a lot this year, and he's a Mike or a Will. And the mm -hmm. thing you have to understand too, and and um, the Mike and the Will are somewhat interchangeable in this defense. A four-two-five, the in, two inside backers are they're pretty interchangeable. What that now? What that means? That doesn't mean that a guy that can play Mike can play Will. Sure. If you have limit, if you have coverage limitations, you can be okay at Mike. You can't play Will, right? But usually a Will can play Mike. And it, it, you know, because if you're not physical enough to play Will, then you're probably or Mike, you're not going to be physical enough to play Will, and, and vice versa, because it's right. not a traditional thumper Mike. Now you can use a thumping Mike, like Junior Two Alamaka, but what I'm referring to is assignment wise, you know, ideal skill set wise. There's a lot of interchangeableness where you, if you can play one, you can play the other, which allows you to get your best guys on the field. Uh, so, but Prince to me is an, is is inside. And so a lot of times you hear us say Rover or inside. Mm -hmm. And if a guy is like, like Burnham, Burnham's an inside guy. Jalen Steed is more of a Rover will. I don't know if we're going to talk about him as a Mike just yet. Cause I don't know if the body type is there quite yet for Mike. Whereas a yeah. will, you can kind of still do some things with him in space. My understanding is that the, he's going to start at Rover the start, mm -hmm. meaning he's going to start out at Rover, not he's mm -hmm. starting at Rover. Like <laughs> he's going to start his career playing Rover. Maybe that's the way to say it, so that way people don't take it. Driscoll said that that Jalen Steed's going to start it over. That's all I heard. It's not quite what I meant, but hey, <laughs> it is what it is. You you see it a different way, Ryan? 
No, I, I mean, I, I'm just working back, like thinking about when Prince was coming out of high school and he was mm-hmm. playing like, I mean, they had him playing like mid hole, like safety, <laughs> like doing all. I mean, the kid looked the part from the from the day he stepped foot on Notre Dame. Um, so I, I hope that he plays a lot, and I think that I think more naturally my mind goes to Will just because I think he's just such an mm-hmm. explosive athlete. Like I want him working in pursuit a ton, but I think that body type wise, like the kid's put together, so he absolutely yeah. could play Mike as well. From what I'm told, he's had a really good winter. Good like, to hear. Really good winter. Like, really impressing people with his athleticism. Irish AJ, I, I saw this yesterday. Al Washington named recruiter of the year in the Big Ten per rivals. Deadly combo with with uh, with Marcus Freeman. So, I, 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 <laughs> I want to say this. I think he is going to be a really good combo. But I wouldn't put a lot of stock in that because they simply base it off of who were you the primary recruiter for and what the rankings of those guys were. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's kind of like, uh, you know, uh, they had a really good linebacker class. And so he gets the credit for it. Right. Like, I just I don't you know, like they've had some guys that are considered great recruiters that like don't rank in the top whatever, because it's just based off who you signed, not the job you do as a recruiter. But, you know, he had the best li- he had, in my opinion, the second best linebacker class in the country behind Notre Dame's, in my view. Some yeah. people view it as the best linebacker class in the country. So, yeah, he's going to get a lot of chops. But uh, the point of what you said, though stands i think he's going to be a really good combo with marcus freeman i just i don't put a lot of I, I it's it's fun to talk about like haha your best recruiter is now here but yeah it's not really how i view it here's one for you ryan from timeout tom what are the chances mm-hmm. that ronan hannafin becomes a hybrid tight end receiver I mean, I, I think if Ronan lands with the with Notre Dame, he would be a he most likely will start out on the offensive side of the football. So to answer your question, I think it's a very good opportunity to uh, to play a wide receiver hybrid role. Um, I, I don't see a need for it to be honest with you, because I mean we've heard that he's a six three kid, two oh five that is supposedly runs in the four fours, right? So, I mean, could he potentially do it if he keeps you know? outgrowing but it, it, i think if if he does outgrow the wide receiver position he's more likely to end up on the defensive side right. of the ball than at to a tight end spot so i don't see I, the body type yeah. for a tight end no like no i don't he's see like, him being tommy no. trumbull like i don't like, i don't see like he, that he doesn't have like a dense lower half or anything mm-hmm. right like he he looks wide receiver or a safety rover type of player you know what's funny me. is you gave the same you gave me a comparison for him a comp for yep. him Yep. A day later, I talked to somebody else kind of tied into his recruitment that gave me the same one. A wide Rossi, receiver? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he reminds somebody me a lot. Of the, the ND side, yeah. So a guy that's at the Senior Bowl and we played uh, – Notre Dame played them during the season, Cincinnati. He reminds me a lot of Alec Pierce for Cincinnati. He and, has And if you don't know who that type. is, go back and watch the game from this fall. It was that it's dude that kept game. smoking the Notre Dame yeah. receivers or mm. DBs, that guy. Yeah. So he's uh, Alec is like 6'3, 210, somewhere in that ballpark. He's long. He was at the senior bowl. And Alec is another guy that I think he's a little deceptive with his speed, but he's a kid that supposedly is also going to run like 4'4, 4, 4'7, 4, 4, 4, somewhere in that ballpark. And he's much more back shoulder dude, you know, kind of can stack, but he's not like a true blazer type of guy. But that's kind of what I see with a dude, a guy like a Ronan Hannafin at wide receiver. Kind of reminds me a little bit of Al- uh, Alec Pierce for Cincinnati. Mm-hmm. I like that comp. Mm-hmm. Keith Wiegand, Brian, how many offensive linemen in 2023? I think the minimum is three based on the current roster, right? Mm-hmm. Minimum is three. The maximum is going to be five. I think four is the sweet spot for me. I think that's where mm-hmm. because you're going to lose a guy or two over the next year. You always do. Sure. Uh, I think four is the sweet spot for me. And then if you, if you have a need to rise, you can go get a fifth down the road if you lose too many guys. But to me, I think, uh, I think that that would be the 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 sweet spot for me is is that is four, and I think this is also a really good O line class, and you're in good yes. shape. And sometimes you got to take advantage of that by going big on numbers. So that would be my that would be my two cents, Ryan. You see it any differently for the uh, the numbers? No, I was going to say three to four as well. I think that's a good ballpark yeah. for it. You'd have to have some departures because then you have to understand is like Sean, Sean Davis and I were talking about this. He's like, I'm taking four or five every year. And I'm like, that only works. Mm-hmm. And I understand like, I'm all about that sentiment of why you're doing it. Right. You're going to take great. But eventually if kids don't leave. Yeah. You, you have too many kids on scholarship. Cause what's it right now? 16 or 17, right? Somewhere you're in that 16 ballpark? now. Cause uh, Dirksen's yeah. not coming back. Right. So you're 16 now. And that's a pretty good number. It I mean, is, usually yeah. you want to be 15, you know, mm-hmm. 18 at the most. If you got a lot, 
where you want to have a big number is if you have a lot of guys that are in their final year, then you mm-hmm. want to you want to replace them with current freshmen, not incoming freshmen. Sure. Right. So you, you that's kind of and the way that you usually recruit. It's changing a little bit at some positions is usually you're recruiting. You're looking at your junior class and you're recruiting to replace that, not your mm-hmm. senior class. And the offensive right. line is definitely one of those positions where, where that is true. So if you lose some guys, you can go up to five. But four is my sweet spot real quick. Speaking of offensive linemen, Guinea Pig Clips. Some of the names you all have are just hilarious. I love it. Guinea yeah. Pig Clips. Are we, Notre Dame, a front runner? For Sam Samson Oaken Lola, or is it too early to tell? It's way too early to tell for me. Samson is doing his due diligence. He has a timeline, but he is also firm that he's not he's not going to name leaders and he, like he's going to have a list at some point in the beginning of the summer where it's going to be a, a cut down of of the you know top whatever schools that he's looking at. But he is doing his firm due diligence to go visit those schools talk to everyone. So, and he has a massive list. I think he has like 39, 40 offers right now. So there's a lot of schools that are in on Samson. Um, And I kind of highlighted a little bit. I just had an article that came on Irish breakdown about just the, um, about him getting to his fifth star in the 24 seven sports, which he was the first Massachusetts player ever, apparently in the 24 seven sports era to get to the five star. He's obviously a very talented kid. Notre Dame is firmly in the conversation. I think coach he has obviously made him a priority since he's come on. He visited him at his school already um, at home. So before the dead period started. So I think that they are firmly in the conversation, but it is way too early for me to call anyone a leader at all. Yeah. And if, if I were going to pick a leader, it would be Ohio state. Not it's fair. Notre Dame, but even then, I'm I'm not I'm with you. Ryan. I'm agreeing with your point, Ryan. I'm saying, but if I yeah. had to pick a leader, I'd probably say Ohio State, just because they've been on them so long. But they yeah. also just went through a coaching change, right? I sure. mean, so that's kind of the this has been a weird off season, uh, where you talk about like just position changes and like at like Notre Dame and Ohio State going through who both went eleven and two or both replacing their O line coaches. Like, not that mm-hmm. they left for other jobs, they're replacing them. Sure. With, little you don't see that very often and samson keeps everything very close to the vest it's like very yeah yeah it's going to take a while for you to build that relationship before you really kind (laughs) of you know get that one just because it's that's what college coaches are dealing with right now it's not for sure not just you joseph (laughs) sergi here's one for you did you hear pat narduzzi's comments on kenny piggott in notre dame yesterday someone tried to convince him to come last year back door type of thing ryan put this on the message board yesterday i'll go ahead and let you are you yeah. comfortable doing that in this open format, Ryan? Yeah. Yeah, I don't care about it. Um, So this is the whole conversation. Last year, actually, it was last summer, I had spoken to – so a trainer that Kenny Pickett has worked with in the past during the summer in the offseason had informed someone close to me that Kenny Pickett very openly had a conversation with him that he was debating whether to go into the portal and Notre Dame had indeed contacted him. And to my understanding, because I double checked yesterday or the day before, whenever this was kind of talked about, that it did sound like Notre Dame reached out first, right? Mm -hmm. So Notre Dame had definite interest. Kenny Pickett was thinking about entering the transfer portal. He did not reach out to Notre Dame first. So some of some of what Coach Narduzzi put out there obviously is valid, in my opinion, Mm -hmm. to that. And just that inside information, I'm not going to tell you who said it. I'm just going to say somebody very close to Kenny Pickett that it was a very open conversation between them. So, yeah, he's still a big freaking baby and he's making it to me a bigger deal than it should be. Right. But there is uh, some, some legitimacy to what he's saying. Yeah, Yeah, for sure. He's such a whiner. I swear. He, (laughs) he drives me nuts. It's like, dude, why are you so angry? Like you've got a great job. You got success. Stop being so bitter. Right. He's a really angry man. Some people laugh when, like, when when Kelly left, there was actually people at ESPN putting Pat Narduzzi's name. I was like, "Are you kidding me?" <laughs> Whatever, you guys, don't know what you're talking about. Indy Irish eight. Brian, yesterday you mentioned about having Tommy Reese's ear. Why not have him as a future guest on IB and discuss this matter with your suggestions too? See if maybe you can convince him. Number one, I would never. I think that would be an incredibly unprofessional thing to do to bring him on to my show. I understand like I'd be, it's tempting, right? But it's just like, that would be such a, it would be, it would lack all, all courtesy in my opinion. Like you're willing to come onto my show, which I appreciate. And I'm going to hammer you about things that I think you should do. That would be so like, to me, it would be so 
be very, I don't know. I don't even know the word to use it. It would just be to me like just kind of disrespectful to do that in an open forum. Uh, have there been Notre Dame coaches that have, have, that I've had their ear? Yeah. And it was always privately. Some people kind of have figured it out. Most you haven't, but it's just, that needs to be a private conversation. That needs to be more of a, Hey, what do you think? Just talking ball, not a, you come on my show and I'm challenging you on things you should or should do at Notre Dame. I would never do that. Uh, and, and I thought the, the, I think when, if Tommy Reese comes on my show, my goal and my objective is no longer to have a debate with him or to question him. It's to help you as fans understand what he thinks and how he views offensive football. That should be my, I become just an interviewer, not a former coach trying to, now I think as a former coach, I can maybe ask questions that are more deep, that get more detailed answers from him, which I think we did when we interviewed him the summer. But that would I would never. Plus, here's the thing: I'd never get another Notre Dame coach on my show ever again if I did that. Like ever, rightfully so. I, if I was Mark, I was like nobody's ever going on Driscoll show again. <laughs> if, you know, if he's going to sit there and chat, hey, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? Like, there's a way to ask those questions without it turning into. Hey, I think you should do this. I think you should because you know if I was Tommy Reese and I and I came at him, I say, well, then why don't you apply for a job here? You know what I mean? If you think you have all the answers. I would, I would take, I would not take that well if I was in his shoes. I don't know what you think about that, Ryan. Yeah, uh, I, well, no, I, I mean, I agree completely with you. I, I don't think that it is. I don't think it's your place to do that, right? Like mm -hmm. you're trying to get information, and there's definitely ways to to get that information in a in a less non direct way. But I mean, again, until you walked in someone's shoes, I, I like to just kind of give them the benefit of the doubt to some sense, but. I think definitely bringing it onto that type of forum is just not appropriate. Now that doesn't mean you can't question. I mean, reporters mm -hmm. and journalists and analysts, our job is to kind of, Hey, why did you do this? Why did you do that? You know, if in, in something could be, this didn't work. What happened? What happened in the second half against Oklahoma state? Mm -hmm. That would be a very fair question to ask. Sure. But I think in the second half, you should do this. That would, that would be, yeah, that that's, that's not what I would do. If it what was I, ever, what it, I love, well, sorry, I was just gonna say what I love about what you do and what Irish breakdown does in general is you're just, you, you're trying to establish understanding of why things happen and kind of trying to understand, I think trends that could happen moving forward, which I think is great. You're not acting like you're a know-it-all that you have all the answers. It's more about the information that's attached to decision-making for me. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we will say they, I think they need to do this. I'm sure. going to put that out there, but then going to a coach and then in a public forum telling him you need to do this. That's mm -hmm. not something I'd be comfortable doing. Uh, I will tell you that sometimes I put articles like that and I've had coaches call and talk to me about what they think I've said, you know, positively or negatively or trying to understand. Mm -hmm. Tommy Reese isn't going to do that. And right. that's okay. That's fine. I, I don't, I don't do write these. I'm like, I wonder if I write this, if Tommy Reese will read it and want to talk to me about, it. I'm writing for you guys, not Tommy Reese and not name coaches. I'm writing for you guys. And that's what we do. That's that's Ryan's doing updates not to satisfy me. He's doing updates mm -hmm. to give you guys information, and then that satisfies me, right? So I, I wouldn't do that. What I what I think if it's ever going to happen, it would be like it's happened with other coaches, which is we develop a personal relationship where he feels comfortable talking ball with me, and then I, you know, in and, and even then it was like I'll offer suggestions if the question is, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about this guy? Um, you know, like when I used to have, there was a couple coaches on staff back when I was covering recruiting that every time I'd go to a camp, they would say, Hey, look, can you look at this kid and this kid for me? And I would, and I'd give them my thoughts on it, but I never just called them and said, Hey, you gotta, you gotta recruit this kid, you know, no question. And then you're screwing up if you're not doing it. I say, Hey, look, I saw this kid work out. This is what I thought of him. Do with it what you will. Right. So like <clears throat> Samson Okanlola, to be honest with you, is a guy I, I saw him at a camp. I reached out to people in Notre Dame. I said, this is the best kid at camp. And Carson Hensman was at that camp. Josh, I said, that was – Caden Proctor was at that camp. And I was like, the best lineman at this camp was Samson Okanlola. And they offered him, like, within two weeks, right? Mm -hmm. But I didn't say, you got to offer this kid. And, you know, it's just like, look, I saw the kid, and here's my opinion. Do with it what you will. And they <laughs> offered him within two weeks, right? And so it's got to be more like that where it's a respectful thing, not like I have all the answers and you have to do what I do. For sure. There are times that, you know, it's like I had a – 
share it now, but like um, I wrote a story back in 2019 where, where Chip, I said, they're not using Ian Book enough as a runner. It was after the Virginia Tech game in the Michigan game. They're not using him enough as a runner. And Coach Long called me and he, he goes, I got to read you what some idiot on the beat wrote about me. I'm like, oh, this is going to be good. And he starts reading what I wrote about Ian Book running. <laughs> And so we had a good laugh about it. We just talked ball for 20 minutes. Well, I, that was before the Duke game in 2019. Do you remember what Ian Book did in the Duke game that year? He ran for over 100 yards. So just, just saying, right? But like that was a, you know, that, you know, you have those, those are like, there's one time I'm like, okay, there was a, uh, I'll say it now, Coach Elko called me one time. I had written something. Mm-hmm. And Coach Elko called me. He's like, I had said, this is the happened in the coverage. And he actually kind of walked me through the play and mm-hmm. showed me how I, they were in a different coverage and I didn't have the coverage correct. And because I didn't have the coverage correct, this actually would happen. It was great because then I had a greater understanding of what they were doing. And sure. then, so like, I love stuff like that, but it's always got to be, and I can say it now because that's, he's like two jobs removed and they're gone. Mm-hmm. But to me, it, it would always have to be like that. It could never be like publicly telling him hey, what to do that would that would go over well ron mm-hmm. tuck how about wagner is just a blocking tight end so like a joe alt type of thing uh i mean early on if you want to get him on the field i guess but it's yeah. it's you know that's like a very exclusive niche yeah. package right yeah so. and notre dame has 23 tight ends on scholarship right now right so if those guys can't block then you need to get I mean, some right, of those tight ends right. off the roster Wagner does look like a tight end, though. So I he does. Point. He does. Yep. He does. V- v- Vince Driscoll. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. What? What's the difference between a guy Quinn would recruit and what he stand wants? Have a great weekend. I'm heading back to shoveling the drive. The biggest thing is Harry Heastand made a living recruiting tackles. Mm-hmm. And now length. Like yes. Now he, there was a couple guys that didn't. I mean, Tristan Hodge didn't play tackle he was a center but sam Musfer was a tackle they knew he was going to move inside so there sure. were some guys but i mean he the, like the entire sep 2017 offensive line mm-hmm. all of them played tackle in high school and four of the five played tackle at least in part of their career Notre Dame in practice and stuff because right. you had you had alex bars mm-hmm. uh and quentin nelson at guard alex mm-hmm. started the year before at tackle right tackle Mm-hmm. Moved inside. Kramer and Hainsey obviously were at tackle. McGlinchey had played both tackle spots. And Quentin Nelson started at tackle as a freshman, like in practices and stuff. Now he quickly moved to guard, but like he was a tackle in high school. So you're going to see length and athleticism. Now I think Coach Quinn liked athleticism and he liked length, but he recruited more in like guys that project to be interior guys, where mm-hmm. Coach Eastan liked to recruit tackles that and, he could and then see where they could fit. Right. Yeah. Whereas some of the guys that Coach he, Quinn has recruited as like their high school tackles, they are not college tackles, right? Mm-hmm. And I would I would be willing to bet that he recruited more guys that played inside as high school players than Coach Eastan had. But there were some similar. And, and I think Coach Quinn tried to kind of continue what Coach Eastan did in recruiting tackle types, but not as effectively, in, in my opinion. I, li- I like to think of it as – I always thought that Harry Heastan's kind of ideology was I want to get the five most talented athletic offensive tackles yeah. I can, and then I will get the five best on the field I can. So that's kind of just – and I feel like sometimes when we're recruiting for a player to just play a singular position, that kind of limits the flexibility that you have for a guy that can potentially move to different spots or develop into a different um, different position. So I would just kind of say there's like a best five outlook mm-hmm. for like a coach he stands. And the that's why tackles, to, to kind of connect the dots a little bit, that's why recruiting tackles is important because it's easier for a tackle to move to guard than right. a guard to move to tackle. And when I mean guard, I mean a guy that's got the skill set to play guard. Mm-hmm. A guy that's a more natural guard is going to have a tougher time moving to tackle than a tackle is going to play guard, right? Guards, or don't, center. Move, guards don't move outside. You don't move like, outside, yeah. you move in. <laughs> right, and we're talking like skill set, right? We're not talking about yeah. just because you played guard. Like Zach Martin could bump out last year for the Cowboys and, and hold his own at tackle because sure. he's a tackle that mm-hmm. has certain physical limitations that mean you don't want to play, you know, he's better in the NFL as a guard. Chris Watts not moving out to tackle when he was in college, right? Like mm-hmm. you 
That's that's kind of what we're referring to. Like yep. Aaron Banks could move out to tackle because he was a tackle that moved to guard, mm-hmm. right? Not the other way around. And sure. that's that's the difference. Here's fun stat for you, guinea pig clips. Marcus Freeman has recruited more five-star recruits per the 24-7 composite in one year, three, than Brian Kelly did in eight years, two. It's, good uh, stat. it's an interesting stat, but it's also a big part of the reason why I don't like these rankings because – you know who's missing from that list is the two because the two five stars are Michael Mayer and I believe Tommy mm-hmm. Kramer. Okay. Do you know who's not on that list? Kyle Hamilton. Hamilton, yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Quentin Nelson. Now mm-hmm. rivals had Quentin Nelson as a five star, and I think two four seven had Kyle Hamilton as a five star on their own, but some right. other service was like ESPN did not have Quentin Nelson in the top hundred. Think about that. It's malpractice, right? It is. Yeah. Whereas Rivals had him as a five star, you know Kyle Hamilton's a guy that Rivals had as a as a or excuse me a two four seven had as a five star on their on their rankings, but mm-hmm. Rivals had him like not even in the top sixty. I don't think. I think he was like in the seventies. They had him at seventy five. It's crazy, you know, coming out of high school, right? Because the problem is he was a, started off as a three star, which he shouldn't have been. Mm-hmm. But and then oh here's the ESPN had Kyle Hamilton ranked as the number 165 player in the country. Uh, yes, number 165 player in the country. So that's the thing about the composite ranking. So and my I'm not going to ding Brian Kelly because ESPN sucks. True, and that's what it boils down to. Because if ESPN didn't suck, Kyle Hamilton and Quentin Nelson both are probably five star composites, or at least very much much closer. So I you know I, I can't ding him for that. I think 247 had Blake Fisher as a five-star. Or no, it was Rivals that had Blake Fisher as a five-star last year, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but 247 didn't have him ranked that high. And ESPN didn't have him in the top 100. Notice a pattern here, right? You guys noticing a pattern here? Uh, you know, I mean, so am I going to say that Brian Kelly didn't recruit a five-star player in Blake Fisher? Uh, you know, we could debate that. So I understand what you're saying. What's really interesting is if you want to go look at the success recruiting five stars, Brian Kelly's first five years, because he recruited a lot of them. I mean, he recruited three five star DNs in one class. Yeah. Remember that with the Lynch to its Eshat class. Uh, mm-hmm. The 2013 class had Max Redfield, Jalen, Jalen Smith. Um, mm-hmm. I think Eddie Vanderdose, although I, I really have trouble counting him since he never actually showed up to school. Right. But, you know, but I mean, that class, that class had some dudes in it now. So Mm -hmm. I just, I don't, I know the composite has some value, but some it's becoming less and less valuable to me because some of these rankings are so bad, Mm -hmm. you know, like, like on three sports has, doesn't even have CJ Williams in the top 300. They had junior to as a three star. It's crazy. You know, it's like, I mean, what are we doing here? Like, I mean, some of these things are so bad. There's really, really bad. Yeah, 2013, they signed two five stars. Max Redfield and uh, Jalen Smith were the only two composites because they took Eddie Vanderdose out. And mm-hmm. Then 2011, they signed two. So apparently, Stefan Tuitt was not a five star in 2011, oh. which again, I point out to just kind of points to some of the absurdity for this. I'll bet you $20 it was ESPN that had him ranked low too. I'm going to pull that up now because I know rivals thought pretty highly of him. Yep. ESPN had him ranked 90th. Oh, good. Yep. Rivals had him or uh two, four, seven had him in the thirties. And I know rivals, I think rivals actually had him as a five star Stefan to it. So he was number. Yeah. Five star number 2022. So if ESPN has him 60th, he's a composite five star. Mm-hmm. That's the absurdity of this whole thing. Like one service could just be way off. And he's not a five star. No one that has a brain should have looked at Kyle Hamilton and thought he wasn't a five star, much less not even a top hundred guy. Like you're not even trying at that point in time. Like, do you yeah. that what that tells me is they never watched him play, they had him yep. ranked low, and then he goes up on other people and they just kind of oh, we'll have to throw him in there somewhere. Ah, let's throw him at 165. Right? It's absurd. So yeah. again, when you guys want to know why I don't put a lot of stock in rankings, because there was a recruiting service that that, that people put value on that didn't think Kyle Hamilton was one of 160 60 best players in the country that thought there was over a hundred players in high school coming out that were better than Quentin Nelson. 
or another one thought there was 89 guys better than Stefan to it coming out of high school. Right. Like, you know, and same with Blake Fisher. Like if, if there's a hundred some players better than Blake Fisher in last year's class, that means it's the best recruiting cl- group of players in the history of high school football. It's absurd. All right. Irish AJ says it's just because we're going to wrap up here soon. It's just because he was has a cool signing name, but the great loose emoji brought up that Rocco Spindler uh, brought that up about Rocco Spindler recruiting him. Lou, Lou and I would talk about that, about like just guys that are like, na- like your name's Rocco. You're probably going to be a pretty tough kid, right? Like, yep. you know, I, I like names. Like I like guys that have kind of cool sounding names. Like, yeah, okay. That guy's going to be a player. Why do you think that man? He's got a great name has no, no actual bearing on it, but like, have like you that. ever heard of a, a running back name? you know, with some normal, like, accountant-sounding name. No, it's like Dalvin Cook, you know what I mean? Like Damian Tomlinson. Damian Tom, right? Terrell Davis. You know, Mm -hmm. the Barry Sanders are kind of, like, abnormal. Like, that's a pretty normal accountant. Like, what's your accountant's name? That's Barry Sanders, you know? Like, (laughs) those guys are rare. Walter Payton. Like, you know, you should guys have, like, yeah, they have great names, right? I agree. Um, same, same so, thing with jersey numbers, too. You can tell yeah. the player's good or not by his jersey number. Yeah. Very easy to see. Yeah, that's why. I mean, if you didn't know he Shuler was going to be a bust in the NFL, I just was like, dude, he's wearing a number in the 20s. You know, like, <laughs> you know the only quarterback I've ever seen wear a number in the 20s that turned out to be pretty good is Bernie Kosar. Yeah, right? true. That's it. That's it. Indy Irish 8 says, Brian, by the way, I joined Irish Breakdown over a month ago and bought a T-shirt. I renamed my handle from Steve Jones to Indy Irish 8. Thank you for that, Steve. I do remember your name now. Appreciate that. Here's one for you, Ryan, as we get close mm-hmm. to wrapping up. Yep. Better sports movie, draft uh, day or Moneyball? I'm going draft day. And I realize it's not realistic, but it was a fun movie for me. It was an entertaining movie for me. Moneyball just kind of drug out a little bit too much for me. It was kind of, there's just too many boring parts of Moneyball for me. That so I there's, take. there's two perspectives here. The one is that Moneyball is technically a better movie right it's more quality in my opinion draft day i I mean if you're giving me the choice i would much rather watch draft day because one it's a football movie comparative Mm -hmm. to a baseball movie Mm -hmm. um it's it's fun you know but it is a really lame movie it's more more entertaining for me it's more entertaining yes for me yes more entertaining movie i agree better actual movie moneyball probably has it but and moneyball is more realistic because it's based off a true story even though they you know change some things but I dry something yeah I, I the the baseball in the dark thing is the thing that just drove me nuts about moneyball like mm-hmm. you remember the like the night games like yeah. they, they it's like this is terrible it's like it was like uh any given sunday it's like yeah. the, the lights not working in the, in the professional leagues back in you know in that league or whatever I, but. I really i really did not i mean al pacino's speech obviously is fantastic in any given sunday but like i did not like any given sunday to be the honest. only thing i liked about it and i've said this before mm-hmm. it is the most realistic the chaos of being on a field. Sure. Like the way the cameras like attached to helmets and stuff. Yeah. 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 That's how chaotic football is. I mean, it is, it is, it's like being on the field. But other than that, I thought any given Sunday sucked. (laughs) Um, And, and most NF former NFL players that I know that watch that movie were offended by it. Cause they're like, they make it out to be, we're all like drug riddled, like infidel, you know, you know, infidelity just ramp. Like, it's like mm-hmm. I had a friend that played for the trades. Like, dude, most of us just went home to our, our wives after practice and stuff. Like, <laughs> there's like t- you know a small number of guys who were out acting like fools. Like, most of us, number one, couldn't afford to do that. Right. Number number two, most of us just were out in the community. It's like, but then the media portrays it as like we're all just like these. You know, we're all Ryan Leaf. You know, it's <laughs> like no, because he played with Ryan Leaf. Yeah. And no, that's not really how it is. But I thought money. I thought Moneyball was kind of boring to me. Mm-hmm. And like, cause like if there'd have been more like the scenes where the, like all the trades and stuff, very unrealistic, a lot like the draft day thing, the trades, it's just more entertaining for me, you know? Right. So some of the stuff in there was kind of like for, for draft day, I was like, I wish they would have made it a little bit more, I don't know, some of it a little bit more realistic, but I was about to say realistic. Yeah. yeah like yeah. some of it was just like, you're not going to believe what's happening here. You're like they made all these GMs. I'll be this big. He's like, my, like, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. But then, right. I'm like, okay. you know, but then I'm like, the guy, the guy panics. He's like, yeah. oh, you get all your picks back. Go ahead. Yeah. You know, but, then right. I, but then I'm like, oh, I was talking about the one with the Jaguars, like this, some uh, dumb, naive guy. But then I'm like, you know, then you like, like some of these GMs make really stupid decisions. Like maybe they are that stupid, may, you know? Is. So, you know, Trent Balky keeps hiring and firing coaches is really, is, is maybe yeah. at some point in time, I think maybe you're the problem, you yeah. know? So, although I do think that he made a, 
I mean, I think Doug solid hire. A good hire yeah. Solid good hire. Good developer, quarterback. I think you know, guy's got a Super Bowl ring, so mm-hmm. you know, can't, can't could, have, could have been a lot worse. Could have been could worse. Be, could be Josh yeah. McCown to the uh, Houston Texans. So. Oh God, <laughs> have they made that official yet, or is that? Still- I don't. I don't- I don't even know if that's actually going to happen. Gonna, but, I can't yeah. wait to see the media circus that happens when that guy, when if that happens. Oh, yeah. And that would be deservedly so. Such a joke, man. Yes. Guinea pig clips. Does this class have the potential to be the best since Lou Holtz? Wait till we get to about 14 commitments before I can even begin to, yeah. you know, because in order to be that, they're going to have to add some guys that are on the same level of the guys I already got, and that's going to be tough. But if they – yeah, you know, if they get Dante Moore and Carnell Tay, you know, may, maybe, but like it's off to a good start. But they'd have to get to like 12, 13, 14 guys before mm-hmm. I, you know, I'd have to kind of see them. Then, then, you know, yeah. Here's a good question from Jeff Flute, Ryan. Mm-hmm. Who gets the first call from Dylan McCullough? What running back gets the first call? Okay, let me rephrase. Okay, mm-hmm. obviously, he's going to call his committed Cedric. kid. Right. Right. So we're going to take yep. that out. Mm-hmm. After he talks to the committed kid, what's the first phone call that you make if you're Dylan McCullough? I would think that it would be Justice Haynes. Um, he would be the guy for me out of Georgia, 2023 running back. Um, if you're on the message board, I kind of put a little intel into Justice. I, ha- I got the opportunity to speak to his head coach a little bit. He's very kind of overwhelmed with the process mm-hmm. right now. And I-, I think he's more likely probably to stay a little down further south than maybe to come up to South Bend, Indiana, but he would be the first guy. Second guy would probably be Jane Lamar out there in Washington. I I like Jane Lamar, man. I Mm -hmm. I think that he has a really nice all around skill set and kind of do things, but as a runner in the past game, but to answer the question directly, I think justice Haynes is probably the first call Mm -hmm. for me. Yeah. You like Jane Lamar more than I do. I like him, but you like him more than I do, but I like Lamar, man. I like Justin Haynes is the first call that I'm making. Oh, for sure. For sure. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. And I like I like Jay Lamar. I just I just think you like him a little bit more than I do. Just it's fine. It's, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. It's, it's one of those ones. Whenever you like a kid more than I do, I always am always going to hope that you're right. Unless it's a kid that goes to Michigan, and then I'm sure you're wrong. Yes. Which yeah, there you go. Agree there. <laughs> All right. I I, I want to kind of get this. I, I just. I don't want to spend too much time on this because it can go in a million different directions. But I, I did want to yeah. share it. Jay Man says, with all the issues in the NFL, I'm really proud to be a Notre Dame fan. Seems like Jack has very diverse and inclusive hiring practices. Um, yeah, that's something that Notre Dame has always valued. But yep. I, I think at the end of the day that that Marcus Freeman got hired not because of diversity, but because they generally felt he was the best guy for the job. I think at the end of the day, that's what it needs to be about. Like they didn't hire Niall Ivy because she's a black woman. They mm-hmm. hired Coach Ivy because she was literally the best candidate for the job, right? I mean, Muffet McGraw was part of that process. I think at the end of the day, Hire the best people for the job. And that's why Mark Schumann got the job. And the reason I, only reason I say that is because I think sometimes some people will cheapen the impact of why he was hired because they're going to make it. It was because it was diversity. Yes. I think I think Jack Swarbrick was open. The, the and process. Diversity, because to me, diversity means more than just white or black. Right. It's he'd never been a head coach. Mm-hmm. For some people, that's at a place like Notre Dame, that's a deal breaker. You can't even – you know, being Niall Ivy had never been a head coach, mm-hmm. right? Well, she's done a pretty good job getting the women's basketball team back on track. They had a big win last night. Olivia, Miles, if you haven't watched the women's basketball team, Olivia Miles is a monster. Mm-hmm. She is tremendous. Sophomore, right? Re- Sophomore. Well, technically, but she should oh. be a freshman. She enrolled early. Like she, okay. she reclassified and and mm-hmm. and showed up for the second half of last season. So she was right in this. So technically, she's still a freshman in school. She's in her second semester. Well, no, she's gotcha. now in her third semester, so technically she's a sophomore. Okay, uh, but she should have been only a freshman. She Understood. just upped her clock. But does that make sense? But yeah, she's yeah. technically a. She's not up for freshman of the year awards, even mm-hmm. though this is her fresh should have been a freshman class. But yeah, she's really good. But I'm I'm fine praising a diverse hire and all that. I just where I get uncomfortable with it is sometimes we focus on the diversity aspect of it and we make it about a race thing. And it takes away from the fact that he got the job because of his talent mm-hmm. and because of his what he, they feel he, the job he can do. And that was it. And same thing with Coach Ivy and, and these other hires. And I just um, – I'm glad it makes you happy. I'm happy because I think the hired a, a guy's going to be a great coach. That's, mm-hmm. that, that's it. You know, and at the end of the day, hire the best people. Yep. And that's, that's what I care about. But anyway, that's what I did. Right. That's why I got Ryan and Sean 
and Vince. So I think I hired the best people for the job. Sig C, does TB have a better arm strength than Jack Cohn? I would say yes. At yes, the same absolutely. age? At the same mm -hmm. age? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Sean S with a super chat. Thank you, Sean. If you had to bet now, does Notre Dame get Carnell Tate and Dante Moore? Okay, Ryan, you, we yeah. are not allowed to, to, to duck out of this one. Okay. okay. Got to answer it. Do you want to go first? Or do you want me to go first? I'll go first. Okay. I'm going to say yes on more. Yeah, let's go for it. Yeah. If we get more than yeah, if we get Tate too. Yes. That, that was exactly where I was said. Yep. Yes. I think they're going to, if I look, I'm not predicting it, but if I had to say it now, if I had to predict now, mm -hmm. I would say yes, that they would get both of them. That would be my, Prediction that I wouldn't even bet your $2 super chat on. I mean, to be honest with you. But if I had to predict now, right, and we couldn't cop out of answering the question, then I would say, I would say yes. I, I think they have a much better shot at getting both of them than people think is really where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. uh, last couple questions here, and we have final super chat that I want to get to. Uh, Brandon Plensner says, more Houston and Harbor to close out the D line class. All three guys from Maryland. That'd be incredible and a slap in Penn State's face. I love everything about that comment except for one thing: they are not yeah. recruiting Nicholas Harbor as a defensive lineman. Well, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. They are they are recruiting him as a rover, just to make that. Um, and um, also the Maryland Penn State's um, pipeline. I know their defensive coordinator who was responsible for that is now the head coach at Virginia mm -hmm. Tech. His name's escaping me now, so I don't know Pride. if that pipeline. Pry, Brent Pry. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's quite going to be the same pipeline, but traditionally, yeah. yes, Penn State has done very well in Virginia. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, to add to what Brian said, more Houston, yes, defensive line, Harbor recruited as a rover to start. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, Notre Dame's, and Ryan wrote a piece that I'm going to get up this weekend about that, about Notre Dame's got to be able to get back into the Catholic schools in the DC, Maryland area. Have to. Yeah. There's just yeah. too many good players coming out of there now of that region, and they're having much more success in Virginia. I think. I think Notre Dame has to dominate, and this is an area where Penn State's done really well. Michigan's had some success there. Ohio mm -hmm. State's had some really good success in Maryland, D.C. Notre Dame has to be the top school from Jersey down to Northern Virginia, in my opinion. They, they have to be. Like, I mean, you're going to get them all, but you have to be the dominant force. You can't let Bama come in there and keep taking these kids out of D.C., right? You have to start getting some of them. You can't let Penn State clean up in that area. You have to start getting some of these kids. Because once it's like with anything else, once a couple of those kids come and have success, then that opens up the door. And that's why, you know, it, this year could be a big one, you know, and if you're able to get Devin Houston and Jason Moore, that'd be huge. And Absolutely. Nicholas Harbor right now is a bit of a pipe dream. He's listening. And that's the key. He's listening. Mm -hmm. But until that kid gets on campus, I just, that's a pipe dream, but he is a freak. And I understand why, I mean, he is a, he would be part of a dream class. There's no doubt about it, but he's not there for me right now. Ryan, do you agree or disagree with that last part about Nicholas Harbor? No, no. Yeah. I think, I think it's, I, I think it's honestly getting on campus would be a game changer for him yeah. for sure. I just think that it's so wide open right now he's being recruited. And I think that's the layer that's interesting is we just said Notre Dame's recruiting him as a Rover. There's some schools that recruit him as a defensive end. There's some schools recruiting him as a wide receiver, a tight end. He's kind of all over the place. Not even just the amount of schools that are reaching out and, you know, trying to obviously get in good with him at the moment. It's also the fact that there's so many different pitches for a player mm -hmm. like him that I think it's a little tough to maybe just like, Oh, what's the best pathway when it's not just a school decision. It's also, positionally what's the best decision regionally what's the best decision there's a lot of layers to that one and the last question before we have a super chat i think this is the last question here brandon mm -hmm. also asks is if notre dame gets hannafin i still hope they get four more receivers especially if they land dante At the very least take hannafin and three more receivers i think i think the latter one is more realistic i don't think i, I don't want four five total. receivers in one class yeah, the total. only way i would want that is if you were in planning on put moving Hannafin to, to DB defense. Yeah. So right. I, I just, I think part of that, I don't know why Brandon thinks that. I think the fact he's a three star maybe factors in. I think Ronan Hannafin's a really good player. I if agree. he's your fourth receiver in a class, you've got a heck of a receiver class. Mm -hmm. I mean, if he's your third guy, you've got a pretty darn good receiver class. But yeah. I think where I would say, Brandon, the only way I could go with you on that is if let's say Notre Dame has four kids committed and they're able to flip. Uh, Jalen Brown late in the process, then yeah, you do that. And then you talk to Ronan about playing somewhere else or, or just bring them all in and see who, who fits. And then, you know, there's some guys that can play other positions, but it would have to be that to get to five. It would have to be, there's just some dude that you're able to get late in the process that you just can't say no to. Right. Because five guys in one class is tough. Cause you're going to lose some of them. 
That's, a that's why I say you got to be more strategic about it. You know, bring in four now and then bring in two, three the next year and just mm-hmm. kind of get that thing back to being healthy. Sure. I think that to me is the way to go. You you got to really be careful about overpopulating positions. Yeah. 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 Cause then you end up losing kids and then you're kind of back to square one. And now sure. you've got to do another big class. And then we're, we're going to wrap up with uh, Shelton Hager. And we told y'all earlier about Shelton uh, and needing prayer. And Shelton said, thank you, Brian, Vince, and Ryan. And the rest of the love from Irish Breakdown Nation this weekend for all the love and prayer sent to my family. Uh, you got it, Shelton. And, and we're so, so incredibly sorry to hear about um, you losing your, your baby, man. We, we, we pray for you. And, um, you've got my email address, man, if you need anything. So your Irish breakdown family is definitely here for you. And, uh, and whether it's to ask for prayer, just to come talk Notre Dame football to get your mind off things, man. But whatever it is, you and your wife and your, your, your other little ones are definitely in our prayers. Uh, your family is absolutely someone we'll be praying for and praying for strength and patience and just wisdom to understand why things like this happen sometimes. So, uh, mm-hmm. you got it, buddy. You absolutely got it. So that's going to be it for today's show. Uh, please remember Sheldon and his wife and, and their family in your prayers. Uh, uh, as you, If you're someone who believes in the power of prayer like I do, uh, please do that. If you're not, we appreciate you understanding that we do believe in that. And we appreciate you all being uh, willing to understand that. But uh, I do believe in that, and I, and I definitely wanted to lift up Sheldon. And if you're on the message board, you know what him and his family are going through right now. So uh, we're praying for you, buddy, and uh, we're here for you whenever, whenever you need anything. That's going to do it for today's show. Not sure if we're going to have a show tomorrow. We're going to have to see about that. Uh, Ryan and I are going to have a conversation about that. I think we may wait till next Saturday to kick off our our Saturday show, but we are going to start having a Saturday show. Sometimes it's going to be me. Sometimes it might be the both of us. Sometimes it might be Vince or Sean. We're going to start having some different kind of fun Saturday shows. It'll be more of an afternoon show, most likely, as opposed to an evening show, uh, but we're still hammering out the details on that. But we'll be definitely back on Monday, for sure, for our recruiting uh, hour, the Irish Breakdown Recruiting Hour. New back on our normal schedule next Wednesday night. Remember, we'll have a show. We're gonna, we're gonna break down a film of speaking of Cedric Irvin and also tight end mm-hmm. Cooper Flanagan and uh and a lot more to talk about. Stay locked in irishbreakdown.com. Sign up for the message board if you've not already done so. And uh, you can go to that at boards at irishbreakdown.com. So you definitely want to check that out. We got the we got the built bar, we got the merch store, we got all types of stuff going on too. So make sure you check those out. Give us a like, hit the subscribe, hit the notification bell, and share this podcast with your friends. And we'll we'll cut this thing up over the weekend and get some of the different sections out and those type of things. Long show, fun show, though. So, Ryan, thank you so much for joining us, everybody. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being a part of what we are doing here at Irish Breakdown. We'll talk to all of you again no later than Monday. And as always, thank you so much for watching and joining us on the Irish Breakdown podcast. <laughs>